Recorded Books and One Click Digital present Last to Die, A Defeated Empire, A Forgotten Mission, and The Last American Killed in World War II by Stephen Harding. Narrated by Jack Garrett. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been, and there you will always long to return. Leonardo da Vinci Prologue Just before seven o'clock, on the morning of August 18, 1945, a huge four-engined aircraft moved slowly onto the end of a 7,000-foot-long runway at Yontan Airfield on the southwestern coast of the island of Okinawa. Though the machine's long cylindrical fuselage, tall tail, and high, narrow wings gave her a certain elegance of line, on the ground she was ponderous. Loaded with fuel and men, she rocked heavily on squat tricycle landing gear as she turned her nose into the wind, then shuddered to a halt as her crew made the last preparations for takeoff. The aircraft, a B-32 Dominator heavy bomber of the U.S. Army Air Force's 386th Bombardment Squadron, was one of four scheduled to depart that morning on what everyone in the unit hoped would be a routine photo-reconnaissance mission over Tokyo. At that point in World War II, routine should have been a given. Japan had accepted the Allies' terms for unconditional surrender four days earlier, and President Harry S. Truman had ordered the suspension of all offensive operations against Japan on August 15. Yet four B-32s, flying a photo-recon mission over Tokyo two days later, had been attacked and damaged by Japanese fighters, whose pilots had apparently not heard of the ceasefire ordered by Japan's Emperor Hirohito or, more ominously, had chosen to ignore it. At the early morning briefing for the August 18 mission, the Dominator crewmen had been told to assume they'd be flying into what might still be very hostile territory. With final checks completed, the pilot of the lead B-32, 24-year-old First Lieutenant James L. Klein, released the aircraft's brakes and smoothly advanced the throttles. The low growl of four idling Wright R-3350 radial engines quickly swelled to a gut-rumbling howl, and the Dominator. The racy nose art painted on the sides of her forward fuselage identified her as Hobo Queen II, rapidly picked up speed as she surged down the runway. When the bomber hit 130 miles per hour abreast of the 4,500-foot marker, Klein gently lifted the nose. The aircraft was instantly transformed from a lumbering, earthbound behemoth into something far more graceful. Her gear coming up and flaps retracting, Hobo Queen II roared over the coral pit at the end of the airstrip and began a climbing 180-degree turn. With the runway clear, the pilot of the second Dominator, 27-year-old First Lieutenant John R. Anderson, moved his bomber from the taxiway into takeoff position. The aircraft shook as Anderson did a last engine run-up, and the acrid smell of burning, high-octane aviation gasoline wafted through the fuselage. Seconds later, her huge, paddle-bladed propellers clawing the already humid air, the B-32 began the sprint down Yontan's runway. As Anderson's dominator picked up speed, four young men sat huddled on a low, cot-like settee fixed to the port side of the fuselage in the bomber's rear cabin. Two of the men were gunners. Once the Dominator was airborne, they'd take their places, one in the tail turret and the other in the rearmost of the B-32's two top turrets. The other two men, 29-year-old Staff Sergeant Joseph Le Charité and 20-year-old Sergeant Anthony Marchion, were not members of the bomber's crew. They were assigned to the Yontan-based 20th Reconnaissance Squadron, Le Charité as an aerial photographer, and Marchion as a gunner photographer's assistant. At their feet rested a heavy canvas bag, 
containing the K-22 camera they would use to record the images that were the ultimate purpose of the day's mission. That mission was to photograph several Japanese military airfields sighted to the east and northeast of the sprawling Tokyo metropolitan area. The reason was twofold. First, to verify that Japanese aircraft were being kept on the ground in compliance with the ceasefire terms. And second, to determine whether the fields were in good enough condition to handle the heavily laden Allied transports that would help bring in the first occupation troops. On paper, the mission seemed straightforward. The four B-32s would cross the assigned recon area at 20,000 feet and two miles apart, following parallel flight lines that ran directly east and west. When they finished mowing the lawn, they would begin the return leg to Okinawa. The 1,900-mile round trip, roughly equivalent to a flight from Los Angeles to Seattle and back, would take eight to ten hours if all went well. As soon as his B-32 was airborne and in her own climbing turn, Anderson headed toward Klein's Dominator, clearly visible ahead, the already bright morning sun glinting off the lead bomber's uncamouflaged aluminum skin. The two other aircraft soon joined up, and in loose echelon formation, the four B-32s began a gradual climb toward their cruising altitude and pointed their nose toward Tokyo. At that same moment, some 900 miles to the northeast of Yontan, Emperor Hirohito and his senior advisors were most probably wondering if another Japanese city, perhaps even Tokyo itself, would soon disappear beneath a roiling mushroom cloud. Hirohito had been under no illusion that his August 15 radio address announcing the decision to surrender would be immediately accepted by all senior members of the government and the military. Yet even he was shocked by the events that unfolded in the hours and days following the broadcast. The announcement had sparked an army-led coup intended to reverse the emperor's surrender order, and naval and air units at various points around the country were still in open revolt, vowing to fight on to the last man. Should such pointless and ultimately futile military action convince the Allies that Hirohito was unable to enforce his surrender decision, or worse, that his government's agreement to the Allied ultimatum was simply a delaying tactic meant to give Japan more time to organize its defense against an Allied invasion, the consequences for Hirohito's much-diminished empire could well be catastrophic. Among those diehards about whom Hirohito should have been most worried were several of the finest fighter pilots in the Imperial Japanese Navy. On the morning of August 18, the men, members of the elite Kokutai Air Group based at Yokosuka, just 24 miles south of the Emperor's Tokyo Palace, had agreed to commit mutiny for the second time in as many days. The Yokosuka Kokutai's primary purpose by this point in the war was the development and testing of naval aircraft, which meant that among its members were some of the most experienced, talented, and successful pilots in what was left of Japan's naval air service. As a result, the unit was also tasked with aiding in the air defense of the greater Tokyo-Yokohama region. Over the preceding months, the Yokosuka Kokutai pilots had joined in the fierce defense of the east-central part of their homeland against the hordes of American B-29 Superfortress bombers and Allied land and carrier-based strike aircraft, that had been systematically reducing the military facilities, harbors, industrial centers, and key cities of eastern Honshu to smoking rubble. The willingness of the Yokosuka Kokutai pilots to launch themselves continually at the overwhelming numbers of enemy aircraft appearing daily and nightly over their nation implies a level of patriotic dedication verging on fanaticism and Hirohito's August 15 announcement of his decision to surrender to the Allies did little to dampen that nationalistic and professional fervor. Despite official orders from Imperial Japanese Navy headquarters to cease attacks on Allied aircraft, 
many of the Yokosuka Kokutai pilots felt, as did other Army and Navy aviators elsewhere in Japan, that the nation's airspace should remain inviolate until a formal surrender document had actually been signed. That belief had led several Yokosuka pilots to attack the B-32s engaged on the August 17 mission, and the passage of 24 hours had done nothing to cool their martial zeal. They were ready once again to disobey direct orders and punish any Allied airmen who came within range. Although they could not have known of the political turmoil in Tokyo, or the mood of the Yokosuka Kokutai pilots, the men aboard the Dominators, winging ever closer to the coast of Honshu on August 18, were only too aware of the mission's potential for disaster. Most had seen enough combat in the past months to have an inherent, visceral distrust of their enemy, an emotion validated in their minds by details revealed at the morning's pre-flight briefing of the Japanese fighter attacks on the B-32s involved in the previous day's mission. Adding to the airmen's underlying unease was the fact that their own defenses had been reduced by half. About five hours after that morning's takeoff from Yontan, two of the Dominators had aborted the mission due to mechanical problems and returned to Okinawa. Adding insult to injury, both Klein's aircraft and Hobo Queen II were dealing with bulky turrets and inoperable guns. Sadly, the mission would ultimately play itself out in ways that would exceed even the most pessimistic crew members' fears. Before the day ended, there would be one last desperate air combat between Americans and Japanese. That combat would come perilously close to reigniting a war that seemed all but over, and a young man would quietly bleed to death in the bright, clear skies above Tokyo, in the process gaining the dubious distinction of being the last American killed in air combat in World War II. Chapter 1 Sun and Gunner The American airmen who would suffer most from the decision to send B-32s back over Tokyo, despite the August 17 fighter attacks, was born almost exactly twenty years earlier, on August 12, 1925, in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Anthony James Marchione, or Tony as he was always known to family and friends, was in many ways the embodiment of the millions of young Americans who left their homes and families to serve in the nation's armed forces in World War II. Indeed, Tony's personal history a loving, all-American son of immigrant parents who grew up in a small town, dreaming of a career as a musician until war drew him far from home, might make him seem almost like a caricature of the clean-cut, self-effacing, and resolutely brave serviceman portrayed in the scores of rousingly patriotic movies made during the early 1940s. Yet, by all accounts, Tony Marchione was exactly the fine, upstanding young man that he appeared to be. And much of the credit for that rightly goes to his parents, who themselves traveled far from their childhood homes to make a new life in the new world. Italy, in the early 20th century, was a land of widespread economic inequality with the northern parts of the country vastly better off in most respects than the central and southern regions. The nation's population was growing rapidly, and many people emigrated to avoid what they saw as a future of crushing poverty. Among those who made the momentous decision to leave their ancestral homes for the promise of a better life abroad were two young people from the Abruzzo region on Italy's Adriatic coast, Raffaele Marchione and Emilia Ciancalini. Though born in the same week of June 1897, and in villages only nine miles apart, he in San Buono, and she in Cherny, the young man and woman who would become Tony Marchione's parents, never knew each other in Italy. Raffaele was the first to arrive in America, sailing into New York Harbor on September 30, 1913, aboard the SS Ancona, 
He was just sixteen, and spent his first few years living with his older brother, Nicola, who had already established himself in the sprawling Little Italy section of New York City. America's 1917 entry into World War I prompted Nicola to join the army, and Ralph, as he was now known, followed his brother into that service in January 1918. Assigned to the Army Medical Department, Ralph served in France before being honorably discharged in October 1919. After leaving the Army, the young man settled in Pottstown, where he lived with a cousin while apprenticing as a shoemaker. It may well have been in a shoe repair shop that Ralph first met Emilia. The young woman had arrived at the Port of Philadelphia in May 1921 on the SS Taormina and was met by an aunt and uncle who lived in Pottstown. It was while staying with them that she first encountered Ralph. The two obviously hit it off, for they were married in the city's St. Aloysius Roman Catholic Church on June 25, 1922. The newlywed settled in the heavily Italian south end of Pottstown, and Ralph continued to work for other people until he was able to open an independent shop in the mid-1930s. By that time, the couple had three children, Tony, Teresa, or Terry, born in 1927, and Geraldine, or Jerry, born in 1932. At about the same time that Ralph opened his own shop, People's Shoe Repair on High Street, he and Emilia bought a modest three-level row house at 558 King Street in central Pottstown. The rhythms of life in the Marchion household were dictated by work, six days a week in the shop for Ralph, every day in the home for Emilia, and school for Tony and his sisters. The elder Marchions were devout Roman Catholics. Though they sent their children to public schools, they ensured that Tony and the girls went to catechism at St. Aloysius on Saturday mornings and to Mass on Sundays. The family didn't have a car when the children were young, so parents and children walked wherever they needed to go. The 1930s were economically challenging for most American families, and the Marchions, like many others, lived frugally. Ralph had a backyard garden in which he grew tomatoes and peppers, and when the season was right, Emilia would can the produce for later use. In addition to her long hours cooking and cleaning, Tony's mother also made a few extra dollars by knitting socks at home for a local company. She turned the heels by hand and was paid for every pair she completed. Despite her workload and family responsibilities, Emilia maintained what her children later remembered as a generally cheerful disposition, singing Italian songs at the top of her lungs while she worked. Nor were songs the only Italian heard in the home. Unlike Ralph, whose time in the army and work in the shop had allowed him to become fluent in English, Emilia was far more comfortable in her native tongue, and generally spoke Italian to both her husband and her children. As the only son and oldest child in a traditional Italian-American family, Tony was doted on by his parents. This could have been a recipe for disaster, in that many children in similar situations grow up self-centered and spoiled. But Tony was devoted to Ralph and Emilia, and by all accounts did all he could to ease their hard lives. He would often scrub the floors in the home so that his mother wouldn't have to do it. And from the age of fourteen, he worked after school at a local bakery to earn the family a little extra money. He occasionally brought home leftover desserts, a trait that endeared him to his sisters. Fortunately for their hard-working parents, and likely because of the loving and nurturing atmosphere Ralph and Emilia created in the home. Tony and his sisters got along well together. Eighteen months older than Terry and five years older than Jerry, Tony was an easygoing and supportive brother. Although he took his family responsibilities seriously, he was always ready with a smile or a joke, and would often pull out his trumpet to play Terry and Jerry new tunes he'd heard on the radio. Music was a huge part of Tony's life. He'd started taking trumpet lessons while in elementary school, and by the time he entered Pottstown Senior High School as a sophomore in 1940, 
He was so accomplished with his horn that in addition to playing in the school orchestra, he was asked to join the swing band, made up almost entirely of juniors and seniors. The group played at school dances and during halftime at football games. Tony and a few of the others also got the occasional paid gig at local churches and in the summer at Pottstown's community swimming pool. It was as a high school junior that Tony discovered another creative outlet. An average student in most subjects, he excelled in drafting and mechanical drawing. Having designed a built-in bookshelf for the family home as part of a school assignment, Tony went on to a considerably more ambitious project. He drew up the complete plans for opening up an enclosed stairway in the King Street house by taking out most of a non-load-bearing wall and replacing it with a mahogany handrail and white balusters. Tony's skill with a drafting pen apparently grew from some innate creative ability, for he was also something of an artist. He occasionally worked with watercolors, but his preferred medium was simple graphite. His pencil sketches of people, objects, and landscapes decorated his school workbooks and were pinned to the walls of his bedroom. The understanding of scale and perspective that he'd acquired in his drafting classes stood him in good stead in his drawing, as it did when he became interested in photography during his senior year. Tony characteristically immersed himself in all aspects of the art form, including the technical. He was fascinated by cameras and their mechanical components. Tony graduated from high school in June 1943, some two months shy of his 18th birthday. While he had hopes of ultimately becoming a professional musician, he knew, as did every young and healthy male leaving high school that summer, that his personal plans would have to wait. The United States had been at war for 16 months, and Tony was certain to be drafted after he turned 18. Rather than attempt to launch himself into further schooling, or a career that would certainly be interrupted before it had truly begun, Tony took a full-time job at the Pottstown factory of the Dollar Jarvis Corporation. The metal castings manufacturer produced shell casings and other military materiel, and offered decent wages for workers willing to undertake 12-hour shifts. Tony stayed on the assembly line as summer turned to fall, waiting for the letter that would change his life. But as he waited, he also considered his options. He knew that as a draftee, he would have no say in the type of duty or even the branch of service to which he'd be assigned. Although he was happy to serve his country, he had no great desire to undertake that service as an infantryman or a sailor, and he knew that the only way of avoiding either of those possibilities was to enlist before his draft notice arrived. He'd always been fascinated by airplanes and the technical aspects of aviation. So on November 20, 1943, he did what must have seemed the logical thing. He joined the U.S. Army Air Forces. Ralph and Emilia Marchion were understandably devastated by their only son's decision to enlist, but they understood his motivations. His sisters were proud and supportive, and when it came time for Tony to report for induction, the whole family saw him off at the Pottstown Railway Station. Tony's first stop was New Cumberland Army Airfield, some sixty miles west of Pottstown and just south of Harrisburg. It was a brief stay, however, for after only a few days of initial processing, which included a basic physical, a host of inoculations, and the assignment of Army serial number 33834700, he and several hundred other young men left the snow-covered post aboard a train bound for a much warmer location, Miami Beach, Florida. Their ultimate destination was officially known as USAAF Technical Training Command Basic Training Center No. 4, and upon his arrival, Tony was assigned to Flight X-202 of the 409th Training Group. Over the following four months, he and his fellow trainees were introduced to the Army way of doing things from how to march in formation to how to field strip and fire the standard M1 Garand rifle. This first taste of military life was probably as jarring and as challenging for Tony 
as it is for most everyone who goes through basic training. But the few records that survive from this period in his life indicate that the young man from Pottstown adapted quickly and did well. Tony may have harbored hopes of becoming a pilot, but for reasons that are now lost to history, the USAAF apparently had other plans for him. Upon completion of his training in Miami Beach, he was transferred to the 569th Signal Aircraft Warning Battalion at Drew Army Airfield near Tampa. As its designation indicates, the 569th's mission was to locate and identify enemy aircraft in combat zones using mobile ground-based radar systems. The unit had been established just a few months before Tony joined it, and the logical assumption is that he had been tapped for training as either a radar operator or some sort of technician. The surviving records don't clearly indicate the nature of his assignment with the 569th, yet we can be certain that Tony wasn't pleased with it. For some reason, most probably because watching aircraft on a radar screen was not his idea of aviation, just weeks after arriving at Drew Field, Tony volunteered for a job that would definitely allow him to fly. He signed up to be an aerial gunner. As America's participation in World War II progressed, the Army Air Forces fielded thousands of light, medium, and heavy bombers of various types, and all of them carried defensive machine guns. These weapons were mounted in power-operated manned turrets, except on the B-29, which used remotely operated turrets, and on flexible handheld mounts. The AAF had opened its first flexible gunnery school in 1941 at Las Vegas Army Airfield, and by 1944, it and six other installations were turning out a collective average of 3,000 gunners a month. Because gun turrets were of necessity small and cramped spaces, enlisted gunners could be no more than six feet tall and weigh no more than 180 pounds. Prospective gunners also had to possess excellent eye-hand coordination and have a high level of mechanical aptitude in order to care for their guns and the turret systems. At 5 feet 6 inches and 125 pounds, Tony Marchione certainly met the physical requirements, and we can assume that his scores on the standard mechanical aptitude tests were equally sufficient, because he was accepted for instruction and transferred to the 38th Flexible Gunnery Training Group at Tyndall Army Airfield in Panama City, Florida. Tyndall's location on the Florida Panhandle made it an ideal aerial gunnery training installation in that the Gulf of Mexico afforded vast stretches of open water that could be used as machine gun ranges. The first class of students began training in February 1942, and by the time of Tony's arrival in mid-1944, the process for producing qualified and capable aerial gunners had evolved into a six-week, 290-hour mix of academic and practical instruction. Every day that the prospective gunners spent at Tyndall, except Sundays, began in the same way, with an hour of physical training, meant to ensure that the young men were fit enough to handle the rigors of aerial combat. Early on in their training, they were also tested for their ability to work at high altitudes, an evaluation that was carried out in Tyndall's low-pressure chamber. The men filed into the airtight enclosure in small groups, put on demand-flow oxygen masks, and then sat unmoving until the pressure within the chamber replicated the conditions they would experience at 35,000 to 38,000 feet. They were then told to take off their masks in order to familiarize themselves with the first signs of hypoxia, or oxygen starvation. Within minutes, they would be unable to perform even simple tasks, and instructors often had to help them put their masks back on. Any man who had obvious difficulty dealing with the altitude, whether it was severe sinus, ear, or vision problems, or an inability to come to grips with the sensations involved, was immediately dropped from the gunner training program and transferred to other non-flying duties. Those men who passed the altitude tests, including Tony Marchione, went on to learn the nuts and bolts of their new profession, beginning with in-depth study of what would soon be the primary tool of their trade, 
the Browning M2 50 caliber heavy machine gun. Over the course of 41 hours of classroom instruction, the trainees studied every aspect of the M2's design and construction, memorizing the nomenclature, location, and function of every one of the machine gun's parts. They learned the different types of ammunition the weapon could fire, including ball, tracer, armor piercing, and incendiary, and how to clean and maintain the 83-pound gun. Most important, the would-be gunners repeatedly practiced how to tear the weapon down and reassemble it, a process known as stripping. There were two methods the men had to master. The first, detail stripping, involved the disassembly of every removable piece of the weapon and would normally be done only when the 50 cal was to be thoroughly cleaned. And the second method, field stripping, the trainees removed only the parts required to discover the source of a given malfunction. Given that the latter operation might have to be done in the dark and at altitudes that would require the gunner to wear cold weather gear, the trainees had to learn to field strip and reassemble the M2 while wearing a blindfold and heavy flying gloves. Though learning the mechanics of the machine gun was important, of course, being able to put the weapon to effective use against the enemy was ultimately the only reason for a gunner's presence on an aircraft. Tony and his fellow trainees at Tyndall were therefore taught the science of air-to-air -air gunnery in a series of cumulative steps, beginning with classroom instruction in the physics of projectiles. This covered such topics as how a bullet's trajectory is affected by gravity and air density by the speed and orientation of the aircraft from which it is fired, and by the relative speed and position of the target aircraft. The trainees learned how to estimate a target's speed, range, and direction of flight, and learned to hit a target by using the techniques of deflection shooting, the way in which the gunner must lead the target by firing at a point ahead of, below, or above it, depending on circumstances. To aid them in the sighting process, the gunners-to-be also learned how to use and maintain a variety of optical and mechanical gun sights. All of this theoretical instruction was put into practice on Tyndall's ground gunnery ranges. After being introduced to and mastering stationary skeet shooting with shotguns in order to hone their eye-hand coordination, the trainees progressed to shooting at clay pigeons launched from the backs of moving trucks. They then moved on to firing BB guns at carnival-type moving target enclosures and used electronic guns to fire at motion picture images of attacking aircraft projected on a screen. During the third week of training, they graduated from pea shooters to the real thing, firing 50 caliber machine guns first at standing paper targets then at aircraft-shaped targets moving across the width of the range atop poles attached to pulleys or vehicles. During this phase, they fired both from flexible mounts and from a variety of aircraft gun turrets mounted on wooden platforms, turrets that they also had to learn to maintain and repair. In their last week at Tyndall, Tony and the other trainee gunners finally got to take to the air firing from the rear seats of AT-6 Texan dual-place trainers at target sleeves pulled, usually at a safe distance, behind other aircraft. Then, after passing a series of comprehensive examinations that evaluated not only their weapon knowledge and skill, but also such other vital abilities as aircraft recognition and combat first aid, the trainees became full-fledged MOS military occupational skill 611 aerial gunners. Their new incarnation denoted by the silver wings awarded to each man at the graduation ceremony. That ceremony was a hugely important waypoint in Tony's young life, of course, and he marked it by buying a postcard he intended to send to his parents. Purchased at Tyndall's small post exchange, the card carried a bit of rhyme that expressed the pride and esprit de corps that Tony and his fellow newly minted gunners felt. Titled A Gunner's Vow, it read, I wished to be a pilot, and you along with me. But if we all were pilots, 
where would the Air Force be? It takes guts to be a gunner, to sit out in the tail when the Messerschmitts are coming and the slugs begin to wail. The pilot's just a chauffeur. It's his job to fly the plane. But it's we who do the fighting, though we may not get the fame. If we all must be gunners, then let us make this bet. We'll be the best damn gunners that have left this station yet. As it turned out, Tony was able to deliver the card in person, for he was granted leave en route to his next assignment, and was able to spend a few days at home in Pottstown. He was welcomed joyously by his parents and sisters, and spent most of the precious few days with his family. He taught Jerry the Army Air Force's song, and had a jitterbug, the latter a skill he'd apparently picked up during his off-duty hours at Tyndall. His leave ended all too quickly, and at the end of the week, Ralph left sixteen-year-old Terry in charge of the shoe shop, and he and Emilia boarded the local train to Philadelphia with Tony. At the city's main terminal, they bade farewell to their son, who then boarded a train bound for a place none of the Marchions had ever been, Arizona. Like all newly minted aerial gunners, Tony's next assignment was to a combat crew training school, where he would integrate his skills with those of other airmen before they all shipped out for overseas duty. In his case, the school was located at Davis Mountain Army Airfield, just outside Tucson. Run by the 233rd Army Air Force's base unit, part of the 16th Bombardment Operational Training Wing, the 233rd was dedicated exclusively to forming and training 10-man replacement crews for the consolidated B-24 Liberator Bomber. The pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier were officers, whereas the others, the flight engineer, top turret gunner, the nose, tail, and ball belly turret gunners, and two waist gunners, were enlisted men. All members of the crew had already qualified in their respective skills, and it was during the 90-day combat crew training that they learned to work and fight as a team. Upon his arrival at Davis Mountain Field, Tony was assigned to a crew headed by lanky 23-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Robert W. Essig. The Iowa-born pilot had played semi-pro baseball before entering the service, and his approach to both flying and leadership was professional and competent, but relaxed. Tony eventually wrote home to his parents that Essig was the best doggone pilot in the country and a top-notch leader, and that every member of the crew would stick by him till the very end. Tony also wrote glowingly about three crewmates with whom he became fast friends, fellow gunners Raymond Zeck, Rudolf Nudo, and Frank Pallone. It was a good thing that the men of Essex crew bonded so well and so quickly, because the training they underwent at Davis Mountain was intense. Given the nature of the air war in both the European and Pacific theaters, much of that training focused on high-altitude, long-distance formation flying, initially in groups of two to four aircraft, and later in twelve-plane squadron box formations. The B-24s flew practice missions that lasted eight to ten hours, during which they would drop live bombs on target ranges and undertake formation evasive action against simulated enemy air attack. These flights also offered Tony and the other gunners the opportunity to coordinate their responses to incoming fighters, usually portrayed by war-weary P-40 Warhawks. By alerting each other to the enemy plane's changing position, as it zoomed into and through the B-24 formation. All of the training that Bob Essig and his men underwent at Davis Mountain was intended to turn them into a first-rate B-24 bomber crew that could undertake combat missions immediately upon arrival in an overseas theater. Throughout their training, Essig and his men had been told that they would ultimately be assigned to a bomb group of Major General Nathan F. Twining's Italy-based 15th Air Force, a possibility that was especially pleasing to Tony, Rudy Nudo, and Frank Pallone, all of whom still had relatives in the old country. 
But on December 16, 1944, a few days after the crew completed training at Davis Mountain, and while they were awaiting orders for overseas movement to Italy, the plans changed abruptly. As Tony later described it, it was getting late in the morning, and the sun was getting hotter by the minute. The enlisted men and the crew were just getting out of their sacks after a late morning nap. We didn't have anything to do now since we were waiting for our final orders to ship out. We all knew that our training here in the U.S. had been completed and that we were headed overseas for the big fight. We just wanted to get in the fight, for the sooner we got there, the sooner this damn war would be over, according to us. One thing each one of us was sweating out was whether we were going to get a furlough to see our families and girlfriends before we left. Just then, Bob Essig comes walking in our barracks dressed to kill. He had his pinks, officer's dress uniform on, and they were as neat as could be, with creases in the pants as sharp as a knife. Well, fellows, I have some bad news for you. As he said this, he looked as if he had just lost his best friend. A special order has just been handed to me, stating that five crews have been chosen for advanced training. They want each one of those five crews to report to Will Rogers Field to become a photo reconnaissance crew. We happen to be one of those five. As to the length of our training, no one knows. There's nothing we can do about it. We have until the 25th to report there. Yes, Christmas Day. We must be there, ready to start school. This last-minute change of plans was understandably upsetting for Tony and the other members of his crew. They had just completed three months of training to drop bombs on the enemy, not to take his picture. And while they were pleased to learn that they would have nine free days before they had to report to Will Rogers Field in Oklahoma City, they were more than a little dismayed that they wouldn't be able to actually spend Christmas with their loved ones. Moreover, the young airmen would not be traveling home on official government orders. Those would only cover their move from Davis Mountain directly to their new duty station. So if they chose to go home during the furlough period, they would not get any sort of railway priority. In Tony's case, it could therefore take up to three days to make the train journey from Tucson to Pottstown, and at least two days to get from Pennsylvania to Will Rogers. It must have seemed like a journey worth making, despite the brevity of the visit. For Tony did take a train home. He and the family celebrated an early Christmas, not realizing, of course, that it would be the last one they would all spend together. And after only a few days in Pottstown, Tony hopped a westbound Pullman, headed for Oklahoma City. It wasn't an especially enjoyable trip. The young aerial gunner got bumped from the train at least once so that his seat could be given to a serviceman traveling on permanent change of station orders. Tony nevertheless reported to Will Rogers Field on time and ate his Christmas dinner in a mess hall with Nudo, Pallone, and several hundred other G.I.s. Essig's crew, minus the bombardier, who wouldn't be needed in the new role, was assigned to Will Rogers' combat crew training station photo reconnaissance and began instruction on December 27 as Crew 86. Although the aircraft they flew during their time in Oklahoma outwardly resembled the machine they had flown at Davis Mountain, it differed in several significant ways. Designated the F-7A, the recon version of the standard B-24J retained its full defensive armament, but carried no bombs. The aircraft's forward bomb bay was fitted with long-range fuel tanks and its aft bomb bay was sealed shut to create a workspace for an aerial photographer. This section was provided with a heater, not for the comfort of the crew, but to maintain a constant temperature for the two vertical cameras mounted to shoot through small windows cut into the sealed bay doors. A three-camera trimetrigon system, intended to capture overlapping images, was installed in the former bombardier's position in the nose and was also fixed to shoot through small windows in the aircraft's lower fuselage. Though already a trained heavy bomber crew by the time they arrived at Will Rogers, 
The different requirements of photo-reconnaissance work meant that Essig and his men had to further sharpen some of their existing skills. Because photo-recon aircraft almost always flew alone, rather than in large formations, the navigator had to be particularly accurate in his calculations. Likewise, Essig and his co-pilot, 2nd Lieutenant John Ziegler, had to be extremely good at instrument flying, both to get the airplane to and from the target area, and to keep it on a precise course during the photo run, no matter how bad the conditions might be. The fact that the aircraft would not have the protection afforded by the mutually supportive fires of a combat box formation meant that the gunners would have to be that much better at locating, identifying, and successfully engaging hostile aircraft. In addition to that vital task, Tony Marchione, Ray Zek, Rudy Nudo, and Frank Pallone were also trained as photographer assistants learning such new skills as how to attach the cameras to their mounts and how to load and change film magazines. Although the actual operation of the cameras would be the responsibility of the aerial photographer, who would join the crew upon its arrival in the combat zone, Tony was particularly interested in the cameras and their capabilities. Essig and his crew spent nearly three months at Will Rogers Field, and their final exam was a complex photo-mapping mission that took them from Oklahoma to Colorado and back. Their target was the area around Denver's Lowry Army Airfield, the primary training station for AAF aerial photographers, which they shot from an altitude of 20,000 feet. Having successfully completed that mission and all of their assigned coursework, Essig and his men were rated as fully prepared for their work as a photo recon crew. In late March, they received orders to report to Hunter Army Airfield in Georgia, a processing center for replacement crews bound for overseas units. Despite the rigorous training at Will Rogers that had obviously kept Tony extremely busy, he apparently found time for romance, as evidenced by a poem he wrote during the train trip from Oklahoma to Georgia. While riding along in this weary train, thoughts of memories run through my brain. A thought, a poem, it's not very much, just to remind me of your sweet touch. When we were together, I never could talk, but always wanted to go for a walk. You've put a new world in my mind, and that's the world I want to find. The stars that shine in these dark skies remind me of your large blue eyes. Your little manners are very sweet. Your little soft voice cannot be beat. There's a little too much to tell you, Joe. A lot more things that we all know. Just how you walk and fix your hose. The way you smile and turn your nose. These few earnest lines provide us a rare glimpse into Tony Marchione's emotional life. By this point, he was, of course, a trained Army Air Force's aerial gunner, bound for the war that he felt it was his duty to help fight. But he was also a young man of just nineteen, and it is quite apparent that the girl he speaks of, her full name is lost to history, as is the story of how they met, had touched his life in a real and meaningful way. Thoughts of the girl he left behind, and of the promise that a future with her might hold, have sustained many a young man as he went off to war. We can assume that thoughts of the young woman named Joe, Boyd Tony, as he set out on a journey from which he knew he might not return. When Bob Essig and his men arrived at Hunter Field, they were still under the impression that they were headed for the Mediterranean, or perhaps England. They were soon disabused of that notion, however, for they were assigned as a replacement crew for the 20th Combat Mapping Squadron, a unit then stationed somewhere in the southwest Pacific, most often a euphemism for Australia or the Philippines. After only a few days in Georgia, the young aviators were back on a train, this time headed west to Utah's Kearns Army Air Base. 
located some seven miles southwest of Salt Lake City. The installation had been a B-24 training center until mid-1943, when most of its aircraft were transferred to other stations. By the time Tony and his fellow crew members arrived in early April 1945, Kearns' main tenant organization was the Army Air Force's Overseas Replacement Depot, West, which handled the processing and onward movement of personnel destined for the Pacific and the Far East. Essig and his men remained at the rather austere base for just over two weeks, during which time they received yet another physical exam, followed by inoculations meant to protect them against a bewildering array of tropical illnesses. They were also told to completely update their next-of-kin information and confirm the beneficiaries for their GI life insurance. Surviving records do not indicate how Tony and his fellow aviators made the journey from Utah to the Pacific, though the standard method was by troop ship or converted ocean liner from one of the two main West Coast ports of embarkation, Seattle or San Francisco. Vessels bound for the Southwest Pacific and Far East normally called at Pearl Harbor to refuel, without allowing the embarked troops ashore, then traveled on to Sydney, Australia. Upon arrival there, the replacement air crews assigned to the Far East or India would board another ship bound for their ultimate destination. In contrast, by early 1945, the men headed for New Guinea, the Philippines, or adjacent island areas would most often be transported by train to northern Queensland to board C-47 Skytrain troop carriers for the final leg of their long trans-Pacific journey. For Bob Essig's crew, that journey ended at Clark Field on Luzon, where they joined the 20th Combat Mapping Squadron by the middle of May. Organized at Colorado Springs Army Air Base in July 1942, the 20th had been deployed to the Southwest Pacific in December 1943 as part of the 6th Photographic Group, and initially operated from Nadzab, New Guinea, flying F-7As. Early combat operations revealed several flaws in that initial photo recon variant of the B-24, however most notably that the center vertical camera in the trimetragon installation in the nose was inadequately protected against jarring and had to be carefully realigned before each flight. Moreover, the presence of the bow turret and the gunner's need to move to and from it made for such crowded conditions in the nose compartment that changing the three-camera film magazines was extremely difficult. The 20th Combat Mapping Squadron noted these shortcomings in a detailed report, as did several other units operating the F-7A, and by July 1944, the unit began receiving the upgraded F-7B. This variant grouped the trimetragon system in the rear bomb bay with the other cameras, a change that greatly increased the success rate of photo recon and aerial mapping missions, and within a few months, Virtually all of the squadron's F-7s were B models. In April 1945, the 20th received the first of an eventual five F-7Bs, equipped with the AN-APS-15 ground ground-mapping radar system, widely referred to as H-2X and Mickey, which had been developed from the British H-2S set as a way to allow accurate bombing through cloud cover and at night. The retractable dome enclosing the radar's antenna replaced the F-7B's ball turret, and a radar repeater in the aircraft's camera bay allowed crews to take photographs of the images of ground locations. The ultimate purpose of this arrangement was to allow the images to be passed on to H-2X-equipped bomber units to help them better identify those targets when they appeared on their radar screens. Though in practice, the 20th Combat Mapping Squadron used its Mickey systems mainly to locate and map targets at night or in bad weather. It is likely that Bob Essig and his crew had received at least some H-2X training while at Will Rogers Field, because they were tapped to fly their first Mickey mission soon after joining the squadron. The purpose of the flight was to photomap more than a dozen Japanese positions in and around the Baletti Pass in central Luzon, about 65 miles northeast of Clark Field. 
Highway 5, the two-lane road that snaked over the 3,000-foot-high pass, was the only route between central Luzon and the strategically important Cagayan Valley. The pass had therefore been the scene of continuous, bitter fighting since U.S. and Filipino forces had launched the battle for Luzon the previous January. Essig and his crew, augmented by aerial photographer Staff Sergeant Hunter, took off on the morning of June 1 in F-7B-4441943. The short distance to the target area did not make the flight any less challenging, for the presence of significant enemy anti-aircraft defenses around the pass dictated frequent changes of course and altitude in order to secure the required images without getting shot up in the process. And although few Japanese fighters were still active over Luzon by that point of the war, Tony Marchione and his fellow gunners had to maintain their vigilance throughout the multi-hour flight. There was no enemy opposition, fortunately, and Tony's first combat mission ended with the aircraft's safe return to Clark Field just before sundown. Essig's crew was not assigned a specific aircraft, and the area familiarization and radar training missions they undertook over the following weeks were flown in various F-7Bs. But flying was not the only thing Tony and his crewmates did at Clark Field. The men were all assigned what the military calls collateral duties, which for an officer might entail serving as squadron morale or recreation officer, or managing the inventory of a deceased airman's possessions before they were sent to his next of kin. The non-flying tasks for Tony and his fellow gunners included such things as working in the machine gun maintenance shed and standing airplane guard duty. This latter task, as its name implies, required enlisted men from all of the squadron's crews to undertake rotating four-hour shifts at night, guarding the flight line, to prevent sabotage or the theft of equipment. On June 15, the broadening of the unit's mission from combat mapping to photographic and radar reconnaissance resulted in a change of designation. From that point on, the unit was known by the admittedly accurate but decidedly unwieldy title 20th Reconnaissance Squadron Long Range Photo RCM for Radar Countermeasures, or 20th Recon Squadron for short. Four days after the designation change, Bob Essig and his crew flew their second H-2X combat sortie. The mission was to be far more challenging than the Belletti Pass operation, in that the target areas were on the Chinese coast. Both were port cities. Swatow, 174 miles northeast of Hong Kong, and Amoy, another 125 miles farther up the Taiwan Strait. The mission objective, to capture pictures and H-2X images of the port facilities and their air defenses, would require a 1,500-mile round-trip flight. The aircraft assigned was the same F-7B used on the Belletti Pass flight, and a Staff Sergeant Frasher was tapped as the aerial photographer for the mission. Bob Essig lifted the F-7B off from Clark Field just after dawn and set a course to the northwest. The first leg of the flight took the aircraft out over the western edge of Lingayen Gulf, just east of Santiago Island. From that point there was nothing but water for some 600 miles and there was little for Tony and his fellow gunners to do but continually scan the surrounding skies for any sign of enemy fighters. There were none, and the only evidence of hostile action was some inaccurate anti-aircraft fire far below the F-7B, as it made landfall just south of the first target, the port at Swatow. Complete cloud cover over the area made it impossible for Frasher to take any photos, but the crew was able to get some usable H-2X images. After completing a series of runs over the port facilities, Essig turned the F-7B back toward the sea, and once about 20 miles offshore, turned to the northeast for the 120-mile leg to Amoy. The weather was no better over the second target, however, and after Frasher captured some H-2X imagery, Essig banked the aircraft for home. The F-7B landed safely at Clark Field, 10 hours and 30 minutes after taking off. 
Less than a week after Essig and his crew returned from their second combat mission, U.S. forces completed the capture of Okinawa. Within days of that hard-won and costly victory, the 20th Recon, like the B-32-equipped 386th Bomb Squadron, received a warning order for a permanent change of station to Yontan Airfield. Before that move took place, however, Tony Marchion and his crewmates would undertake one last mission from Clark Field, one that would prove to be the most difficult yet. The flight on July 9 was undertaken in another H-2X-equipped aircraft, F-7B-44-42028, and differed significantly from the two previous combat flights. The target was the Japanese airdrome at Koshun, Formosa, the same field that the 386th Dominators had bombed on their third combat test mission less than a month earlier, and Essig and his crew would be flying the 20th Recon Squadron's first night photography sortie over enemy territory. The nature of the mission required a few special modifications to the aircraft. The first was the installation of a K-19B night reconnaissance camera, fitted vertically in the F-7B's aft compartment. The 9x9-inch format camera was fitted with a photocell unit that would trip the shutter when an artificial light source illuminated the target. That light source was the 51-pound AN-M46 flash bomb. To carry and drop 10 of them, the F-7B's forward bomb bay was unsealed and bomb shackles were reinstalled on one side. The Army Air Forces had first used night aerial photography in combat during the 1943 Allied invasion of Sicily, and by July 1945, the techniques were well established. The AN-M46 was dropped like a conventional bomb from an altitude of 10,000 to 12,000 feet, and a mechanical time fuse detonated it at 3,000 feet. The resultant 700 million candle power flash lasted barely a second, but allowed the K-19B to capture an image of an area roughly two miles long by four and a half miles wide. Although the system worked well, there were definite drawbacks from the point of view of the dropping aircraft's crew. The flash bomb was notoriously fragile, and the slightest jarring such as that caused by turbulence in flight or the nearby explosion of an anti-aircraft round, could render it inoperable. More seriously, the time fuses were known to be unreliable, and it was not uncommon for the flash bomb to detonate as soon as it left the bomb bay, with all the obvious consequences. And finally, the fuses could not be reset in flight, which meant that if the dropping aircraft needed to make repeated passes over the target, it had to do so at a fairly constant altitude, making it a sitting duck for ground gunners. Bob Essig and the men of his crew were undoubtedly aware of these issues, as were the two aerial photographers assigned to the mission, Staff Sergeants Hannigan and Kelsey. There were no problems during the loading of the flash bombs, however, and the F-7B lifted off from Clark Field on schedule just before sundown. The flight to Formosa was also routine, but as the aircraft started its first photo run, things started to go sour. Unusually accurate anti-aircraft fire bracketed the F-7B, and when it came time to drop the first AN-M46, the plane's bomb release system malfunctioned. Four of the flash bombs tumbled from the bomb bay on their own, without arming, dropping harmlessly into the night. As Tony later described the events in a letter to a friend, the navigator and flight engineer volunteered to drop the remaining six flash bombs by hand. This was a particularly harrowing process. To disconnect the devices from their shackles and pull the arming wires from the fuses before casting the flash bombs into the night, the men had to stand on a narrow catwalk that bisected the open bomb bay with no safety line securing them, and exposed to the cold wind and the buffeting caused by the ak, -ak bursts. And they had to do that more than once, given that the F-7B made repeated runs over the target for nearly an hour, frequently illuminated by Japanese searchlights. 
nor did things improve much after Essig turned the aircraft for home. Just after leaving the target area, the number one left outboard engine caught fire. Whether as the result of enemy action or a mechanical malfunction is unclear, and Essig had to shut the engine down and feather the propeller. The F-7B made the remainder of the journey back to Clark Field on three engines and landed safely after eight hours and twenty minutes of total flight time. The men of Essex's crew made it through the difficult mission without injury, but on July 13, Tony Marchione ended up in the Clark Field Base Hospital with what he described to a friend at home in Pottstown as a slight case of hepatitis. There's an epidemic of it here on Luzon. It's nothing serious. It's just that you lose your appetite and you're quite sick in your stomach. But that only lasts for a week, and then you're well. But they keep you in the hospital for 30 days regardless, so they can keep you on a diet. Right now I feel as great as ever, but not a chance of getting out for another two weeks. Not too bad, though. Getting plenty of rest, and we can go swimming. Swimming and quiet rest were apparently not the only way Tony and his fellow patients were allowed to pass the time, for they were able to attend a USO show featuring the old professor of swing, band leader Kay Kaiser. It was obviously a performance that thrilled the young would-be swing trumpeter. He put on a great show the other night. Wow! He didn't have his band with him due to his radio show in the States. I think he said Phil Harris or Phil Baker is taking his place during his USO tour. He got up a GI band, and they were really solid. He did bring four of the most beautiful girls along. They had everything. Wow. You know Kay is about the best showman of all the big band leaders. He doesn't need a band, because he's the whole show. Then, good son that he was... Tony asked his friend to keep the news of the illness to himself. Oh, listen, don't mention to anyone that I'm in the hospital, because if you do, it's very possible the news will get around to my folks, and you know how mothers are. They worry over nothing, and especially my mother. Okay? I'll let them know as soon as I get out. In the letter, Tony also wrote something that his friend might well have misunderstood saying that he wished to hell that he could get out of the hospital so he could put in some combat time. This wasn't false bravado. It was simple pragmatism. Just days after Germany's unconditional surrender in early May 1945, the U.S. War Department implemented a point system to govern the return to the United States and demobilization of Army personnel in Europe. Rotation points, as they were informally called, were awarded for time and service, years deployed overseas, awards received, total flight hours and combat flight hours, among other things. Those men with at least 85 points were the first to be sent home for demobilization, and most U.S. military personnel in the Pacific Theater assumed, rightly as it turned out, that the same system would be instituted following Japan's surrender. Tony's desire for more combat time was therefore likely no more than a wish to earn as many points as possible, as quickly as possible, in order to speed his return to Pottstown once the fighting ended. It was a desire that was soon to have tragic consequences. Though Tony's stay in the Clark Field Base Hospital was originally supposed to last 30 days, he was released four days early, on August 9, so he could join his crewmates for the move to Okinawa. The 20th Recon Squadron's headquarters staff and several F-7s had departed for Yontan on August 3, with the remainder of the squadron scheduled to leave Clark Field on August 11. The afternoon before that, however, the base radio station received words of Japan's conditional acceptance of the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. The word spread quickly, and even though it wasn't actual surrender, everyone at Clark, and throughout the Pacific Theater for that matter, saw the news as a great reason to celebrate. As Tony wrote to another hometown friend, We didn't believe it at first. 
but when celebratory flares and ACAC started to fill the skies and searchlights circled the skies, we knew this was it. The G.I.s went wild. Wow, what a celebration we had. The officers had a barrel of whiskey. Can you imagine, feller? A barrel, fifty-five gallons. So the squadron had one big time. We all had to turn our pistols in first, though. You know, when the men get tight, anything can happen. I didn't drink much because I didn't want to get sick again. Not overindulging in the whiskey was probably a very smart move on Tony's part. For he and the remaining 20th Recon Squadron air crews and key staff personnel took off from Clark Field on the morning of the 11th, bound for Yontan. For those still suffering from the previous day's merrymaking, the 900-mile flight to Okinawa would certainly have been an unpleasant and painfully long journey. Though the men of the 20th got right to work once they landed at Yontan, Bob Essa gave Tony permission to take a few hours off on the afternoon of August 12 to observe a milestone, his 20th birthday. His pals Nudo and Pallone had managed to preserve a bit of the whiskey that had flowed on August 10, and the three young Italian-Americans apparently passed a few enjoyable hours whooping it up in the tent they shared, just off the Yontan flight line. From that same tent on August 15, Tony wrote to a friend about his impressions of Okinawa, calling it beautiful and the closest country I've seen here in the Pacific that reminds me of the U.S. He also provided a glimpse of how austere life was on the as-yet-uncompleted Yontan base. First few days we were here, we ate nothing but spam, bully beef, and dehydrated foods, and it was miserable. Today we had fresh pork and potatoes— Boy, that really was a treat after those darn rations. Since our showers aren't completed as yet, we have to walk nearly a mile to a creek to bathe, down a mountainside, too. Also do our own laundry till the squadron laundry is operating. The big news in that August 15 letter, of course, was that the happy day has arrived. Tony wrote that Japan's unconditional acceptance that very day of the Allied surrender terms and the ceasefire that had gone into effect throughout the Pacific Theater were wonderful, but added that he didn't think his chances of getting back to the States are very good for a while yet. Think we'll have to stay over and do some peacetime mapping. Much to my dislike, darn it. Tony was also aware that the end of hostilities would have other professional consequences. Don't think I'll make that rocker a fourth stripe indicating promotion to staff sergeant, now that the war is over. My guess is that ratings will be frozen, but I don't give a darn. All I want is to be a PFC, and I don't mean in the Army. It was almost certainly Tony's heartfelt desire to be a civilian sooner rather than later that led him to make what would ultimately turn out to be the worst decision of his young life. Following its arrival on Okinawa, the 20th Recon Squadron was tapped to provide personnel for any B-32 mission that had a reconnaissance aspect. Men from Tony's squadron were aboard the Dominators that conducted the shipping sweeps over the East China Sea and the Korea Strait on August 13-14, and on The Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen II, when they were recalled late on the 15th. Though the 20th continued to be responsible for providing the necessary personnel for any B-32 reconnaissance flights conducted after the ceasefire announcement, the squadron commander decided to allow men to volunteer to assist the photographers assigned to the mission, because any flight over Japan would be counted as a combat mission until the actual signing of the surrender document. Those who volunteered to take part in the B-32 flights would accrue additional rotation points, while not actually running the risk of getting shot at. Moreover, volunteers would have the opportunity to see Japan from the air well before their comrades would step ashore for occupation duty. As a qualified aerial photographer assistant, Tony Marchion could legitimately boost his rotation points by taking part in a B-32 mission. 
It must have seemed like an ideal way to increase his chances of a quick return to the United States. He would get combat points for riding along on what promised to be a long but delightfully boring flight. But Tony wasn't a fool. He waited until the August 16 mission over Tokyo went off without any enemy interference, before adding his name to the roster of the 20th Recon Squadron men offering to take part in a Dominator mission. On the morning of August 17, well before the four B-32s ran into the hornet's nest over Tokyo, Tony wrote a cheerful, almost whimsical letter to his sister Jerry, datelined somewhere on the Ryukyu Islands. The missive bore no indication that he had any reason to regret his decision. Indeed, after mentioning that censorship of mail would soon be lifted, he added that in the next few days we'll be able to write whatever we please. Won't that be great? It would be the last letter Tony Marchione ever wrote. Chapter 2 The Second String Super Bomber By the time Tony Marchione sat down at a makeshift desk in his tent at Yontan on August 17 to write to his youngest sister, America's participation in the Allied War in the Pacific had lasted three years, eight months, and ten days. That war had initially not gone well for the United States and its allies, of course. The devastating Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and other installations on the Hawaiian island of Oahu on December 7, 1941, had been followed by what at the time seemed to be an unending string of defeats throughout Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. The Philippines, French Indochina, British Malaya, and the Netherlands East Indies had all fallen to Japan's seemingly invincible air, sea, and land forces. Even when the tide began to turn in the Allies' favor following the June 1942 Battle of Midway, the road to Tokyo promised to be long, difficult, and bloody. One of the greatest challenges the Allies faced in the war against Japan was the sheer expanse of what military planners now refer to as the overall battle space. For World War II's Pacific Theater was truly vast. It spanned multiple time zones and the international dateline, encompassed some three million square miles of the planet's surface, and even in 1941 was home to more than half of the world's population. These geographic realities ensured that the Pacific War would of necessity be a maritime struggle. However, since the early 1930s, American war planners had clearly understood that military air power would also play a major role in any conflict with Japan. Unfortunately, at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, the vast majority of U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Army aircraft in the Pacific were obsolescent or simply outclassed by the Japanese types they were up against, and American pilots had to make do with what they had until newer and more capable machines became available. Among the organizations most affected by the initial shortage of suitable aircraft was Major General George C. Kenney's Australia-based U.S. Fifth Air Force. The gruff and plain-spoken Army aviator had arrived in the land down under in July 1942 to take command of the Southwest Pacific Area's Allied Air Forces, an organization that the 52-year-old Kenny quickly determined was the goddamnedest mess you ever saw. With the support of General Douglas MacArthur, who had been given command of the Southwest Pacific Area, SWPA, after his arrival in Australia from the besieged Philippines in March 1942, Kenny had reorganized Allied Air Forces into Fifth Air Force. To further enhance the new organization's operational capabilities, Kenny subdivided it into five Bomber Command and five Fighter Command, with both units receiving procurement, supply, and repair support from 5th Air Service Command. Simply activating these organizations did not make them immediately capable of effectively carrying the war to the enemy, however. In the early days of operations from Australia and later from New Guinea, 5th Air Force and its subordinate units faced significant challenges. 
Kenny initially had to make do with a motley collection of tired and well-worn aircraft. Among them, early model B-17 Flying Fortress heavy bombers, A-20 Havoc, B-25 Mitchell, and B-26 Marauder medium bombers, P-39 Air Cobra and P-40 Warhawk fighters, and a grab bag of transport types. Indeed, the operational and environmental challenges 5th Air Force faced in its earliest days initially made its designation as the Allies' main offensive air arm in SWPA more an aspiration than a reality. As the war in the Pacific progressed, however, Kenny and the Flying Buccaneers of 5th Air Force received newer and more capable aircraft, replacing their original B-17 bombers with longer-ranged B-24s and fielding P-38 Lightning and P-47 Thunderbolt fighters in lieu of the increasingly outmoded P-39s and P-40s. All of these aircraft types were put to good use, supporting the Allied advance northward from Australia, in New Guinea in 1943 and 1944, and the Philippines in 1944 and 1945. In June 1945, a month after the liberation of the Philippines, Kenny was named Commander of Far East Air Forces, FIF. As such, he not only retained control of 5th Air Force, now commanded by his former deputy, Major General N.S.C. Whitehead, he gained both the U.S. 13th Air Force and the formerly Hawaii-based 7th Air Force. Operating from Luzon, 5th Air Force ranged widely along the coasts of French Indochina, mainland China, and over Formosa, as well as undertaking long-distance anti-shipping missions throughout the South China Sea. But Kenny had even bigger things in mind for the entire Far East Air Forces. The primary goals of the United States' island-hopping strategy in the Pacific included securing forward bases from which armadas of new Boeing B-29 Super Fortress very heavy bombers could intensify the direct bombardment of the Japanese home islands. An assault that began in mid-June 1944, when from austere bases in China, B-29s of the 20th Air Force launched the first U.S. air attack on Japan since the April 1942 Doolittle Raid. While serving as a staff officer at the then Army Air Corps Materiel Division at Wright Field, Ohio, from 1939 to 1942, George Kenney had been part of the team that developed and refined the design and performance requirements for the very long-range bomber program. Boeing's B-29 was one of the aircraft produced as a result of that program, and its very long-range heavy bomb load and sophisticated self-defense systems made it immensely attractive to every U.S. Army Air Force's combat commander in the Pacific and Far East. As one historian later expressed it, Kenny seems to have entertained some belief that because of his time at the Materiel Division, he enjoyed a personal priority in plans for the B-29's use. Whether he held that opinion or not, Kenny, like Douglas MacArthur, firmly believed that the B-29 was ideally suited for operations in the Southwest Pacific, and he continuously and aggressively lobbied for the big bombers to be assigned to him. Unfortunately, Army Air Force's Chief General Henry H. Hap Arnold believed that the B-29s would be most effective if they flew from the Mariana Islands rather than the Philippines, and when the logistical difficulties of supporting superfortress operations from bases in China became overwhelming, Arnold ordered the big bombers move to fields on the newly captured islands of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. Kenny, never one to give up a fight easily, continued his adamant lobbying for the B-29s, far beyond the point of prudence, in the process angering Arnold so much that he seriously considered relieving the fief commander and replacing him with someone less troublesome. In early March 1945, with the battle for the Philippines essentially over, Kenny decided to travel to Washington. His mission was twofold. First, he wanted to smooth relations with Arnold, who was still recovering from a heart attack he'd suffered several weeks earlier. Second, 
Kenny wanted to personally examine a bomber that he'd heard might be a decent stand-in for the B-29s he so coveted, but was apparently never going to get. The possible replacement aircraft, the machine with which Kenny hoped to make a significant contribution to the aerial bombardment of Japan, so long foreseen in American war planning for the Pacific, was the B-32 Dominator, and Kenny's introduction to it would ultimately have tragic consequences for Tony Marchion. When George Kenny arrived in Washington, D.C., on March 14, 1945, he was a worried man. Before leaving the Philippines, he had heard from a trusted aide, newly returned from the States, that Army Air Force's headquarters was buzzing with rumors regarding Hap Arnold's imminent relief of Kenny because of the latter's constant and far too vocal campaigning to receive B-29s. Understandably concerned that he might be removed from his command before the war in the Pacific was won, Kenny was determined to see Arnold at the earliest opportunity. An immediate audience with the Army Air Force's chief wasn't forthcoming, however, because Arnold was still recuperating in Florida. Kenny instead made the rounds at the Pentagon, participating on MacArthur's behalf in several high-level meetings pertaining to Operation Downfall, the planned Allied two-phase invasion of the Japanese home islands. Kenny also checked in with Lieutenant General Barney M. Giles, chief of the air staff and the Army Air Force's deputy commander. The two men had known each other for years, and Giles was characteristically blunt. Kenny wasn't going to get B-29s, ever, and for the good of his career, he needed to drop his continuing effort to obtain the superfortress for fief. Finally convinced of the futility of his campaign for B-29s, Kenny, like any good staff officer confronted with a superior's negative response, trotted out his fallback plan. As Kenny later recalled, I asked about the B-32, a consolidated aircraft bomber that had been built as an ace in the hole in case the B-29 had not turned out successfully. Giles said they were building about 200 of the B-32s, but the assignment would be up to Hap Arnold. Anxious both to save his job and to gain priority access to the B-32, Kenny quickly made an appointment to meet with Arnold in Florida. Though the senior officer was leery of a face-to-face -face encounter with a subordinate who could be extremely irritating, even when halfway around the world, Arnold consented to the meeting, which occurred in Miami on March 17. Kenny was apparently on his best behavior, and after the two men had buried the hatchet and sat down to lunch, the Far East Air Force's commander carefully brought up the second reason for his trip south from Washington. I told Arnold how things were going in the Pacific, and broached the subject of assigning me enough B-32s to equip one of my heavy groups. If he would give me the plane, I would give it a real test so that he could make a decision whether to go on with production or abandon it. He finally promised to send them out to me, beginning in June, when about twenty would have been delivered from the factory. Undoubtedly relieved that he wouldn't have to listen to any more of Kenny's pleas for B-29s, and apparently feeling expansive, Arnold picked up the telephone and ordered the two B-32s be flown to Bowling Field outside Washington. He directed Kenny to go back north, and looked the aircraft over. If, after inspecting the B-32s, he still wanted the type for the Southwest Pacific, Arnold said, he would provide enough for two bombardment groups, some 90 aircraft, under then-current tables of organization. Kenny was back in Washington by March 20, and that afternoon he walked out onto the bowling field flight line to examine the aircraft he hoped would change both the composition of his command and the nature of the air war it was conducting against Japan. One of the B-32s had been flown up from Florida's Eglin Field, and the other had come in from Wright Field in Ohio. Although the squat, single-tailed B-32 was perhaps not as elegant as the superfortress for which Kenny had long carried a torch, he liked what he saw, and his initially positive reaction was reinforced when he took one of the Dominator's controls during a forty-minute flight over the snow-covered Maryland and Virginia countryside. Impressed by the bomber's flight characteristics, 
and its potential ability to carry ten tons of bombs from Clark Field on Luzon to southern Japan. Kenny was a confirmed fan of the B-32 by the time the aircraft thumped back down onto Bowling's runway. He immediately called Giles at the Pentagon and told him that Far East Air Forces would take Arnold up on his offer to send Dominators to the Southwest Pacific. Unfortunately, Kenny's enthusiasm for the B-32 and the possibilities it appeared to offer FIF helped convince him to overlook an inconvenient reality. The reason Dominators were available when B-29s were not was simply that in the competition to produce a long-range American super bomber, the B-32 had come in a distant second. By the early 1930s, it had become an article of faith for U.S. Army Air Corps planners that an American victory in any future war, especially one fought against Japan in the Pacific and Far East, would largely depend on the nation's ability to project its air power over vast distances. And given the prevailing doctrine at the time, the projection of air power specifically referred to strategic bombardment, the ability to defeat an enemy almost solely through the systematic aerial destruction of his industrial centers and military infrastructure. Throughout the decade, the Air Corps Materiel Division at Wright Field continually refined the performance and capability requirements for large, long-range aircraft capable of carrying significant bomb loads to distant targets. The Boeing B-17 and the consolidated B-24, and to a greater extent the innovative but ultimately impractical Boeing XB-15 and Douglas XB-19, were important steps toward developing what the Air Corps called the Very Long Range VLR, or occasionally the Very Heavy Bomber. Yet by the end of the decade, no suitable VLR bomber had reached the production stage. The XB-15 and XB-19 had not evolved past the experimental stage, and the B-17 and B-24, though excellent aircraft in many respects, simply could not be economically upgraded enough to meet the VLR requirements. The Air Corps needed longer-ranged machines, capable of bombing from altitudes between 5,000 and 30,000 feet and of being fitted with enough machine guns to defend themselves adequately during the journey to and from their distant targets. The September 1939 outbreak of war in Europe provided just the shock needed to transform the VLR project from theory into practice. On November 10, Air Corps Chief Arnold asked the War Department for permission to initiate the development of a long-range, four-engine heavy bomber that would surpass in all respects the then-current models of the B-17 and B-24. His request was granted with what passed for speediness in Washington, and on January 29, 1940, the nation's top aircraft manufacturers began receiving Request for Data R-40B, the document that laid out the Army's specifications for the new bomber. The requirements were ambitious. The aircraft would have to carry 2,000 pounds of bombs, some 5,300 miles, at 400 miles per hour, would have to be mechanically reliable under virtually all weather and operational conditions, and, in keeping with the Air Corps' dedication to the concept of high-altitude precision bombing, would have to be pressurized. On April 8, 1940, Boeing, Lockheed, Douglas, and Consolidated Volte submitted preliminary design studies. An Air Corps Evaluation Board designated the proposed aircraft in order of preference as, respectively, the XB-29, XB-30, XB-31, and XB-32, and signed contracts with each firm to provide preliminary engineering data. Lockheed and Douglas subsequently withdrew from the competition, leaving the XB-29 and XB-32 as the only viable contenders. San Diego-based Consolidated's entry was known within the company as Model 33. The design featured a shoulder-mounted, high-lift, low-drag Davis wing with a span of 135 feet, twin end-plate fin and rudder assemblies, 
an 83-foot-long cylindrical fuselage, tricycle landing gear, and dual roll-up bomb bays. Each of the XB-32's four planned turbo-supercharged Wright R-3355 Cyclone engines would produce 2,200 horsepower, and the two inboard power plants would be fitted with reversible pitch propellers. The new aircraft would be pressurized, and its defensive armament would be housed in remotely operated and retractable gun turrets. All these new features were expected to give the XB-32 a gross weight of just over 100,000 pounds. The Air Corps approved Consolidated's design proposal on September 6, 1940, and ultimately awarded the firm a contract for three prototype aircraft, with the first to be delivered within 18 months of the contract date, and the second and third at 90-day intervals after the initial example. Wind tunnel testing of a scale model of the XB-32 indicated that the aircraft's directional stability would be insufficient, so Consolidated's wooden XB-32 mock-ups were modified to reflect minor changes intended to correct the issue, but kept their twin tails. Army inspectors approved the revised control surface mock-ups in early January 1941 and the power plant mock-ups in April, and in June, the Army ordered 13 YB-32 service test machines, in addition to the XB-32s. The flight testing of the XB-32s was a long and difficult process. From the time the XB-32 first flew, on September 7, 1942, the aircraft was plagued by problems with its various subsystems and continued to have stability issues stemming from the twin-tail arrangement. The second prototype crashed, killing Consolidated Senior Test Pilot, and the flight test program got so far behind schedule that it seriously jeopardized the Army Air Force's long-range contingency plan for America's eventual entry into the war. Completed by the Air War Plans Division in August 1941 and designated AWPD-1, the plan laid out a program of precision strategic bombing of Nazi Germany and required 6,834 bombers, organized into 98 groups, 68 of which were to be very heavy groups, built around B-29s and B-32s. Because the XB-29 was also encountering delays, it was imperative that the consolidated aircraft reach full-scale production as soon as possible, if AWPD-1 were to proceed on schedule. Timely production of the B-32 was never in the cards, however. Myriad mechanical problems continued to dog the aircraft, and in February 1943, the Army canceled the order for the 13 YB-32s. By that time, the B-29 had largely overcome its own teething troubles, and some influential Army Air Forces officers were beginning to advocate the outright cancellation of the B-32 in favor of the Boeing bomber. Consolidated wasn't ready to throw in the towel, though, and went to great lengths to modify the aircraft's design in response to service recommendations. These changes included replacing the remotely operated defense weapon system with 10 50 caliber machine guns mounted two each in five man turrets, eliminating pressurization, improving the power plants and flight control systems, and perhaps most important, replacing the trouble plagued twin tails by a single vertical stabilizer. The virtual redesign of the XB-32, coupled with a continuing need to meet the requirements of AWPD-1, ultimately led the Army Air Forces to place orders for some 1,200 B-32 bombers, including TB-32 trainer versions. This number was intended to allow the 8th and 15th Air Forces in the Mediterranean and England, respectively, to convert their B-17 and B-24 heavy bomb groups to B-32s though by the spring of 1944, it was all too obvious that continuing delays in testing the aircraft coming off Consolidated's Fort Worth, Texas line would make it impossible to achieve that goal. Indeed, the Army Air Force's directive concerning the comprehensive testing of production B-32s wasn't even issued until mid-August 1944, the same month that the aircraft's name was officially changed from the original Terminator to Dominator.
That directive called for a 200 flying hour test program to be conducted by three different Army Air Forces agencies spread across five states, as well as for an overseas combat test. But again, production delays derailed the best laid plans. And by mid December 1944, the entire Dominator program was on the verge of cancellation. The B 32 won a stay of execution almost solely because of an evaluation of the aircraft undertaken by Brigadier General Donald Wilson, the Chief of the Army Air Force's Proving Ground Command, and, perhaps not coincidentally, George Kenney's former Chief of Staff at SWPA's Allied Air Forces and 5th Air Force. Although his report acknowledged the Dominator's troubled gestation and continuing difficulties, Wilson pointed out that it would be financially and militarily irresponsible to kill off the B-32 before it had been thoroughly tested. He therefore recommended that both the service test program and the training of B-32 crews proceed, and suggested that the Dominator might yet evolve into a capable and dependable bomber. Hap Arnold, likely still hoping to supplant some of his overworked B-17s and B-24s with B-32s, accepted Wilson's recommendations and ordered the testing and crew training programs to proceed. Conducted between June and September 1945, the B-32 service test program confirmed that the Dominator had several less than sterling qualities. Among them were high interior noise levels that were wearying for the crew, especially on the flight deck. Many instruments and controls were poorly positioned. The electrically operated manned gun turrets were prone to jamming during rapid traverse. And most alarming, serious design flaws in the engine nacelles contributed to an unusually high number of power plant fires. But the B-32 also proved to have good points. It was surprisingly nimble for an aircraft of its size, with especially impressive directional control at low speeds. Its gun turrets provided better than adequate protection when they worked. It was relatively easy to maintain, and of particular importance, it was a solid and stable bombing platform. Although these data would certainly help Consolidated's engineers improve the performance and capability of later Dominator variants, should there be any, Kenny's lunch with Arnold in Florida had already ensured that the B-32 would undertake its most challenging evaluation, even before the service tests began. On March 27, Arnold disregarded the advice of several of his most senior advisors, many of whom argued that to put any further effort into the troubled aircraft would be a prodigious waste of time, money, and manpower, and authorized a Dominator combat test. Despite its reputation as the Army Air Force's problem child superbomber, the B-32 was going to war. A four-star general's direct and unequivocal order tends to have a galvanizing effect on subordinate officers, even those who may for whatever reason disagree with their commander's reasoning or intent. So it was that Arnold's desire that the B-32 undergo a comprehensive combat test was swiftly translated into action. Military personnel from several Army Air Forces agencies and civilian representatives from Consolidated were assembled into a 32-member test detachment led by Colonel Frank R. Cook of the Air Technical Service Command, ATSC. The highly experienced 35-year-old was a good choice to head up the combat test, which had been given the purposely obscure designation Special Project 98269S, but which was widely referred to as the Cook Project. During his time with ATSC, Cook had flown every bomber type in the Army Air Forces and was something of a proponent of the B-32, believing it to be both easier to fly and more docile on takeoff and landing than the B-29. He also judged the Dominator's locally controlled turrets to be a better defensive arrangement than the Super Fortress's remotely operated system. Cook believed that the combat test was the one way in which the B-32 could prove itself a worthy stablemate of the B-29, and he was anxious to get his men and aircraft to the Philippines for testing. That journey originated in Fort Worth. Cook and his assigned personnel 
gathered at Consolidated's Texas production facility on May 1 for processing and to pick up the three Dominators selected for the combat test. Aircraft 42-108529, 42-108531, and 42-108532. In addition to their serial numbers, two of the big bombers bore the sort of semi-risque nose art popular with aviators, apparently since the dawn of manned flight, a buxom blonde in a two-piece striped bathing suit, identified 529 as the lady is fresh, while 532 bore an equally well-endowed and similarly scantily clad young woman with a kerchief tied to a stick, and the name Hobo Queen too. A main gear collapse on landing after a pre-deployment test flight led to 531's replacement by 42-108528, a factory-based B-32 that had seen hard test use and that harbored chronic mechanical issues as a result. The first leg of the flight to the Philippines, a 1,400-mile hop across the desert southwest to Mather Army Airfield in Sacramento, California, began as scheduled on May 12, but only for the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen too. Mechanical problems kept 528 in Texas for two additional days, and when all three B-32s were preparing to leave Mather on May 16, further problems delayed 528 yet again. Nor did the troubled aircraft's performance improve as time went on. It was at least two days behind the other Dominators as they made their way to Luzon via Hawaii's Hickam Field, the recently lengthened Japanese-built runway on Kwajalein Atoll, and Harmon Field on Guam. Despite the challenges presented by the Trans-Pacific Ferry Flight, all three B-32s had gathered at Clark Field, some 40 miles northwest of Manila, by May 25. There they were met by a party of dignitaries that included Whitehead, who had replaced Kenny as 5th Air Force Commander, Colonel Merritt Burnside, the B-32 Project Officer for 5 Bomber Command, Lieutenant Colonel Salmon W. Wells, the 29-year-old leader of the 312th Bombardment Group, and Captain Ferdinand L. Sforé, commander of the 312th's 386th Bombardment Squadron. The 386th had been tapped as the parent unit for the three Dominators, and Sforé was to join Cook and Wells in the triumvirate that would lead B-32 operations during the combat test. That evaluation was to consist of 11 missions flown in varying weather conditions, with differing ordnance and against as wide a variety of targets as possible. The test was scheduled for completion by July 11, and its successful conclusion would trigger the 386th complete conversion to B-32s. Wells' other three squadrons, the 387th, 388th, and 389th, would ultimately follow suit, eventually making the 312th the first of three planned Dominator-equipped combat groups in the Pacific. Wells' unit seems at first glance to be a rather odd choice for conversion into a B-32 group. Activated in Kentucky in March 1942 with single-engine dive bombers, the 312th had received the twin-engine Douglas A-20 Havoc light bomber soon after arriving in New Guinea in December 1943. The nimble Havocs flew almost daily low-level parafrag and strafing missions against Japanese airfields, railroads, harbors, ships, troop concentrations, artillery positions, and targets of opportunity, and carried out similar missions after moving to the Philippines in the fall of 1944. It was a highly specialized form of attack aviation, and one whose skill set differed radically from that required for four-engine heavy bombers like the B-32. Yet the 312th selection as the likely first Dominator group was not as illogical as it first appears. Although the A-20 had done yeoman service supporting the hard-slogging Allied advance from Australia northward through New Guinea and into the Philippines, Army Air Force's planners foresaw a lessening need for relatively short-range light bombers as the air war against Japan moved into its final phase, the sustained strategic bombing of the home islands. Rather than have the B-32 combat test interrupt the ongoing operations of one of FIF's long-range B-24 groups, Arnold determined that it made operational sense instead to take an A-20 unit offline. 
He did, however, decree that in order to help speed the 386 transition to the larger aircraft, Sforé would additionally be provided with experienced Luzon-based B-24 pilots, for whom the conversion to the four-engine B-32 would presumably be smoother and less time-consuming. Nearby Liberator units would also be tasked to provide the other specialized crew members that the B-32s would need, and that the A-20-equipped 312th could not provide. Navigators, bombardiers, gunners, and electronic warfare officers to operate the Dominator's sophisticated radar and countermeasure systems. As it happened, the B-32's combat debut was to take place even before the 386th conversion had formally begun. The timeline for the B-32 combat test was nothing if not ambitious, and in order to stay on track for the program's scheduled July 1 completion, the Triumvirate of Cook, Wells, and Sforé scheduled the first mission for May 29, just days after the three Dominators had all finally assembled at Clark Field, and before their planned move to the 312's home base in Florida Blanca, 40 miles northwest of Manila. Because the trouble-plagued 528 was the only aircraft that had arrived in the Philippines with a complete 10-man combat crew, two B-24 crews, minus pilots and co-pilots, were dragooned from a Clark-based Liberator unit. The first mission was purposely planned to be a shakedown cruise for the Dominators, rather than the type of very long-range, high-altitude strike for which the aircraft had been designed. Each of the three B-32s was loaded with nine 1,000-pound general-purpose bombs, 3,000 gallons of fuel, and 13 men, 10 crew and three observers. The target, as briefed by the 386th intelligence officer, Captain William Barnes, was a Japanese supply depot at Antatet in Luzon's Cagayan Valley. Although the enemy position was not expected to be defended by anti-aircraft weapons, it would offer a different sort of challenge, Barnes said. It was within 2,000 yards of an area held by friendly Filipino guerrillas. The three Dominators were ready to go by 10.30 a.m. local time. But problems with the manifold pressure on two engines forced 528 to abort. The other two aircraft carried on as briefed, Hobo Queen II in the lead with Cook as pilot in command, and Wells along as an observer. After forming up above Clark Field, the B-32 set out on the 190-mile trip to the target, arriving over the Cagayan Valley some 45 minutes later. The bombers circled Antatet to positively identify the Japanese depot, then each made a run at 10,000 feet. With perfect visibility and absolutely no enemy anti-aircraft fire or interceptors to worry about, both B-32s were able to blanket the target and after taking post-strike bomb damage assessment photos, they returned to Clark Field without incident. The Dominator's introduction to combat had been essentially a milk run, but Cook and Wells knew that the remaining ten test missions might well be far more challenging, and there was a good chance that enemy action might begin to kill or injure B-32 crew members. Given that a pool of at least 12 full crews would be needed to meet immediate and projected operational demands and replace any casualties, converting aviators from the 386th Bomb Squadron and nearby B-24 units onto the B-32 was a distinct priority. Indeed, the importance of the conversion training was reiterated by Brigadier General Jared V. Crabb of Five Bomber Command, who in a June 1 memo to Wells underlined the importance of instructing flying and ground personnel on the operation and maintenance of the B-32 airplane. Given the need to expand the B-32 personnel pool as quickly as possible, Cook and Wells got the conversion training effort started almost immediately following the May 30 move of the three B-32s and their support personnel from Clark Field to the 312th's home field at Florida Blanca. Classes were established for each crew position, with Cook and the military and civilian members of his test detachment serving as instructors. Although men with less flight time or combat experience would require more in-depth training, for the higher-hour aviators, the conversion process could be amazingly brief. 
The experience of Tony Sforé, the 28-year-old 386 commander, was apparently typical. Originally commissioned as an infantry officer, Sforé had gone through flight school as a lieutenant, and by the time he first saw a Dominator, he was a veteran of some 88 combat missions in A-20s. His introduction to the B-32 consisted of reading the pilot's manual from cover to cover, taking a single introductory flight, and then shooting two landings as Cook looked on from the co-pilot seat. After the second landing, the test detachment chief officially designated Sforé as a qualified B-32 squadron commander and instructor pilot. The brevity of his training didn't particularly bother Sforé. He later remarked that after two and a half combat tours, he'd become a little calloused about flying. It's difficult to imagine how we did things in those days, he said. Our point of view was, if you can fly it, you can fly it. But the A-20 pilots tapped to convert from the diminutive and nimble Havoc to the massive four-engine B-32 faced other issues besides just mastering the differences in size, capability, performance, and tactical employment. Wells, Sforé, and the other 312th pilots would also have to adjust to being responsible for a significantly larger crew. In the Pacific Theater, the A-20s operated with only a pilot and a top turret gunner, whereas the B-32 carried between 10 and 13 men, depending on the nature of the mission. Nor were the pilots the only ones for whom the B-32's arrival would cause significant adjustments. Armorers, used to the not inconsiderable effort required to load 2,000 pounds of bombs onto an A-20, would have up to ten times that weight of explosives to deal with when bombing up the Dominator. Technicians accustomed to dealing with just two relatively straightforward radial engines would be responsible for maintaining four larger and far more complex turbo-supercharged power plants, and the B-32's electronic subsystems were far more technologically sophisticated than anything carried by the A-20. Even the 312th's intelligence officers would have to quickly refine existing skills. Long used to planning the sorts of low-level tactical interdiction and ground support strikes for which the A-20 was so well suited, the men of the 312th's intelligence shop would end up being sent to a nearby B-24 unit on Luzon to learn how to plan for high-altitude, long-range, heavy bomber missions. Important though they might have been, the issues that surfaced during the establishment and conduct of the conversion training were not allowed to hinder the conduct of the all-important combat test. The success or failure of the remaining ten missions would literally decide the Dominator's fate, and each would present its own challenges. Mission 2 Flown by Hobo Queen 2 and The Lady is Fresh, on June 12, 528 was unavailable because of a needed engine change. The second combat test mission originated from Florida Blanca and was intended to knock out a Japanese-held runway near Bosco on Bataan, an island in the South China Sea about halfway between Luzon and Formosa. The two Dominators lifted off at 9.30 that morning and headed northwest toward Luzon's Lingayen Gulf, then turned northeast and followed the coastline for about 140 miles. Once past the most northerly tip of Luzon, the B-32s began a steady climb as they set out over the open South China Sea, arriving over Bosco just after 11.30 at an altitude of 16,000 feet. The complete absence of enemy opposition allowed each aircraft to make two fairly leisurely single-ship runs over the target, dropping 20 500-pound bombs on each pass. The explosives rendered the runway completely unusable, and the B-32s returned to Florida Blanca the same way they'd come. After the bombers landed, ground crewmen discovered what they at first thought was a bullet hole in the vertical stabilizer of The Lady is Fresh. Closer examination showed the damage had been caused by a bomb fragment the B-32 had picked up on the previous day's training mission. The time needed to repair her wounded tail would prevent the Dominator from participating in the following day's strike. Mission 3 The third mission, flown on June 13, racked up two firsts for the Dominator combat test, 
It was the Big Bomber's initial visit to Formosa, and it marked 528's offensive debut. That trouble-prone aircraft was able to join Hobo Queen 2 for the raid on Koshun Airfield, a Japanese auxiliary strip located 480 miles due north of Florida Blanca on Formosa's extreme southwest coast. The field was a frequent target of strikes by FIF B-24s and B-25s and U.S. Navy carrier-based aircraft. For their strike, the two B-32s each carried 12 1,000-pound bombs. The Dominators were also hauling quite a few people when they took off at 8 a.m. local time. In addition to the usual 10 crew members, each bomber carried four conversion course trainees and an observer. In the event, the flight turned out to be a perfect sortie for both the crews and the crew members to be. There was no enemy opposition, and despite significant cloud cover, both B-32s made textbook single-ship runs over the already battered airfield, further cratering the taxiways and main runway. The entire six-and-a-half-hour round-trip flight was uneventful, except for the fact that 528 also seemed to have her usual band of gremlins aboard. Three of her 1,000-pounders refused to drop on the target and had to be coaxed out of the bomb bay over the South China Sea on the way back to Florida Blanca. Mission 4 One purpose of the Dominator combat test was, of course, to determine if the B-32 could accurately deliver, under actual field conditions, the full range of ordnance it had been deemed capable of carrying. Having already dropped 500 and 1,000 pounders, on the fourth combat mission, the participating aircraft, the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen II, were each loaded with eight 2,000-pound bombs. Again carrying trainees and an observer in addition to their normal crews, the aircraft took off from Florida Blanca at 8 a.m. on June 15, and three hours later unloaded their lethal cargoes on a sugar mill complex outside Taito, a town on Formosa's southeast coast. Each aircraft bombed individually through scattered cloud cover from 15,000 feet, with mixed results. This mission is primarily notable for being the first time that a B-32 came under enemy fire. The second aircraft to bomb was the target of some 20 rounds of poorly aimed ACAC, anti-aircraft fire, all of which burst at the Dominator's altitude, but significantly behind the aircraft. Both machines returned to Luzon unscathed. Mission 5 in what must have seemed like a minor miracle to the 386th Bomb Squadron's maintenance personnel, all three B-32s were able to take part in the fifth mission of the combat test. Although a good omen for the future of the Dominators, the strike flown on June 16 proved disastrous for the Japanese garrison and residents of Taito Town, who the day before had watched as the nearby sugar mill was largely reduced to rubble. The agent of that looming disaster was the 500-pound AN-M17A1 incendiary cluster bomb, 40 of which were loaded aboard each of the B-32s. The device consisted of 110 individual 4-pound M50 incendiaries, containing a mixture of thermite and magnesium, all bound together by thin metal straps and fitted with a rudimentary nose cone and tail fins. An adjustable time fuse set before the planes took off regulated the distance each cluster would fall before a strand of explosive cord would detonate, usually at about 5,000 feet above the intended target area, severing the straps and allowing the individual incendiaries to fall free. The cluster weapon could be devastating against urban areas built largely of wood, as the men aboard the Formosa-bound Dominators were about to demonstrate. Having taken off from Luzon at the usual 8 a.m., the Lady is Fresh, Hobo Queen 2, and 528 arrived over Taito Town at about 10.30. Flying in a loose arrowhead formation, the three B-32s dropped their ordnance from 19,000 feet through minimal cloud cover. The American aviators didn't have to wait long to see the effects of their attack. Within minutes, as the narrative mission report recorded, Taito was an inferno of smoke and flames, 
that completely enveloped the center of the town. An accommodating breeze spread the fires northward to cover the sections of town that the bombs had missed. Smoke was rising up to 4,000 feet by the time the planes left the target. Two hours later, the 43rd Bomb Group passed by Taito and reported that the fires were still burning intensely, and smoke was trailing 25 miles away. The Dominator's incendiary attack on the Formosa town closely resembled, albeit with slight differences and on a much smaller scale, the firebombing raids being conducted over Japan by Mariana's-based B-29s of the 20th Air Force's 21st Bomber Command, and the narrative mission report noted that the B-32 crews were enthusiastic over the results of this Taito version of the Tokyo treatment. Other than a few bursts of inaccurate ACAC, the attackers encountered no resistance, and all three Dominators returned safely to Florida Blanca. Mission 6 The first five missions of the Dominator combat test had allowed Cook, Wells, and the others involved in the program to evaluate fairly accurately the B-32's performance in several key areas, including bombing accuracy from both medium and high altitudes. The sixth test mission would address three important capabilities that had not yet been explored. The first was the Dominator's ability to undertake successful long-range, long-endurance combat missions. Though the two components sound similar and are, of course, interrelated, they differ in that range is a measure of how far the aircraft can fly, and endurance is a measure of how long the crew can continue to function effectively. Put another way, an aircraft's range is based on its mechanical reliability and fuel consumption. If well maintained and correctly operated, the machine should be capable of flying as far as it was designed to. However, if adverse conditions inside the aircraft, excessive noise or vibration, poorly configured systems, and so on, cause undue fatigue or stress for an otherwise healthy crew, the flight's duration can be significantly shorter than it should be. The second thus far unevaluated capability the sixth mission would address was the Dominator's suitability to operate offensively at night. The first five strikes had all been conducted in daylight, with navigation to and from the targets largely undertaken using visual references. Moreover, the bombing on those strikes had all been done solely with the Norden M9 optical bomb site, a device that, despite its technical sophistication, would be considerably less accurate at night unless operated in conjunction with the B-32's AN-APQ-13 radar bombing and navigation set. The latter system, which had not yet been used on an operational Dominator combat test sortie, would allow the B-32s to locate and attack targets at night. The third evaluation of the 6th combat mission was of the Dominator's capability for low-altitude bombing, or LAB, as it was inevitably referred to. The B-32s had proven their ability to bomb targets successfully from altitudes between 10,000 and 19,000 feet, but the ability to undertake low-level attacks against ships would add to the Dominator's potential value in the Pacific theater. The most efficient combat scenario in which to evaluate the B-32's capabilities in all three areas, planners decided, was a long-range night shipping interdiction mission. Hobo Queen 2 was tasked to fly the sortie, which would first take her and her crew northwest from Luzon toward the Leijo Peninsula, the southernmost part of China's Guangdong province, then southwest toward the port city of Haiko on Hainan Island then almost directly south toward the coast of French Indochina, before returning to Florida Blanca. The Japanese were known to use fleets of small merchant vessels, often escorted by warships, to move troops and materiel among the coastal ports of the eastern South China Sea and within the Gulf of Tonkin. Mission planners believed there was a better-than-even chance Hobo Queen II would find a target for the nine 500-pound bombs nestled in her bomb bay. Taking off from Florida Blanca just after 7 p.m. on June 18, the B-32 reached the assigned search area some four hours later. Hobo Queen 2 prowled the area at altitudes of 4,000 to 6,000 feet, 
But when her radar picked up no suitable waterborne targets, her crew elected to bomb Heiko. For reasons now lost to history, the bomb run, conducted just before 3 a.m. local time, was performed visually, rather than with the help of the ANAPQ-13, and at 8,500 feet. Bombs were seen to impact west of the town center, but owing to the darkness, no bomb damage assessment was possible. Hobo Queen 2 soon turned for home and was safely back in the Philippines almost exactly 12 hours after taking off. Although the sixth mission did not allow an evaluation of the B-32's low-altitude or radar bombing capabilities, it did show the Dominator to be mechanically capable of long-range operations and proved that during extended flights, the aircraft was not especially wearying for her crew. In addition, the mission demonstrated that the B-32's radio communication suite worked very well at long ranges and was apparently not susceptible to jamming by the Japanese. The last was a capability that would ultimately help put Dominators over Tokyo. Mission 7 On June 19, all three B-32s were sent against railway bridges spanning the Beinan River on Formosa the intention being to disrupt Japanese efforts to move men and equipment along the island's east coast. The attack would be part of a much larger Far East Air Forces effort that would also see seven squadrons of B-24s hitting the extensive port facilities at Kirun, three squadrons of B-25s attacking the railway marshalling yards at Shoka, and 36 P-38 Lightning fighters strafing and rocketing the bridge leading to the yards. For their part in the day's activities, the Dominators were loaded with 1,000-pound bombs, 12 on the Lady is Fresh and 9 each on Hobo Queen 2 and 528, with the fuses set for 0.01-second delay. An electrical problem kept 528 on the ground for 35 minutes after the other aircraft took off, but the three Dominators ultimately joined up and made the flight to Formosa in loose formation. The original mission briefing called for all three B-32s to strike first at the two southernmost bridges, at Payapai and Rokurio, and then hit the bridge at Ikegami if they had surplus ordnance. Soon after takeoff, however, the three aircraft commanders collectively decided to alter the plan. Hobo Queen 2 and the Lady is Fresh would bomb the Payapai span after which the latter aircraft would move on to hit the Rokurio Bridge. 528 would be solely responsible for the Ikegami structure. Though the decision to alter the briefed plan was presumably made to ensure that enough bombs hit each bridge, in the end the mission was not successful. Several of the 31,000-pound bombs dropped during the attack were reported as near hits, but all three bridges remained intact and usable when the B-32s headed for home. Mission 8. The day after the inconclusive strike against the Benan River Railroad bridges, the B-32s were assigned to hit a related target 130 miles to the northeast, the rail yards on Formosa's eastern coastal plain, just north of the port of Suo. All three Dominators were scheduled for the mission, but during the engine startup process, Hobo Queen 2 suffered a voltage surge that rendered the turbo superchargers on all four engines temporarily inoperable. Her crew had no choice but to abort the mission, leaving the Lady is Fresh and 528 to carry out the strike. The two Dominators, each carrying four 2,000-pound bombs, took off from Florida Blanca just after 7 a.m., then turned north to parallel Luzon's west coast before setting out across the 160-mile-wide strait separating the Philippines and Formosa. The weather was initially good, but began to deteriorate as the B-32s passed just east of the burned-out ruins of Taito, and by the time the aircraft reached the Suo area, the target was completely obscured by clouds. Choosing not to radar bomb the rail yards, the mission commander turned both aircraft south toward the secondary target, the same Payapai bridge the Dominators had failed to hit the day before. Weather was also closing in there, and just before the bombardier and the lead B-32 toggled his bombs from 10,000 feet, 
the bridge disappeared beneath heavy clouds. All four 2,000-pounders missed the bridge by considerable distances, the farthest by more than a half mile, and the pilot of the second Dominator elected to move on to another secondary target, a group of military warehouses near the center of the small town of Tamari, some 13 miles southwest of Taito. The sky over the target was clear, and all four of the B-32's bombs scored direct hits. Huge secondary explosions rocked the warehouse complex as the Dominators circled the area, taking post-strike photos. And by the time the bombers departed the area, a roiling cloud of thick black smoke had climbed 1,000 feet into the air. Undoubtedly feeling far better about the day's bombing than they had about the previous mission's results, the crews of the two B-32s headed south. The return flight was uneventful, and the aircraft landed at Florida Blanca, just before 3 p.m. Mission 9 After a day off, during which B-24 pilots transitioning into the B-32 took the Lady is Fresh aloft on a series of short training hops and the other two Dominators underwent needed maintenance, it was back to work on June 22. At the early morning briefing for the 9th Combat Test Mission, the regular crews of the Lady is Fresh and 528 Hobo Queen 2 was still grounded by supercharger issues, heard the somewhat disquieting news that the day's planned strike would likely be the most hazardous they'd yet flown. Located in the western Formosa town of Hato, the target was a sprawling sugar refinery that had been at least partially converted for the production of butanol, an alcohol-based solvent and potential synthetic additive to aviation gasoline. The hazard in attacking the plant came from a large anti-aircraft gun emplacement nearby, as well as from other widely dispersed weapons protecting an auxiliary military airfield and several barracks complexes. Each of these facilities had been previously attacked, most notably in a February 1945 raid by B-24s that had inadvertently killed or injured some 100 Allied prisoners of war forced by the Japanese to work in the refinery and surrounding sugarcane fields. In response to the earlier air raids, the anti-aircraft sites had recently been refurbished and at least one large-caliber gun was thought to be radar-directed. To negate that particular threat, the B-32s would drop rope, long streamers of thin aluminum foil intended to overwhelm the Japanese gun-laying radar with false returns. The Lady is Fresh would attack the main anti-aircraft site with 78 260-pound fragmentation bombs, after which 528 would hit the refinery complex itself with 40 500-pounders. The mission launched on time, and the Dominators arrived over the target to find Kavu, clear and visibility unlimited, conditions. The Lady is Fresh made her defense suppression run at 15,000 feet, dropping rope as she went in. The frags began impacting about 200 feet past the gun emplacement, more than close enough to be lethal, and then marched across the adjacent barracks complex. The second Dominator was close behind, and managed to unload 30 of her 500-pounders on the refinery before a shackle malfunction in her bomb bay prevented the last 10 weapons from dropping. As 528 turned off the target and salvoed the hung-up bombs, her crew saw several solid hits within the boundaries of the sugar plant. Within minutes, a plume of greasy black smoke had risen to an altitude of 5,000 feet. The attack was not entirely one-sided, however. The crews of both Dominators noted intense anti-aircraft fire being directed at them during their bombing runs. Because 528 did not use any sort of radar countermeasure, the rounds being aimed at her were, as the narrative mission report later dryly stated, correct as to altitude and course, with accurate tracking during the run, and several detonated close enough to bounce the aircraft around. The rope dropped by the Lady is Fresh, on the other hand, prevented the Japanese gun-laying radar from maintaining an accurate plot, and the few ACAC rounds that jostled her were essentially luck shots. Neither aircraft was damaged by the enemy fire, and both returned safely to Florida Blanca. Mission 10 
The penultimate Dominator combat test mission was flown by Hobo Queen 2 on the night of June 23, 24, and was in essence a replay of the inconclusive June 18 long-range night shipping interdiction strike. The general target area was the mouth of the Canton River between Macau and Hong Kong, ranging as far inland as Canton. It would be another long flight, covering some 1,500 miles and lasting upward of 11 hours. Hobo Queen 2 would be carrying nine 500-pound bombs, and the intention, as it was on June 18, was to attack enemy shipping from relatively low altitude using the radar bombing system. Unfortunately, the results of the 10th mission mirrored those of the 6th. Hobo Queen 2's radar only detected one vessel, and because it was outside the FIF-designated blind bombing zone, a measure instituted to prevent inadvertent attacks on ships of non-combatant nations entering or leaving Portuguese-owned and thus neutral Macau, it was not attacked. Tony Sforé, the pilot in command on the mission, decided to hit the alternate target, a Japanese airfield on the nearshore island of Sanchao, 16 miles southwest of Macau. Unlike the brilliantly lit up Portuguese colony, the entire Chinese mainland was completely blacked out, and in addition, the airfield was blanketed by fog. Neither situation proved a hindrance, however, for the target was acquired and bombed from 10,000 feet using the AN-APQ-13 radar. Hobo Queen 2 dropped rope as a precaution and was not fired on. After salvoing three hung-up bombs into the sea, Sforé turned the big bomber for home. Mission 11. The Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen 2 had the honor of flying the last scheduled Dominator combat test mission, an event the trouble-plagued 528 missed because of an engine problem. The strike would take the big bombers back to Formosa, this time to hit several railway bridges near the North Coast Harbor Complex at Kirun. The crews were briefed that there was a high probability they would be intercepted by Japanese fighters flying from several fields in the area, and that the harbor and the bridges were protected by radar-directed anti-aircraft guns of varying calibers. The ordnance load for the mission consisted of 1,000-pound bombs, a full load of 12 in the Lady is Fresh, and 9 in Hobo Queen 2. The two Dominators took off from Florida Blanca just after 8 a.m. on June 25 and followed the usual course northeast across the Luzon Strait until they sighted Formosa's southernmost tip. The aircraft gradually gained altitude as they followed the island's east coast northward, reaching the target area some three and a half hours after takeoff. Kirun was almost completely obscured by clouds, but Hobo Queen 2 was able to bomb visually through a small hole in the undercast. Not able to find a similar hole, the Lady is Fresh instead bombed the nearby town of Giron. Contrary to the warnings issued during the mission briefing, there was no enemy interference, and the two B-32s had an uneventful flight back to Luzon. The end of the 11-mission Dominator combat test, two weeks earlier than scheduled and with no personnel casualties or significant damage to the B-32s, triggered the writing of three separate summary reports. Though Project Commander Frank Cook's report to Brigadier General Crabb at Five Bomber Command pointed out dozens of must-fix items, Cook's overall opinion of the aircraft was generally favorable, and he made a point of emphasizing how much of an improvement the B-32 was over the B-24. Lieutenant Colonel Stephen D. McElroy was also cautiously positive about the Dominator in his report to Army Air Forces Headquarters, saying, the B-32 airplane, in its present condition, is suitable for combat operations in this theater, and once corrections were made to some of its subsystems, the aircraft would also be suitable for unrestricted combat operations elsewhere within Far East Air Force's area of responsibility. The third report on the results of the combat test, however, was anything but positive. In the evaluation that he forwarded to Proving Ground Command, Major Henry S. Britt, who had spent virtually all of his time on the crew of the trouble-plagued 528, stated that the Dominator, in its present condition, is not a suitable combat weapon to pursue the war with Japan. 
although Britt suggested dozens of key fixes that might over time make the aircraft a better bomber. The overarching tone of his report was negative, and not surprisingly, his dislike of the B-32 was palpable. The end of the official Dominator combat test did not, as Britt fervently hoped, result in the termination of B-32 flight operations. Indeed, follow-on combat missions were being planned and executed, even as he, Cook, and McElroy were writing their reports. A planned raid on Formosa's Hato alcohol plant on July 4 had to be canceled when both Hobo Queen 2 and 528 were grounded by mechanical glitches. But all three Dominators were able to participate in a July 6 strike aimed at a sugar refinery outside Takao Town, a port city on Formosa's southwest coast. The fact that the three B-32s were able to undertake the mission didn't guarantee its success, however. The Dominators carried a total of 33 1,000-pound bombs, but a radar targeting error made by Five Bomber Command's chief bombardier along on the raid as a distinguished guest, meant that he was able to hit Formosa with only six of the total bombs dropped. No damage was done. Nothing was accomplished. All 27 of the other bombs missed the sugar refinery and fell harmlessly in the ocean. And on July 13, the Lady is Fresh was recalled from a night shipping search mission because of unusually bad weather over much of the South China Sea. These less-than-impressive missions did not adversely affect the B-32's future in Far East Air Forces. Some three weeks earlier, on June 23, Wells had received Movement Order 369 from 5th Air Force Headquarters, directing him to begin preparations to move the 312th Group Headquarters element and the 386th and 387th Squadrons to Okinawa, recently secured by U.S. forces after three months of vicious combat against the defending Japanese. The assumption that both of the former A-20 squadrons were still intended to become full-fledged B-32 units was confirmed when on July 14, 5 Bomber Command directed the 386th to continue transition training for former A-20 and B-24 crewmen, and notified Cook and Wells that six additional B-32s would arrive from the United States during the remainder of July and in August. The members of Cook's test detachment were to remain in theater to help operate the existing aircraft and aid in the transition training. When enough trained crews were available for all nine Dominators, the 386th would be officially redesignated from a light to a very heavy bombardment squadron and would presumably join the aerial assault on the Japanese home islands. The decision to continue B-32 combat operations was far more the result of political maneuvering in Washington than it was of military necessity in the Pacific. The B-29 groups in the theater were already doing a fine job of reducing much of Japan to smoking rubble, and adding a squadron or two of dominators to the mix would not appreciably affect either the conduct or the outcome of the air war. Though Hap Arnold well understood this, he had other aspects of the issue to consider. The Army Air Force's commander had supported the Dominator's development, despite the program's history of delays and design deficiencies, and in defiance of the officially stated opinions of a considerable number of influential individuals, both within the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill. He was therefore understandably loath to discard the B-32. To do so would at best be a tacit admission of extremely poor judgment on his part, and at worst might be seen as flagrant waste of vital national resources. Though the Dominator's shortcomings were well documented even before the combat test, the fact that it had actually been able to bomb enemy targets allowed Arnold to justify the time, effort, and money that had been put into the big bomber. The formal decision to add the B-32 to the American Air Armada that was pummeling Japan in preparation for the planned invasion had therefore already been taken well before the three summary reports of the combat test arrived in Washington. The practical effect of that decision for the men of the 386th and 387th Squadrons was a further ratcheting up of the already busy transition training program. The late July arrival from the United States of a fourth Dominator, 42-108530, 
ferried over by a crew commanded by Captain Byron K. Betcher, helped ensure that Florida Blanca's runway was kept active with B-32s departing on or returning from crew familiarization flights and practice bombing missions. The continuing loadout of equipment and the progressive teardown of the 312th's bivouac area in preparation for the pending move to Okinawa also kept people busy, though Wells attempted to reduce the frantic pace by ordering occasional afternoon stand-downs so his men could play softball and volleyball and drink a few beers. On August 3 and 4, the ground echelons of the 386th and 387th squadrons and most of the group headquarters staff were transported by trucks to the sprawling port of Subic Bay, 20 miles southwest of Florida Blanca. On the afternoon of the 5th, the two 328-foot-long Navy landing ships that would carry the men and their belongings to Okinawa, LST-745 and LST-801, edged up onto the beach and dropped their bow ramps. Boarding began at 7 p.m. and was completed in a relatively quick 12 hours. The LSTs then moved back out into the bay, and just after daylight, they steamed into the South China Sea as part of an Okinawa-bound convoy. It is likely that many of the men embarked on the 1,000-mile, week-long voyage from Luzon to the Ryukyu Islands assumed the trip would not be a pleasant experience, given that the flat-bottomed, blunt-bowed LSTs were notoriously lively, even in calm seas. But it is equally likely that more than a few were looking forward to a few days of relaxation, the kind that would largely come from the apparently endless games of poker and craps that seemed to spring up in those times whenever American service members were confined aboard troop transports. As they lay in their cramped below-decks bunks, or stood on deck and gazed out at the passing sea, or found out-of-the-way places to sit quietly and write a few lines to loved ones, Many of the men on that passage to Okinawa were wondering just how much longer the war in the Pacific might last. The Nazis had surrendered in Europe three months earlier. Japanese forces had been rolled back virtually everywhere, and their nation was being mercilessly pounded from the air. Although most Americans in the Pacific theater fervently hoped that the men in power in Tokyo would see that all was truly and irrevocably lost, and that there was no point in continuing the fight, the fanatic tenacity with which the Japanese had thus far defended every foot of ground against the advancing Allied forces indicated that a swift conclusion to the conflict was highly unlikely. Indeed, the men of the two bomb squadrons had already been told that they would be supporting the coming invasion of the home islands, and some of the more pessimistic men in the unit were predicting that they might be home for Christmas in 1946. But then, on the morning of August 7, those aboard the LSTs heard the truly startling news that a single bomb, an atomic bomb, dropped from a B-29 the day before had obliterated the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Most of the GIs and their Navy hosts had no clue what atomic meant, but they all realized that the new weapon was a potential game-changer, something that could dramatically shorten the war. Men waited anxiously for news of a Japanese surrender, yet no such announcement came. The Soviet Union's August 8 declaration of war against Japan seemed to bode well, and when it was announced over the ship's loudspeakers late on August 9 that another atomic bomb had been dropped on Japan, this time on Nagasaki, the general consensus among the men on both ships was that a cessation of hostilities would be announced at any moment. But that long-awaited announcement was never made, and on August 12, the two LSTs dropped their ramps on an Okinawa beach. As the men of the 386th and 387th ground echelons came ashore, they were met by Captain Woodrow Hauser, the 386th communications officer and leader of the advance party, who directed them to board waiting trucks for the ride to their new home, the airfield at Yontan. Built by the Japanese 19th Air Sector Command in 1944 as part of a larger plan to turn Okinawa into a giant air base complex from which Navy aircraft, the vast majority of them kamikazes, would attack American naval units supporting the invasion, Yontan, known to the Japanese as Kita, and the nearby Kadena, Naka airfield, 
had been abandoned without a fight when the Japanese 32nd Army's 44th Independent Mixed Brigade withdrew from the area in April. By the time the ground echelons of the 386th and 387th arrived on August 13, Yontan's bivouac area remained a sea of mud, but the existing main 4,000-foot runway had been repaired, lengthened by 1,000 feet, and resurfaced by the U.S. Navy's 87th Construction Battalion. The Seabees had also constructed a 7,000-foot-long heavy bomber runway and were nearly finished building a second one, parallel to the first. The entire complex was in almost constant use by a variety of Army, Navy, and Marine Corps squadrons. Yontan was also already home to three of the 386th four B-32s, the Lady is Fresh, Hobo Queen II, and 528, and a C-47 transport carrying the squadron and group headquarters staffs, had arrived at Yontan shortly before the ground echelon personnel came ashore from the LSTs, though 42-108530 had remained at Florida Blanca for some minor modifications. Moreover, the Dominators were already being prepped for combat missions, despite the widespread hope among American military personnel that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki would lead to an immediate Japanese surrender, no such capitulation was forthcoming. Until Tokyo gave some official signal that it was prepared to agree to the unconditional surrender terms set out in the Allies' Potsdam Declaration, there would be no let-up in the Allied campaign against Japanese forces, wherever they were encountered. For the B-32 crews of the 386th Bomb Squadron, the practical result of Japan's failure to capitulate in a timely manner was, simply put, business as usual. On the morning of August 13, FIF headquarters directed that the Dominators continue routine operations against the enemy, but left it up to the 312th Group's intelligence and operations staff to decide what type of sorties would be flown and where. The decision was made that the Dominator's 14th combat mission, and the first from Okinawa, would be a single aircraft anti-shipping sweep of the East China Sea. On the night of August 13-14, 528 took off from Yontan with a load of nine 500-pound bombs, headed northwest toward Shanghai and China's wide Yangtze River Delta. The bomber proved to be uncharacteristically well-behaved for most of the mission, and her crew sighted and radar-bombed a small ocean-going vessel before turning for home. However, the B-32's gremlins woke up as she was on final approach to Yontan. The aircraft's right outboard engine caught fire, almost certainly because of either an oil leak or an exhaust stack problem, both of which had been continuing issues for all three of the combat test aircraft. Though the Dominator landed safely, the fire destroyed the engine nacelle and all its associated systems, and 528 was out of commission for several days. The second mission from Yontan was flown by the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen II, also on the night of August 13-14. The flight was to be a combined night fighter shipping search, with the primary objective being to locate, intercept, and destroy Japanese aircraft, believed to be ferrying senior military officers across the Korea Strait, the 120-mile stretch of ocean separating the Japanese island of Kyushu from the southeastern coast of Korea. Both B-32s were fitted with bomb bay fuel tanks, which restricted their bomb loads to nine 500-pounders each. The aircraft took off from Yontan an hour apart, and both set out directly to the north. As the first B-32 neared Fukushima, the southernmost of Japan's Goto Islands, it veered to the west and then cruised northward along the Korean coastline from Chejudo Island toward Pusan, but made no sightings. The other Dominator initially headed up the west coast of Japan's Tsushima Island, in the center of the Korea Strait then turned southwest and, just after dawn, located and bombed a 75-foot sloop about 10 miles due south of Yasu, Korea. No direct hits were scored out of nine bombs dropped, but several near misses caused the vessel's crew to abandon ship. 
Thirty minutes later and twelve miles to the northeast, the B-32 located a 150-foot-long, four-masted sailing ship, which the Dominator peppered with 4,000 rounds from its 50 caliber machine guns. Although the vessel remained afloat, it was in decidedly less seaworthy condition by the time the B-32 departed for the return flight to Okinawa. Both Dominators landed safely on the morning of the 14th. The results of the night's missions were not spectacular in terms of damage done to the Japanese Empire, but they did underscore the Dominator's ability to undertake long-distance, low-level sorties, minus, of course, the occasional engine fire. That capability was to be utilized in the next mission launched from Okinawa, a two-plane night reconnaissance sortie to southern Korea and western Honshu. Though the flight was primarily intended to monitor and, if possible, interdict Japanese aerial activity over the same part of the Korea Strait that had been the focus of the previous anti-shipping mission. Both the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen II were loaded with the usual number of 500-pound bombs in case they came across suitable maritime targets. The Dominators rolled down the Yontan runway just before sundown on August 15, then formed up and headed north at about 4,000 feet. Their crews settled in for the long transit flight to the patrol area, some of the men opening the simple box lunches provided for them, and pouring the first of what promised to be many cups of strong coffee from thermoses each man stashed near his position. But less than three hours into the flight, the radio operators aboard each plane received an identical and potentially monumentally important message from group headquarters back on Okinawa. The Japanese had accepted the Allied surrender terms, and a theater-wide ceasefire was now in effect. The B-32s were to terminate the mission and return to base. The news spread through both Dominators in a flash, and enlisted men and officers alike whooped and slapped each other in the back. The long, hard slog that began after Pearl Harbor finally seemed to be over and they had all made it through alive. But as the B-32s began the slow, graceful turns that would take them home, events were unfolding in Tokyo that promised to shatter the American flyers' dreams of peace. Chapter 3 Crisis in Tokyo Almost exactly twenty hours before the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen II received the recall message that terminated their mission and so elated their crews, His Imperial Majesty Hirohito stepped in front of a microphone set up in the Household Ministry Building on the night-shrouded grounds of his bomb-damaged Tokyo Palace. Speaking in Kanbun, the archaic classical Japanese of the Imperial Court, the 124th Emperor of Japan, his voice high-pitched and tremulous, read a most remarkable document as sound engineers recorded his words and court officials stood nearby, tears rolling down their cheeks. Known as the Imperial Rescript, the text was Hirohito's official response to the July 26 Potsdam Declaration, in which the United States, Great Britain, and China outlined their terms for the unconditional surrender of Japan's armed forces. Speaking in the majestic plural, the 44-year-old emperor addressed his people. To our good and loyal subjects, after pondering deeply the general trends of the world and the actual conditions obtaining in our empire today, we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation by resorting to an extraordinary measure. We have ordered our government to communicate to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration. The emperor went on for another three and a half minutes. Although he never used the word surrender and the overall tone, especially in Hirohito's obfuscation of his own role in initially supporting the war, was more than a little disingenuous and self-serving. His pronouncement was no less historic. Here was a Japanese emperor acceding to the wishes of foreign governments and telling his people, albeit indirectly, 
that their nation had lost the war, and that he and they could pave the way for a grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. And yet Hirohito's people would not hear his historic address for another twelve hours. The imperial rescript was being recorded for delayed broadcast and would not go on the air until after the government of Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki had officially notified the Allies of Tokyo's conditional acceptance of the Potsdam ultimatum and had in turn been assured that the notification had been received. There had thus far been no response to the cables sent to the Allied capitals via Japan's embassies in neutral nations. So the Emperor had more than enough time to read two additional takes of the rescript to correct slight errors and lower the pitch of his voice. Those recordings completed, Hirohito walked stiffly from the room. Minutes later, just after midnight on the sultry, windless, and very early morning of August 15, he climbed into the car that had earlier brought him across the palace grounds and was driven back to his private quarters. The diminutive monarch's recorded rescript would soon announce to his subjects, however obliquely, that the nation had been totally defeated and would suffer prolonged occupation by foreign troops for the first time in its history. Yet he was at peace with his decision that the war had to end. A figurehead emperor throughout the conflict, Hirohito had routinely rubber-stamped the decisions made by the six-member Supreme Council for the direction of the war. But over the preceding months, he had come to believe that the only way to preserve Japan as a sovereign nation, and of course to protect the hereditary monarchy, was to end the war as quickly as possible. He had initially agreed with those of his advisers, who advocated a negotiated peace with the Allies. But the atomic bombings of Hiroshima on August 6 and Nagasaki three days later had convinced him that immediate surrender even if it meant acceding to the onerous conditions set forth in the Potsdam Declaration, was the only way to save his nation and its people from the prompt and utter destruction the Allies threatened to visit on Japan should the nation continue to resist. Indeed, so certain was Hirohito of the immediate need to terminate the war that four days before recording the rescript for broadcast, he had taken an uncharacteristically bold step he'd actually agreed to impose his will upon the fractious Supreme Council. That body's members were Prime Minister Suzuki, Foreign Minister Shigenori Togo, Army and War Minister General Korechika Anami, Navy Minister Admiral Mitsumasa Yonai, Chief of the Army General Staff General Yoshijiro Umezu, and Chief of the Naval General Staff Admiral Soemu Toyoda. Referred to collectively as the Big Six, the men were equally divided when it came to the idea of surrender. The Doves, Suzuki, Togo, and Yonai, all believed fervently that immediate capitulation was the only way to prevent more atomic bombings and ensure the continuation of Japan's monarchy. The Hawks, Anami, Umezu, and Toyoda, were fiercely adamant that the nation could and should fight on tenaciously, inflicting such grievous casualties on the Allied forces expected to invade the home islands, that Washington and London would agree to negotiate an end to the war on terms more favorable to Japan. The terms the Hawks hoped to force the Allies to accept included Japan's right to disarm herself, Japanese control of any war crimes trials, and absolutely no Allied occupation of the home islands. On the afternoon of Thursday, August 9, the division of opinion between Doves and Hawks had caused the Supreme Council to adjourn an emergency meeting without deciding on how to respond to the Potsdam Declaration. Suzuki then took the question to his full cabinet, because several members of that larger body shared the hawkish point of view. The outcome of the meeting was predictably inconclusive. No decision about the question of surrender had been reached by the time the cabinet meeting ended, about two hours before midnight. 
Tradition demanded that the Japanese government, in this case the members of the Big Six and the Cabinet, had to agree unanimously on a policy before seeking the Emperor's formal permission to enact that policy. So the impasse essentially guaranteed that Japan would be incapable of responding to the Allied demands. That lack of response, in turn, could very well bring the Potsdam Declaration's threat of prompt and utter destruction into horrendous reality. In a last-ditch effort to avert catastrophe, Suzuki and Togo agreed on a bold and unprecedented plan. They would ask Hirohito to step down from the lofty heights of total impartiality to which tradition and Japan's constitution relegated him and intervene personally to break the deadlock between doves and hawks. They would, in short, call upon the emperor to personally decree that the immediate acceptance of the Allied terms set forth in the Potsdam Declaration was his divine will and the only way to save the nation. Though as a constitutional monarch he actually had no such power to dictate policy, the traditional and mystic reverence for the person of the emperor, believed by his people to be the direct lineal descendant of Amaterasu, the sun goddess of Shintoism, ensured that his deadlocked government would hear and obey his will, or so Suzuki and Togo hoped. The two men had put their plan in motion by summoning the chief cabinet secretary, Isatsune Sakomizu, and asking him to convince Admiral Toyoda and General Umezu to put their names to a petition that would allow Suzuki to convene a meeting of the Big Six in the Emperor's presence. The military chiefs of staff were to be told that the measure was simply a way to ensure that such a meeting could be called quickly, if made necessary by fast-changing events. The two senior commanders accepted that explanation and signed the petition. Suzuki and Togo then hurried to the palace for an audience with Hirohito, during which they explained the deadlock in the council and their point of view that any further delay in accepting the terms set forth in the Potsdam Declaration would be catastrophic for the nation. The emperor heard them out and agreed with their logic, and then directed them to convene the Big Six immediately. A few minutes before midnight on August 9, the emperor, the members of the Supreme Council, and several staff assistants and court officials had gathered in the cramped and humid imperial bomb shelter. Suzuki read out the Potsdam demands in their entirety, explained the nature of the impasse within the Big Six and the corresponding disagreement within the larger cabinet, and then gave various men in the room the opportunity to voice their opinions. Finally, at just after 2 a.m. on August 10, Hirohito rose and in a low but steady voice expressed his opinion that there was no reason to prolong a war that was so obviously already lost. He reflected on the suffering of his people and the devastation visited on his empire, then ended his remarks by saying he sanctioned Foreign Minister Togo's proposal to accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration as presented, with the sole condition being that the national polity, Japan's sovereignty as vested in the position and influence of the emperor, not be diminished in any way. When Hirohito finished speaking, Suzuki quickly adjourned the meeting, for there was much left to do. The emperor's pronouncement had apparently quelled the dissent within the Big Six, but the only government entity with the constitutional authority to ratify the surrender was the cabinet. All of the Supreme Council members therefore immediately left the bomb shelter for the Prime Minister's official residence, where the follow-on cabinet meeting was to be held. By four in the morning, that body had hammered out the wording of the conditional surrender message to be sent to the Allies via the Japanese embassies in Sweden and Switzerland, and upon transmission of those cables, Hirohito had finally taken to his bed, believing that his intervention had eliminated discord within his government and would result in a swift and orderly transition from war to peace. Unfortunately, he was wrong on both accounts. Despite the defeats it had endured, 
and enormous losses in men and material it had suffered thus far in the war. In August 1945, the Japanese army arguably remained the single strongest and most structurally coherent organization in the country. The army was also permeated by the principles of Bushido, the ancient way of the samurai, that during the first decades of the 20th century had been cynically distorted by Japanese militarists into a virulently nationalistic code that demanded unquestioning loyalty from soldiers of all ranks and emphasized that surrender to one's enemies was so dishonorable that suicide, both personal and national, was vastly preferable. Although the Japanese Navy was also steeped in the traditions of Bushido, it was the army that styled itself the protector of both the monarchy and the nation's sacred honor. As a result, the service's members had repeatedly shown an almost cavalier willingness to take the law into their own hands, when they believed that mere politicians were acting against the interests of the military, the emperor, or the nation. In February 1936, for example, some 1,200 members of the Army's Tokyo-based 1st Guards Division, one of three similar formations that on a rotating basis undertook the protection of the Emperor, his family, and the Imperial Palace, had risen against the government because they objected to a proposed transfer of their unit to Manchuria. Before the three-day revolt was crushed by loyal units, the rebels had assassinated Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, Makoto Saito, Finance Minister Korekio Takahashi, and several senior officers, and had badly wounded the Emperor's Grand Chamberlain. Nine years later, that Grand Chamberlain, now Prime Minister Suzuki, was only too aware that in seeking to break the deadlock between doves and hawks and the Big Six and Cabinet, he and Togo were quite probably putting their lives on the line. And he was right. News of the Emperor's intervention during the August 9-10 meeting and of the government's subsequent decision to conditionally accept the demands set forth in the Potsdam Declaration had spread like wildfire through the senior levels of the army, emanating from no less a source than Army and War Minister Anami. Scant hours after Hirohito retired to his bed in the early morning hours of August 10, the squat general had called senior war ministry staffers together to tell them of the night's developments. Anami's announcement was met with stunned disbelief that quickly turned to outrage as the gathered officers realized the full import of his words. Most believed to the depth of their souls that surrender would not only mean the utter disgrace and degradation of the nation, they knew without a shred of doubt that it would also result in the complete and ignominious dissolution of the army. As a chorus of angry voices swelled around him, Anami firmly reminded his listeners that they were all soldiers and that they must not deviate from strict military discipline. In the crisis facing Japan, he told them, one man's uncontrolled actions could bring ruin upon the entire nation. When a younger officer stood up, and directly asked Anami if he himself supported the surrender. The general slammed his swagger stick onto the top of a table and stonily replied that anyone who chose to disobey his orders would have to do so over his dead body. Anami's exhortation notwithstanding, he himself had grave reservations about the decision to surrender. Several of the officers in the crowded room knew of their commander's doubts. One of them, Lieutenant Colonel Masao Inaba, decided in his capacity as Anami's speechwriter to draft a statement on the general's behalf that urged overseas army units to continue combat operations against Allied forces until the proposed surrender actually occurred. The finished statement was read and approved by several senior officers, though not by Anami. He had left for the Foreign Ministry building to help draft an official but purposely vague cabinet statement to be broadcast to the Japanese people that afternoon, announcing, essentially, that momentous news regarding the conduct of the war would soon be forthcoming. Before Anami returned to his office, 
and before he had the opportunity to read his statement, the text was picked up by Lieutenant Colonel Masahiko Takeshita, a staff officer who also happened to be Anami's brother-in-law. Takeshita conveyed the message to the same central Tokyo radio station that was scheduled to broadcast the cabinet statement. When Hiroshi Shimomura, the director of the government's official information bureau, heard about the unexpected army proclamation bearing Anami's name, he immediately telephoned the general, who said he knew nothing of it, but added that he was under increasing pressure from rest of junior officers to disavow the decision to surrender. Fearing that Anami would be assassinated if the proclamation were not broadcast, Shimomura directed that it be read in conjunction with the cabinet statement. So it was that when those Japanese who still had working radios tuned into the regular afternoon news broadcast on August 10, they heard two wildly conflicting communiques. The first, issued in Anami's name, and titled Instructions to the Troops, stated in part, We have but one choice. We must fight on until we win the sacred war to preserve our national polity. We must fight on, even if we have to chew grass and eat earth and live in the fields. For in our death there is a chance for our country's survival. The hero Kusunoki, a fourteenth-century samurai, pledged to live and die seven times in order to save Japan from disaster. We can do no less. The far less stirring cabinet statement simply announced that the Allies had attacked Japan with a new type of weapon, and concluded, rather too optimistically, that our fighting forces will no doubt be able to repulse the enemy's attack, but we must recognize that we are facing a situation that is as bad as it can be. The government will do all it can to defend the homeland and preserve the honor of the country, but it expects that Japan's 100 million will also rise to the occasion overcoming whatever obstacles may lie in the path of the preservation of our national polity. Rigorous censorship had prevented the vast majority of the Japanese people from learning just how badly the war had been going, and many were understandably confused by the apparently contradictory statements beamed into their homes and shops that afternoon. That confusion spread ever further throughout the nation the following day, when Japan's major newspapers printed the texts of both communiques. Confusion was not an issue for many mid-level staff officers in the War Ministry and other key units in Tokyo, however. On the morning of August 11, some 15 men gathered secretly in the bomb shelter beneath the ministry building to discuss ways they might negate the government's dishonorable peace overtures to the Allies and ensure that the war continued, at least to a point that would allow Japan to secure a negotiated settlement. The conspirators included Takeshita, Anami's brother-in-law, Inaba, the writer of the instructions to the troops that was broadcast the night before in the war minister's name, and a particularly fanatical army major named Kenji Hatanaka. The men who filed into the stuffy and quickly smoke-filled shelter did not intend to depose Hirohito. On the contrary, they were devoted to the emperor and his essential role in the national polity, believed that he had been misguided and tricked by Suzuki and other doves within the government, and felt that in protecting Hirohito, even against his will if it became absolutely necessary, they were acting in the best interests of the monarchy, the nation, and their own sacred honor. The conspirators' repeated references to sacred honor did not keep them from agreeing to undertake some distinctly dishonorable actions in the emperor's name. In order for their plot to succeed, they decided several people would have to die, and quickly. Suzuki, Togo, and Marquis Koichi Kido, the current Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal and a key supporter of the Doves, were to be assassinated at the earliest opportunity. Other key senior officers, including Lieutenant General Takeshi Mori, commander of the 1st Imperial Guards Division, and General Shizuichi Tanaka, whose 12th Area Army 
also referred to as the Eastern District Army, controlled the greater Tokyo region, would be offered the opportunity to join the rebellion, but were to be killed if they refused. Takeshita told the plotters that he was certain he could win Anami's support for the coup, assuring them that the war minister secretly shared their beliefs and would agree wholeheartedly with their aims. Having decided on the substance of their action, the plotters turned to its timing. The coup had to be carried out before Japan received the Allied response to its surrender offer, they agreed, so as to prevent the defeatist Suzuki government from having the opportunity to disgrace the nation by accepting whatever counteroffer the Allies might make. With this last detail seen to, the conspirators dispersed. The coup plan hatched in the War Ministry bomb shelter had barely been put into motion when news of a response to Japan's conditional acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration terms arrived in Tokyo, though not via official channels. At 45 minutes after midnight, on the very early morning of August 12, a radio monitoring station outside Tokyo picked up an Associated Press news flash broadcast by a shortwave station in San Francisco, carrying the full text of the Allied answer to Japan's offer to accept the Potsdam terms. The reply, drafted by American Secretary of State James F. Burns, was immediately transmitted to the Foreign Office, where it landed like a third atomic bomb. Rather than accept the Japanese condition that nothing in the surrender agreement should prejudice the prerogatives of His Majesty as a sovereign ruler. The Allies replied emphatically that from the moment of surrender, the authority of the Emperor and the Japanese government to rule the state shall be subject to the supreme commander of the Allied powers, who will take such steps as he deems proper to effectuate the surrender terms. In a single concise sentence, the Allied response effectively destroyed Japanese hopes of preserving the national polity. The Emperor, the hereditary God-sovereign of the nation, and his ministers, were to be stripped of their power and influence, and reduced to mere subordinates of some as yet unidentified Allied military officer. This was a crushing blow. But worse was to come with regard to the tradition that Japan's sovereignty stemmed solely from the hereditary emperor. The ultimate form of government of Japan shall, in accordance with the Potsdam Declaration, be established by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. Heaping insult upon already grievous injury, as the foreign ministry staffers read it, the Allies were declaring that not only would the Emperor lose the mantle of mystical, sacred, and inviolable sovereignty that had for centuries surrounded his chrysanthemum throne, his subjects were actually to be given the right to decide for themselves what form their government should take. The Allied response was shocking to those in the Foreign Ministry and among the members of the Emperor's inner circle. Once the news had reached the palace, but it was within the Japanese military that the pronouncement ignited the hottest flames of rage. Many senior commanders had harbored hopes of a negotiated settlement that would somehow allow Japan itself to decide where and when the nation's armed forces would lay down their arms, a settlement that would also prevent any foreign occupation of the home islands. Yet the Allied diktat clearly stated that the Emperor shall issue his commands to all the Japanese military, naval, and air authorities, and to all the forces under their control, wherever located, to cease active operations and to surrender their arms. And further, that the armed forces of the Allied powers will remain in Japan until the purposes set forth in the Potsdam Declaration are achieved. As might be expected, these last two components of the Allied reply prompted an immediate reaction from the Army and Navy Chiefs of Staff. At 8.20 on the morning of Sunday, August 12, General Umezu and Admiral Toyota, almost certainly in response to the frenzied pleadings of their firebrand subordinates, and without requesting authorization from Anami and Yonai, their respective superiors, 
made an unscheduled joint appearance at the Imperial Palace and requested an immediate audience with Hirohito. Once closeted with the Emperor and his chief military aide, General Shigeru Hasunuma, the two men made lengthy presentations in which they declared the Allied reply to be absolutely unacceptable. The men argued that Japan should continue the fight no matter the consequences, both to preserve the honor of the nation's military forces and to win better terms from the Allies. Hirohito listened attentively, then informed the two senior officers that he could make no decision on their presentation because he could not act based upon the intercepted news flash from San Francisco. He had to await the formal text of the Allied reply, which would be forthcoming from Secretary of State Burns through normal diplomatic channels. Hirohito's statement was more than a little disingenuous. Despite the unexpectedly uncompromising tone of the Allies' response to Japan's surrender overture, the Emperor remained determined to bring the war to an end as soon as possible. He repeated this determination to Togo during a scheduled 2 p.m. audience and found that his foreign minister was in total agreement that the Allied terms had to be accepted, though they foreshadowed fundamental and irrevocable changes within the highest levels of Japan's ruling civilian and military elites. It was now up to Togo to sell the military's senior leaders, and more important, the full cabinet, on the absolute necessity of issuing an immediate, positive response to the Allies. That would prove to be a Herculean task, however. The tenor and content of the Allied reply had reopened the vast chasm between the hawks and the doves within both the Big Six and the Cabinet, despite the Emperor's August 10 sanctioning of an immediate end to hostilities. Moreover, even as Togo was leaving for the Prime Minister's home to attend the special afternoon cabinet meeting at which he would repeat Hirohito's edict and ask for unanimous agreement to accept the Allied terms, the officers bent on a coup d'etat were attempting to pull the still reluctant War Minister Anami into their cabal. Seven of the conspirators hurried into the general's office after his return from the palace, and as he was preparing to leave for the cabinet meeting. With Takeshita acting as spokesman, they begged him to join their rebellion. Buckling on his sword, Anami told Takeshita to call on him at home that evening, then rushed out to his waiting staff car for the short ride to Suzuki's residence. The cabinet meeting began promptly at 3 p.m., but that was perhaps the only thing that went according to Togo's plan. Suzuki read a translation of the Allied reply to Japan's conditional surrender offer, stressing more than once that it was the unofficial version taken from the intercepted radio broadcast. Then Togo rose. After admitting that the Allied terms were not perfect, especially in the restrictions they placed on the emperor's powers and his place in Japanese society, Togo argued eloquently and at some length that they must nevertheless be accepted, and quickly, to ensure the nation's very survival. Hardly had Togo retaken his seat when Anami stood and launched into the by now familiar litany of reasons why acceptance of the Allied terms would be the greatest and most catastrophic error in Japanese history. The national polity would be destroyed, the military would be humiliated, and the homeland would be desecrated for eternity through its occupation by foreign troops. To Togo's consternation, the war minister's reasoning seemed to resonate with many of the cabinet members, and even Suzuki himself seemed swayed by Anami's words. Realizing that any immediate vote might well go against him, Togo announced that because the official version of the Allied message had not yet arrived through diplomatic channels, the cabinet should postpone any further discussion and any final decision until after the communique had been received and authenticated. Somewhat to his surprise, the majority of those in attendance agreed, and Suzuki adjourned the fractious session nearly four hours after it began. 
worn out by the long and contentious meeting. Togo shuffled into an anteroom of the Prime Minister's residence and telephoned his deputy, Shunichi Matsumoto, to report on the gathering. When the foreign minister expressed his fear that the untimely arrival of the official Allied response that night might prompt an emergency cabinet session, that could well result in a vote to continue the war. Matsumoto suggested a simple yet elegant solution. He would direct the staff of the Foreign Ministry's communications office to hold any official message arriving from Secretary Burns for the remainder of that Sunday until the following morning. The time and date stamp indicating when the Allied cable arrived would thus read Monday, August 13. If nothing else, the administrative ruse would give Togo additional time to muster his forces and, conceivably, again enlist the Emperor's aid in bringing about Japan's immediate surrender. Matsumoto had put his plan into action just in time. Burns's official cable arrived at the Foreign Ministry at 6.40 that Sunday evening and was immediately stamped as having been received at 7.30 Monday morning. Concealing the cable's arrival from virtually everyone in the government did prevent the emergency cabinet meeting that Togo feared would result in a vote to continue the war. However, it did not keep the anti-surrender factions from working to advance their own agenda. Late on the night of August 12, two key members of the coup plot, Lt. Col. Masataka Ida and the fanatic Major Hatanaka, called on War Minister Anami at his family home in the Tokyo suburb of Mitaka. They passionately repeated all the reasons why they believed acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration terms would mean the complete and utter destruction of Japan and its centuries-old institutions, then pleaded with Anami to do all he could to prevent the Suzuki government from caving in to Togo and the peace faction. Although the war minister himself favored rejection of the Burns ultimatum once the official version of it arrived, he was hesitant to throw in his lot with the conspirators, without first determining which other senior officers were willing to support a coup. Because any revolt would fail completely without the army's support, the first man Anami had to quiz regarding his position on surrender was General Umezu. Steeped as he was in his nation's cultural and societal traditions, the war minister sought to confirm the chief of staff's views indirectly. Before dawn on the morning of August 13, Anami therefore dispatched his military secretary, Colonel Saburo Hayashi, to Umezu's home, bearing a verbal message. The war minister, Hayashi was to say, was considering asking Field Marshal Shunroku Hata, commander of the Hiroshima-based Second General Army, to make a personal appeal to Hirohito that the Emperor reject the Allied terms and continue the fight. Whether Anami was aware that Hata was in fact in favor of ending the war quickly is unclear, and it may not have been important anyway, for telling Umezu about the proposed overture to Hata was simply a covert test. If the chief of staff supported the idea, then Anami would know he could most probably be trusted to lend the army support to the coup. The gruff chief of staff had made it very clear during meetings of the Big Six in Cabinet that he also believed that Japan should fight on. So Anami was fairly certain his response would be a positive one from the conspirators' point of view. It was, therefore, a huge shock when Hayashi returned to Anami's home just after sunrise with Umezu's answer. Though the Army Chief of Staff found the Allied surrender terms to be repugnant, he had sorrowfully, and apparently rather suddenly, come to the conclusion that continuing the war was pointless. Given that the Americans seemed entirely willing to keep dropping atomic bombs on Japan's major cities, and one had to assume, he pointed out, that Tokyo was quite likely next on the target list, attempting to continue the war would most probably only result in millions more dead Japanese and the conversion of the home islands into a continuous landscape of radioactive rubble. Umezu's stunning response was undoubtedly on Anami's mind when he climbed into his staff car just hours later 
at around seven on Monday morning. A meeting of the Big Six had been set for 9 a.m., and before attending it, the War Minister wanted to converse privately with Lord Privy Seal Kido, a key supporter of the Emperor's decision to accept the surrender terms. Indeed, so widely known were Kido's pro-peace views that he'd been receiving death threats from diehard military officers. And for his own protection, he had moved from his suburban home into the Imperial Household Building on the palace grounds. Anami had known the Emperor's counselor for nearly two decades, and although the two men were not close friends, the War Minister was apparently convinced that he could win Kido over to his point of view through a forceful but respectful recitation of the calamities that would befall the nation, should Hirohito insist on accepting the Allied surrender terms. Yet when Anami was finished with his presentation, during which he assured his honored friend that Japan's military forces would absolutely refuse to lay down their arms and would gladly die fighting alongside the entire civilian population in a final decisive battle against the invaders. Kido remained unmoved. The emperor, he pointed out, did not himself object to the harsh realities of the Allied terms and had already announced his acceptance of them to the members of his government and to the Allies. If Hirohito were to suddenly change his mind and call for continued war, he would look like a liar and a fool. And more important, the Allies would almost certainly employ their terrible new bombs in attacks throughout the home islands. The Japanese people would hold the Emperor personally responsible for the resulting devastation, Kido said, and would likely turn on him and the entire imperial system. Was that an outcome the war minister really wanted? It wasn't, of course. And as he rose to leave, Anami said, almost as though he were pursuing the continuation of the war only as a way to appease the diehards in his own organization, you don't know what it's like in the ministry. Whatever Anami's true feelings might have been about continuing the war, he walked into the 9 a.m. Big Six meeting in the Prime Minister's bomb shelter, still advocating rejection of the Burns ultimatum. Admiral Toyota, the Navy Chief of Staff, continued to support the War Minister's point of view. And, strangely, so did the Army's General Umezu, despite his earlier declaration to Hayashi that he privately supported acceptance of the Allied terms. His public solidarity with the Hawks might well have been simply an expression of service solidarity, or personal loyalty to Anami, or perhaps of mere self-preservation, but the practical effect of Umezu's stance was that the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War remained deadlocked. Moreover, when he and Toyota were called out of the meeting so that Hirohito could personally ask them not to order any offensive military action that might prompt an overwhelming Allied response, Umezu responded by saying that both services would refrain from provocative, offensive moves, but that they would also be authorized to defend themselves if fired upon. Just days later, Umezu's almost offhand statement would have dire consequences for members of the 386th Bomb Squadron. The Big Six adjourned their meeting in the early afternoon of August 13 then reconvened as part of a full cabinet meeting that began at 4 p.m. Three hours of argument and counter-argument did not break the previously existing logjam regarding the Allied surrender ultimatum. When Suzuki asked the ministers for their positions, three remained opposed, twelve favored immediate acceptance, and one was still undecided. The Prime Minister then announced that the continuing lack of unanimity left him no choice but to ask Hirohito for a second imperial decision. As the ministers filed out of the bomb shelter, Anami took Suzuki aside and asked him to wait two days before seeking the Emperor's intervention. The Prime Minister refused, saying, Our opportunity is now. We must seize it at once. After Anami walked away, an army medical officer named Kobayashi, who had heard the exchange, 
approached Suzuki and asked why it was impossible to wait just a few more days before responding to the Allies. The Prime Minister looked at the doctor and, as though speaking to a slow-witted child, said, If we don't act now, the Russians will penetrate not only Manchuria and Korea, but northern Japan as well. If that happens, our country is finished. We must act now, while our chief adversary is still the United States. General Anami will kill himself, Kobayashi responded. Suzuki nodded gravely, looked the physician in the eye, and said, Yes, that will be very regrettable. The man of whom they were speaking was not quite ready to fall on his ceremonial sword, however. After the deadlocked cabinet meeting, Anami returned to his official residence, where at 8 p.m. a group of ten young army officers arrived to secure his authorization for the coup they planned to launch the following morning. Among the men seeking Anami's blessing was the firebrand Hatanaka, who told the war minister that the peace factions in the Big Six and Cabinet had decided to kill Anami if he continued to resist the Emperor's decision to accept the Allied surrender terms. The young officer's ploy to gain the war minister's approval of the coup was apparently fairly transparent, for Anami simply laughed. He then went on to say that the plan the conspirators had presented, which involved the imprisonment and possible execution of Suzuki, Kido, Togo, and others, as well as the proclamation of martial law throughout the country, was not detailed enough. Despite their pleas that he give them a yes or no answer immediately, Anami sent the plotters away with the promise to consider their plan further and give them his decision soon. The remainder of the night passed quickly for the war minister, who quite probably spent the hours until dawn contemplating what a coup, whether successful or not, would mean for the nation and for himself. Just after sunrise on August 14, Anami breakfasted with Western District Army Commander Field Marshal Hata, who had driven straight from Hiroshima and gave the war minister a no-holds-barred account of conditions in the first city to feel the horrifying effects of a nuclear explosion. What impact the aging soldier's account had on Anami we do not know, though the historical record does show that just before the two men parted, the war minister asked Hata to share his insights about the effect of the atomic bombing with the emperor. With the field marshal's unflinching report almost certainly still on his mind, Anami stepped into his staff car just after 7 a.m. for the drive to his war ministry office. At roughly the same time, Lord Privy Seal Kido was walking into a hastily arranged meeting with Hirohito. The purpose of the audience was to inform the Emperor that since late the previous day, American B-29 bombers had been dropping leaflets across the country. Leaflets that told the Japanese people not only about the surrender terms put forth in the Potsdam Declaration, but also about the imperial government's August 10 conditional acceptance of those terms. The American tactic was profoundly dangerous for both Japan and its emperor, Kido told his sovereign because it could very well spark widespread public revolt and would likely set off the military coup d'etat that most senior government officials feared. Soon after Suzuki arrived to join the discussion, Hirohito declared that he would order all members of the Big Six and the Cabinet to attend an emergency imperial conference at which he, as Emperor and titular Commander-in-Chief of the nation's armed forces, would instruct the attendees to accept the terms set forth in Secretary Burns's cable. Moreover, Hirohito said, he would command them to draft an imperial rescript that would be broadcast to the nation. And finally, the Emperor directed that the imperial conference be convened at 10.30 that very morning, so as to give any coup plotters within the military less time to put their plans into action. Immediately upon hearing of the emergency conference, Anami urged the emperor 
to first receive a delegation of senior military officers, a group that would include the war minister himself, Field Marshal Sugiyama, the Navy's Fleet Admiral Osami Nagano, and Field Marshal Hata. Anami apparently assumed that the latter officer, much decorated and widely respected, would argue in favor of continuing the war despite the Americans' use of the new bomb. The war minister must therefore have been deeply surprised when the elderly Hata, with tears rolling down his cheeks, described in gruesome detail the destruction and suffering in Hiroshima. The field marshal then peered closely at each man in the room and pronounced what was effectively the death knell for the hawk's hopes of prolonging the war. Speaking in his capacity as commander of the Japanese forces slated to defend Kyushu in the event of an Allied invasion, he said he did not believe such an assault could be stopped, and therefore agreed with the Emperor's decision to accept the terms set forth in the Burns Cable. Having thereby dropped his own bombshell, the field marshal set to await Hirohito's response. After a moment's reflection, the Emperor quietly said that there was no way Japan could halt either the oncoming Soviet forces or the Americans' further use of their new bomb, and he therefore asked the gathered senior officers to support him in his quest to end the war immediately. Having issued what was tantamount to an imperial command, Hirohito rose and slowly walked from the room, pausing only for a moment to mutter that he would see them all shortly in the bomb shelter. When Hirohito entered that chamber, the same one in which the fateful August 10 Imperial Conference had been held, some twenty men stood and bowed in silent deference. The room was very warm and more than a little humid, and those in attendance, the Big Six, cabinet members, palace officials, and the Emperor himself, were soon bathed in sweat. Dressed in a simple military uniform, Hirohito sat down behind a small desk at the head of the room and nodded to Suzuki to begin what all those present knew was to be a momentous meeting that would quite literally change the course of Japanese history. The aged Prime Minister rose to his feet and carefully recounted yet again the terms outlined in Secretary of State Burns's official response to Japan's conditional surrender offer. Suzuki then called upon Anami, Umezu, and Toyoda to recite their by now all too familiar list of reasons why the Burns note was unacceptable. The three military men spoke passionately, though one suspects that by this time both Anami and Umezu were simply going through the motions for appearance's sake. When the chamber was once again quiet, the eyes of all present turned toward Hirohito. As tears welled in his eyes, the Emperor said, I have listened carefully to all the arguments opposing Japan's acceptance of the Allied reply as it stands. My own opinion, however, has not changed. I shall now restate it. I have examined the conditions prevailing in Japan and in the rest of the world, and I believe that a continuation of the war offers nothing but continued destruction. I have studied the terms of the Allied reply, and I have come to the conclusion that they represent a virtually complete acknowledgment of our position, as we outlined it in the note dispatched a few days ago. In short, I consider the reply to be acceptable. Pausing briefly to take a deep, shuddering breath, and to draw a handkerchief across his eyes, Hirohito assured his listeners that he believed the Burns Cable was evidence of the Allies' good intentions to maintain the national structure, referring, if rather obliquely, to the continuation of the monarchy. The Emperor then looked pointedly at Anami and Toyoda, and added that he fully understood how difficult it would be for the officers and men of the nation's armed forces to be disarmed, and to see their beloved country occupied. After expressing his own deep sorrow for the hardships and suffering his subjects had experienced, Hirohito concluded, As the people of Japan are unaware of the present situation, 
I know they will be deeply shocked when they hear of our decision. If it is thought appropriate that I explain the matter to them personally, I am willing to go before the microphone. I am willing to go wherever necessary to explain our decision. I desire the cabinet to prepare as soon as possible an imperial rescript announcing the termination of the war. Once again, having clearly expressed his imperial will, Hirohito rose and walked slowly out of the room, with tears streaming down his cheeks. Many of those to whom he had spoken then broke down completely, sobbing for their emperor, their nation, and because many were almost certain to be charged with war crimes by the Allied occupiers, quite probably for themselves. Then, despite their deep emotion, they got on with the work Hirohito had charged them to do. The cabinet members convened almost immediately after their sovereign left the bomb shelter. They drafted and then ratified the nation's unconditional acceptance of all the terms set forth in the Burns Cable, and ordered the response to be transmitted immediately to Washington via Japan's embassies in Sweden and Switzerland. Within hours, the Emperor would be in the Household Ministry building, recording the Imperial Rescript message. But even before he stepped before the microphone, the coup d'etat he and so many others feared was already underway. From the time of their first clandestine meeting in the War Ministry bomb shelter on August 11, the coup plotters had worked diligently, if covertly, to lay the groundwork for the revolt they fervently believed would save both the nation and the armed forces. Takeshita, Hatanaka, and the rest had begun reaching out to fellow officers, both in Tokyo and at key army and navy installations throughout the country, attempting to determine which men could be counted on to support them and which might have to be neutralized. They had also extended feelers to certain members of the Kempeitai, the nation's dreaded military-run secret police. When the revolt began, the plotters reasoned, Japan's equivalent of Nazi Germany's Gestapo would be needed to help secure the Imperial Palace and the Tokyo headquarters of NHK, the National Radio Broadcast Service. And once the coup had succeeded, Kempeitai agents would arrest those whom the revolt's leaders designated as defeatists. The plotters had decided to launch the coup at 10 a.m. on August 14. But War Minister Anami's continued evasions about whether he would join the revolt forced a postponement. Takeshita tried to intercept Anami before the day's imperial conference in order to ascertain the grizzled general's position once and for all. But he arrived minutes after his brother-in-law had walked down into the imperial bomb shelter. When Anami finally reappeared, Takeshita could tell from the look on his face that a momentous decision had been made. Pulling the war minister aside, the younger man begged for him to order the mobilization of troops to maintain security within the city, a very thinly veiled plea that Anami support the coup. Then, repeating a rumor that was circulating within the war ministry, Takeshita said that Army Chief of Staff Umezu had thrown in his lot with the plotters. The statement, which was untrue, did not sway Anami. The Emperor has made his decision, the War Minister said wearily. There is nothing I can do. As a Japanese soldier, I must obey my Emperor. Takeshita finally had the definitive answer he had been seeking, though it was not the one for which he had been hoping. Knowing from the look on Anami's face that his mind was made up and his decision would not change, the younger officer turned and walked slowly back to his waiting staff car. Before he headed back to the war ministry to share the news with his fellow conspirators, Takeshita sat for several minutes, pondering what he now knew to be a simple truth. Without his brother-in-law's active support, the coup was doomed to certain failure. What, then, he wondered, was the point in going ahead with it? As Takeshita sat thinking, Anami was himself already on the way back to the ministry building. 
Just after 3 p.m., he walked into his outer office to find a dozen subordinates waiting none too patiently, desperate to know the outcome of the Imperial Conference. Keenly aware that the young officers wanted to hear that the nation would fight on and that the enemy would never be allowed to set foot on Japan's sacred soil, the war minister took a deep breath and then broke their hearts. The emperor, he said, was firm in his desire to end the war and would announce Japan's acceptance of the Allied surrender terms to all his subjects in an imperial rescript to be broadcast the following day. So there would be no misunderstanding about his own position. Anami then further stunned the gathered officers by saying that he, like all other Japanese soldiers, was honor-bound to accept that decision and bend to the imperial will. With a final glance around the suddenly silent room, the war minister turned, walked into his office, and firmly closed the door. Though Anami had intended that his pronouncement would dampen the fires of revolt among his subordinates, it had exactly the opposite effect on Major Hatanaka and several of the other men standing in the now deathly silent room. Already furious that the morning launch of the planned coup had been postponed, they knew that the revolt would have to be put in motion before the broadcast of the Imperial Rescript, if there was to be any hope of success. After a quick hallway conference, the men split up and rushed from the building. Not of high enough rank to merit a staff car, Hatanaka jumped on his bicycle and tore off through the rubble-clogged streets of Tokyo. He made first for the headquarters of the Eastern District Army, where, somewhat to his surprise, General Tanaka refused to join any revolt. Hatanaka then pedaled as quickly as he could through the oppressive summer heat to the Imperial Guards Division command post. Two of the unit's officers, Majors Sadakichi Ishihara and Hidemasa Koga, were members of the conspiracy, and Hatanaka likely communicated to them the importance of quickly seizing control of the Imperial Palace and either preventing the recording of the rescript, or failing that, keeping the completed recording from being broadcast. Late that same afternoon, trucks bearing a battalion of troops from the 1st Guards Division 2nd Regiment rumbled through the gates of the Imperial Palace. This was unusual in that the sprawling compound was normally guarded by a single battalion, and one was already on duty. Moreover, the new arrivals were personally led by the regimental commander, Colonel Toyojiro Haga. After returning to the war ministry, Hatanaka huddled briefly with co-conspirator Lieutenant Colonel Jiro Shizaki, then sought out Lieutenant Colonel Masataka Ida of the ministry's military affairs section. Like several officers who had been present when Anami had earlier announced his support for Hirohito's decision to surrender, Ita had decided to kill himself, and Hatanaka found him calmly preparing to commit seppuku. Believing that Ida's position would allow him to issue orders that would support the coup, the firebrand major argued that a successful revolt would protect the emperor from the traitors that surrounded him, and also prevent Japan's surrender, thereby preserving both the national polity and the army. Assisting in the coup, Hatanaka argued, was therefore a far more glorious path than Ida's plan to preserve his own personal honor through suicide. The young major's logic was at least partially convincing, for though Ida did not agree outright to lend his support to the coup, he said he would postpone his suicide and await further developments. He didn't have to wait long. Some three hours later, at about 10 p.m., Hatanaka returned to Ida's ministry office, accompanied by Shizaki. The two younger officers excitedly told Ida that the coup now had the support of key officers in the Imperial Guards Division. All that was needed to ensure the revolt's success was for the division commander, General Mori, to join the plot. Hatanaka said that he and Shizaki were on their way to enlist the general's support and asked Ida to accompany them. His planned suicide now on hold, 
The older officer agreed, and the three set off for the guard's division headquarters. Upon their arrival, the men were joined by Ishihara and Koga, and all five conspirators dashed up several flights of stairs to Mori's office. To their extreme exasperation, the general's aide told the officers to take a seat in the waiting room. Mori was closeted in his office with a Lieutenant Colonel Shiraishi, his brother-in-law, and a member of Field Marshal Hata's staff, and would not be available for some time. Hatanaka and the others were thus forced to cool their heels, not knowing that less than a quarter of a mile away, the technicians from NHK had just finished setting up their recording equipment and were awaiting the Emperor's arrival. More than ninety minutes ticked by before an increasingly anxious Hatanaka finally stood up and burst into Mori's office, with Ida and Shizaki close behind. Startled, the general demanded to know what the men wanted. As the young major stuttered out their request that Mori lead his division against Suzuki and the other traitors, anger and disbelief flashed across the general's face. But then, possibly because he realized that his life and that of his brother-in-law might depend on how he reacted over the next few minutes, Mori became quite calm and agreed to listen to the conspirators' reasoning. At that point, believing that the division commander was leaning toward cooperation, Hatanaka excused himself, telling Ida he had an important engagement. It was just after midnight as the young major dashed from the room. Ida and Shizaki stayed with Mori for another hour, finally leaving when the general said he would have to pay a brief visit to the nearby Meiji Shrine before giving them his final answer. Hatanaka, in the meantime, had made his way to the home of Masahiko Takeshita, pounding on the door until Anami's brother-in-law ushered him inside. As the young major began recounting the evening's events, Takeshita stopped him with a raised hand and calmly said he had decided not to take part in the coup. When the stunned Hatanaka asked him the reason for this apparently sudden change of heart, Takeshita replied that Anami was not with them, and without the war minister's support, the revolt had absolutely no chance of success, so there was no point in even attempting it. Crestfallen, Hatanaka paced the floor, muttering to himself, before finally turning to Takeshita and agreeing that the coup was most probably doomed to failure. But then, straightening up, he looked squarely at the older officer and said that he and his fellow conspirators had gained the support of the Imperial Guards Division and would carry on with the revolt despite the odds. Hatanaka bowed slightly, then walked out into the night. By the time the young major made his way back to Mori's office, it was nearly 2 a.m. on August 15, and though Hatanaka didn't know it, Hirohito had long since concluded the recording of the Imperial Rescript. The commander of the Imperial Guards Division had not yet left to visit the shrine, and when Hatanaka and Koga pressed him for a decision about lending his division support to the coup, Mori responded that he could not and would not act in defiance of the Emperor's expressed will. As the general was speaking, Captain Shigetaro Uehara an army aviation officer and coup conspirator, rushed into the office, past Shizaki, pushed Ida and Koga aside as he approached Hatanaka, and asked if the matter was settled. When the young major replied that it was not, Uehara looked pointedly at Mori, and speaking to Hatanaka, said that time was running out. The guard's division commander though almost certainly aware that the atmosphere in his small office had suddenly changed for the worse, looked directly at Uehara and shouted that he would not support the coup, no matter how long the conspirators might plead with him to do so. Without warning, Uehara drew his sword and rushed toward Mori. When the general's brother-in-law stepped forward to protect him, Uehara plunged his razor-sharp blade into Shiraishi's chest, then yanked it free, 
reversed his hold, and with a powerful sideways blow, nearly severed the man's head from his body. Uehara then pivoted toward Mori, but before he could strike the fatal blow, Hatanaka pulled his eight-millimeter Nambu automatic pistol from its holster and shot the general squarely in the chest. Mori staggered sideways and collapsed atop Shiraishi's body, and Uehara brought his blade down into the back of the general's skull in an almost certainly unnecessary coup de grace. With the problem of General Mori definitively settled in the most brutal way, Hatanaka and Uehara saluted the bodies and walked calmly out of the blood-spattered office. The two officers dispatched Ida to the Eastern District Army Headquarters to convince its commander, General Shizuichi Tanaka, to support the coup. That done, they conferred with Ishihara and Koga, who had falsified an operations order directing the entire guards division to secure the grounds of the Imperial Palace and the areas immediately surrounding it. The order bore Mori's signature block, and after the others had set off for the palace, Ishihara and Koga stamped the document with the general's official seal and began distributing it to the division's field commanders. Within forty-five minutes, the entire imperial closure and all its residents, including Hirohito, his family, and the majority of the defeatist traitors the coup's conspirators so loathed, were completely cut off from the outside world. Yet one very powerful man, at that point potentially the most powerful man in Japan, was both free and at peace. After participating in the drafting of the Imperial Rescript at Suzuki's office, War Minister Anami had spoken briefly with the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Togo, assuring both men that his stubborn opposition to the nation's acceptance of the Allied surrender conditions stemmed solely from his desire to protect the Emperor and the nation from dishonor and shame. Anami had then returned to his official residence, taken a bath, and retired to his bedroom with several bottles of sake. Just after 1 a.m., his brother-in-law arrived at the house and found Anami preparing to commit seppuku. That the general was about to kill himself did not surprise Takeshita. Indeed, anyone who knew Anami well was aware that he was a Japanese of the old school, a man who believed with every fiber of his being that the only way in which he could atone for his part in Japan's defeat, and quite likely for his opposition to the will of his emperor, was by taking his own life in the traditional samurai way. Takeshita realized that his brother-in-law was completely at peace with his decision, and rather than attempt to dissuade him, the younger man decided to share the war minister's last hours. Takeshita therefore seated himself on a tatami mat next to Anami, and the two men settled down companionably to drink away the war minister's last night on earth. On the grounds of the palace, things were certainly neither as calm nor as companionable as they were at General Anami's home. Troops of the guards division had occupied the sprawling imperial compound and closed all of the gates leading into it, Acting in accordance with the falsified orders produced by Ishihara and Koga, soldiers had begun systematically searching the various buildings for the recordings of Hirohito's rescript. The hunt was led by Hatanaka, Uehara, and Shizaki, who had arrived at the palace just minutes after the murder of General Mori and his brother-in-law. The conspirators were determined to find and destroy the recordings to prevent their broadcast thereby also preventing Japan's surrender, and they knew that they were running out of time. Their assassination of the Guards Division commander would inevitably come to light sooner rather than later, and when it did, the falsified orders would be immediately rescinded by officers loyal to the government. If Ida were unable to convince General Tanaka of the Eastern District Army to join the conspiracy, the revolt would have little chance of success. In point of fact, 
though Hatanaka and his fellow plotters didn't know it yet. Two significant failures had already doomed their coup. First, although Guards Division troops had detained Information Bureau Director Shimomura, the NHK technicians, and various other officials who had been present for Hirohito's reading of the rescript, the vinyl recordings themselves had not been found, despite an exhaustive search. Because the radio technicians had clearly understood how valuable the discs were, and that the anti-surrender faction would likely kill anyone possessing them in order to prevent their broadcast, the men gave the recordings to a palace chamberlain for safekeeping, rather than attempting to take them directly to the NHK studio. The man had then hidden the discs in the back of a tiny concealed cupboard in the household ministry building, itself a rabbit warren of small offices packed with innumerable file cabinets, and they had remained undiscovered. Second, and more important, Lieutenant Colonel Ida had failed miserably in his attempt to enlist General Tanaka's help with carrying out the coup. Indeed, upon being told what was happening, the Eastern District Army commander ordered the by now thoroughly dispirited Ida to return to the Imperial Palace and attempt to talk Hatanaka out of continuing his treasonous actions. Tanaka then directed that all regimental commanders within the Imperial Guards Division come immediately to Eastern District Army Headquarters, but they were told that their earlier orders to quarantine the palace complex were false, and that all of their troops on the palace grounds should immediately withdraw. Any that failed to do so, he said, would be treated as traitors and would be fired on. The attempted coup unraveled quickly following Tanaka's refusal to throw in his lot with the conspirators. Faced with the Eastern District Army's overwhelming force, and finally convinced that they'd been misled by forged orders, the commanders of the Guards Division units that had taken control of the palace complex and other key facilities throughout Tokyo withdrew, without having found the recordings and without having captured Prime Minister Suzuki or any other leading members of the peace faction. Tanaka himself faced down the key leaders of the conspiracy, Hatanaka, Koga, Shizaki, and Uehara, on one of the bridges leading into the palace complex, and in no uncertain terms told them they had betrayed their emperor and their nation, and had brought shame upon the armed forces. Tanaka also made it very clear that there was only one way in which the traitors could atone for their actions. Suicide. All four ultimately complied, using either pistol or sword, thereby joining in death the far more august and arguably less guilty General Anami, who disemboweled himself at his home just after dawn on August 15. Hirohito and his family had remained safe throughout the attempted coup, and according to some sources, were completely unaware of the revolt until after it had ended. At noon local time on August 15, the Emperor's recorded rescript was broadcast throughout Japan, shocking the vast majority of the Emperor's subjects, both with its indirect announcement of defeat and its even more frightening implication of impending foreign occupation. Thousands, indeed perhaps tens of thousands of Japanese, reacted to the devastating news by killing themselves. Within Japan's armed forces, the broadcast of the rescript elicited decidedly mixed reactions. Though the vast majority of officers and enlisted members of the Navy and Army throughout Japan and across Asia and the Pacific swallowed their shame and bent themselves to their emperor's will, there were diehards in both services who fervently vowed to keep fighting. Some of these dissenters believed that the sentiments the emperor had voiced in his broadcast had been coerced, and the surrender decision was thus invalid. So, therefore, were the subsequent orders issued by both Army Chief of Staff General Umesu and his Navy counterpart, Admiral Yonai, 
that all Japanese military forces immediately cease offensive action and prepare to lay down their arms. These disbelievers further argued, as had Kenji Hatanaka and his fellow conspirators, that the nation should fight on tenaciously in the emperor's name and inflict such grievous losses on the Allied invaders that they would agree to a negotiated settlement. But there was also another category of military men who had decided that their war was not quite over. Although they had heard and believed the emperor's broadcast, these men had also determined that until the surrender had become a reality, no one could be sure that the Americans would refrain from dropping more of their horrible new bombs. The men therefore determined, like the die-hard fanatics, but for significantly different reasons, that they would do all in their power to defend the sacred soil of Japan vigorously, right up to the moment of the nation's official capitulation. Unfortunately for the B-32 crews of the 386th Bomb Squadron, both categories of Japan's holdouts, the die-hard fanatics and the determined defenders, were well represented within the one group of Japanese military personnel that could actually transform martial zeal into potentially devastating practice long before Allied ground forces set foot on the home islands. The fighter pilots who defended the nation's airspace. Chapter 4 Ceasefire or Not When Captain Yasuna Kozuno leapt behind the wheel of his staff car just after noon on August 14, he was a man in a fever, both literally and figuratively. The decorated naval aviator, known as the father of Japanese night fighters for his pioneering efforts in that nocturnal form of aerial combat, was in the first febrile stages of a relapse of the malaria he'd first suffered while stationed at Rabaul some two years before. But it wasn't just the disease that made him sweat and tremble as he gunned the car out of the Navy Ministry parking lot in Tokyo and headed out of the city along rubble-strewn streets. Kozuno had just hours before been told of Emperor Hirohito's decision to accept the Allied surrender terms, and his face was crimson with the heat of shame. For a man like Kozuno, the idea of surrender was quite simply unthinkable. He was a career officer who lived and breathed the Bushido values and the traditions of the Japanese Navy. He had participated in the arc of his nation's military operations, from the early victories in China, Southeast Asia, and the East Indies, to the seemingly endless defeats that began with the 1942 battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. He had watched as his beloved navy had been steadily reduced from a magnificent and mighty fleet to little more than a coastal defense force. Its few remaining warships unable to sortie from harbor without being ruthlessly hunted down by the overwhelmingly powerful enemy that even now was preparing to land on the sacred shores of the home islands. Yet despite the reversals, the defeats, and the retreats, Kozono had never lost faith in his service, his nation, or his emperor. He had fought on regardless of the odds, and now, firmly convinced that Hirohito had somehow been coerced or misled by his weak-willed and traitorous advisers, Kozono was entirely prepared to keep fighting, to die gloriously in the defense of his nation, and to kill as many of the enemy as possible in the process. And unlike many other officers in Japan's armed forces, the veteran 43-year-old aviator still had enough men and materiel to turn his dreams of honorable and glorious resistance into something approaching reality. From early 1944 onward, the primary responsibility for the air defense of the seven prefectures that make up the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, traditionally referred to as the Kanto Plain, rested with the Japanese Army Air Force's 10th Air Division, officially part of General Shizuichi Tanaka's Eastern District Army. 
At the time of its formation, the organization fielded between 350 and 400 aircraft, primarily single-engine day fighters, supplemented by twin-engine night fighters, though the latter were not generally equipped with radar and thus had to rely on both their own and ground-based searchlights to locate their prey. The 10th Air Division's aircraft were organized in three lines of defense, all over land and all oriented toward the southeast. The first line was anchored in the north, on Choshi, then ran parallel to the coastline for some 70 miles south through Katsura to Shirahama on the Boso Peninsula. The second covered the area from Kisarazu to Chiba, and the third was the city of Tokyo itself. Operating from seven main and some 25 secondary airfields, the defending pilots initially relied on such tactics as random airborne patrolling of given sectors, or occasionally the blanket coverage of a particular zone by all available interceptors. Although these methods took their toll on raiding Allied aircraft, both bombers and following the arrival off Japan of U.S. Navy surface task forces, carrier-based fighters, and attack machines, the Army squadrons were losing men and aircraft faster than they could be replaced. By the time the 10th Air Division gained operational independence in March 1945 under the command of Lieutenant General Kanetoshi Kondo, the number of airworthy interceptors had shrunk to fewer than 100. In order to preserve his remaining aircraft, while still being able to respond to Allied attacks, Kondo introduced such innovations as cancelling the requirement to provide near-constant patrolling over such strategic facilities as harbors and factories, and instead ordered his fighters to concentrate on hitting targets of opportunity. The 10th Air Division commander also sought to improve the number and quality of his early warning radars, and also set about providing his anti-aircraft units with newer, larger caliber, and longer-range guns. These innovations helped improve the performance of Kondo's division against Allied aircraft attacking targets in the Kanto plain. But the sheer number of those enemy machines, coupled with the increasing number of poorly trained and inexperienced army pilots arriving to replace dead or wounded veterans, ensured that the tenth's assets continued to dwindle. Indeed, barely 60 interceptors were flyable, by the time Kondo's organization was subsumed into General Masakazu Kawabe's Air General Army on April 15, 1945. Given the battering being inflicted on the Army fighter units attempting to defend the Kanto Plain, it was fortunate that the Navy provided air defense help, albeit only grudgingly, and in a remarkably uncoordinated and startlingly haphazard way. Though both the Army and Navy were steeped in the Bushido traditions and staunchly supported the imperial system, their relationship had long been riven by the same sort of inter-service rivalries and jealousies that remain all too common in 21st century militaries. So parochial had each organization become that they separately pursued the development of aircraft, tactics, and such vital systems as airborne search and early warning radars. Although a formal agreement signed by both services in 1943 vaguely stated that defending the homeland was a joint obligation, it stipulated that the Navy would be responsible for the air defense of naval bases and installations and the areas immediately adjacent to them, whereas the Army would defend the national airspace as a whole. Even after the home islands began coming under regular Allied air attack from November 1944 onward, the two services failed to integrate their real-time air defense efforts in any meaningful way, agreeing only that Navy aircraft based to the south and east of Tokyo would be responsible for engaging enemy aircraft headed toward the Kanto Plain before they penetrated the Army's first defensive perimeter. Each service organized and used its own radar and observer-based alert systems, and the only form of communication between the two regarding their respective air defense plans and operations was a decidedly inefficient system of liaison officers who used telephones.
and even couriers on motorcycles to relay information that was often hopelessly out of date by the time it reached its intended recipient. The Navy built its Kanto plane air defense efforts around three air stations. Kizarazu, on the east shore of Tokyo Bay, in Chiba Prefecture. Opama, adjacent to the sprawling Yokosuka Naval Base on the southwest shore of the bay in Kanagawa Prefecture. And Atsugi, some 15 miles west of the bay, and also in Kanagawa. Each airfield was home to both operational squadrons and specialized support or training organizations. And while each was defended by its own Navy manned anti aircraft guns, by August of 1945, all three had been heavily battered by Allied air attacks. Moreover, as part of Ketsugo, decisive operation, Japan's belatedly formulated plan to defend key areas of the home islands against an almost certain Allied amphibious invasion. From April 15 on, the Navy's remaining frontline squadrons had been told to conserve fuel, ammunition, and pilots for the last great struggle. This meant, in effect, that the three bases would normally only launch interceptors when enemy aircraft were directly overhead or actually threatened the bases themselves. Yasuna Kozuno was well aware of the restrictions placed on the Navy, both by its lack of coordination with the Army and by senior commanders seeking to husband the nation's remaining military forces for the final battle. Yet he was also in a unique position to disregard those restrictions and do what he deemed necessary to prevent Japan's humiliation. For the veteran aviator was far more than a mere staff officer. He commanded what until just months before had been one of the most potent military organizations in Japan, the Navy's 302nd Kokutai Air Group at Atsugi. Kozuno's wild, malaria-hazed ride on the afternoon of August 14 had but one purpose to force his beloved emperor to restart the war. Sighted about 23 miles southwest of Tokyo and 11 miles due west of Yokohama, Atsugi Naval Air Station had originally been constructed in 1938, but following the 300 seconds arrival in March of 1944, had been expanded into the Navy's largest and most elaborately protected airdrome. The field was ringed by anti-aircraft guns, and its most vital facilities, command centers, fuel and ammunition storage areas, workshops, barracks, and hangars, were underground. Aircraft on air defense alert status were housed in sophisticated hardened shelters adjacent to the runways. The 300 Second was operationally assigned to the Yokosuka Naval District and was one of three similar units organized specifically for homeland air defense operations, the others being the 332nd in the Kure Naval District and the 352nd in the Sasebo Naval District. At the time the 302nd arrived at Atsugi, the unit's aircraft were among the best the Navy could muster at that point in the war comprising some 24 advanced Mitsubishi J-2M series land-based Raiden single-engine fighters, known to the Allies by the code name Jack, 20 older but still highly capable Mitsubishi A6M Zero Sen Zeke carrier fighters, and 13 Nakajima J-1N1S Gecko Irving, 12 Yokosuka P-1Y1S Ginga Francis, and seven Yokosuka D-4Y-2S Suisei Judy night fighters. These latter three types had originally been developed for other purposes. The Irving and Francis as land-based twin-engine light bombers, and the Judy as a single-engine carrier-based dive bomber. But earlier in his career, Kozano had demonstrated that they could be converted into competent bomber killers by fitting them with Type 99 20mm cannon installed to fire obliquely from a gun bay behind the cockpit. 
The Irving was fitted with four guns, two firing at a 30-degree angle upward, and the other two at the same angle downward, whereas the Francis carried only the two upward canted weapons, and the Judy just one. This armament configuration allowed the searchlight and later radar-equipped night fighters to eviscerate American B-24s and B-29s, often before their crews were even aware they were under attack. Cosano and his aviators put their aircraft to good use in the months following the 300 seconds operational debut. By one authoritative estimate, knocking down some 300 enemy aircraft by early August of 1945. But it was far from a one-sided battle. Increasingly frequent attacks on Atsugi by U.S. Navy carrier planes and by Iwo Jima-based U.S. Army Air Force's P-47 Thunderbolt and P-51 Mustang fighters and B-24s from Okinawa took a heavy toll of the 300 seconds men and machines. By the time Kozano arrived at Atsugi at 2 p.m. on August 14, after his mad dash from Tokyo, his entire unit consisted of only ten flyable jacks, four Zeeks, and two or three of the night fighters. The paucity of aircraft available for an attack against the approaching enemy didn't seem to overly concern Kozano, for soon after roaring through Atsugi's front gate, he gathered his senior staff members and ordered them to begin preparing plans for various offensive scenarios. But in a case of the flesh being significantly weaker than the spirit, Kozano was soon so deep in the throes of his malarial relapse that he had to take to his bed for several hours, finally managing to rise and stagger back to the 300 seconds underground operations room, still alternately sweating and shivering at about 8 p.m. Despite his frail condition, he stood resolutely before his deputy commander and remaining senior staffers. After apprising them of the treasonous events in Tokyo, and informing them that the emperor's recorded rescript would be broadcast to the nation at noon the following day, he firmly announced that he was determined to fight to the end. When one of his listeners asked how they could disobey Hirohito's will, and the direct and unequivocal orders of the Navy's senior leaders, Kozano forcefully replied, How can we be disobeying the Emperor's decision, if what we do is for his and the country's good? Warming to his topic, despite his illness, Kozano cried out, As long as I am commander here, the Atsugi Air Corps will never surrender. There is a supply of food underground that will permit us to hold out for two years, and I personally intend to do so. Are any of you with me? Shouts of assent filled the small, smoke-filled room. Let them call us traitors, Kozano cried, his voice quivering with both passion and resolve. It doesn't matter. Surrender is not only against our traditions— it's against our law. Japan cannot surrender. Are you with me? Loud cheers echoed within the concrete reinforced space. There was no dissent from the gathered officers, either because they were of the same die-hard, bushido-driven temperament as their leader, or because none wished to be seen as defeatist. A drawn and shaking Kozuno then retired to his quarters yet again, where he sat wearily at his desk to compose a message he intended to send to all major Imperial Japanese Navy IJN commands by cable. Barely able to hold the pen, Kozuno wrote, The order to cease fire and the order to disarm that will follow must inevitably mean the end of our national structure and of the Emperor. To obey such orders would be equal to committing high treason. Japan is sacred and indestructible. If we unite for action, we will destroy the enemy. Of that there can be no doubt whatsoever. I hope that you will agree with me. As Kozuno was completing his missive, 
and ordering it sent to all senior IJN commanders, his officers began transforming his expressed intent into military reality. Plans were proposed, evaluated, and discarded. And by the time dawn broke on August 15, the staffers had settled on the only three tactics that seemed possible, given their limited resources. First, because American strike aircraft often arrived in the hours just after dawn, as soon as the sun was up, a quartet of jacks would take to the air to provide a combat air patrol over Atsugi. The 300 seconds remaining aircraft would then bombard the Tokyo area with leaflets, proclaiming that the Emperor's noon speech had been coerced and calling on all true Japanese to reject the idea of surrender and fight on to the death. That done, the unit's pilots would go on a rotational alert status, ready to leap into the few remaining aircraft and roar aloft to do whatever they could to punish any Allied aircraft foolish or arrogant enough to transgress the skies of sacred Nippon. As the sun rose higher over Atsugi, it quickly became apparent that the 302nd Air Group would have access to more men and aircraft than the planners had anticipated. Among the other organizations resident on the air station was a training school for kamikaze, divine wind pilots. Men who had willingly volunteered, or in some cases been ordered to volunteer, to give their lives in sacred, selfless service to the nation and the emperor by crashing their bomb-carrying aircraft into enemy ships, a tactic that had worked frighteningly well during the American invasion of Okinawa. Atsugi was home to more than 1,000 young and inexperienced aviators. Most had fewer than 10 actual flight hours, who had been undergoing final training. Having already made the choice to die for Japan, the kamikaze pilots were obviously stunned and horrified by the rumors of surrender that began circulating around the sprawling naval base in the early hours of August 15. Though not operationally part of Kozuno's interceptor unit, many of the young pilots began gathering outside the entrance to the 302nd's headquarters when they heard that the legendary air group commander was determined to continue the fight against the Allies. This must have been a heartening development for the increasingly ill Kozuno, for as a senior officer, he was likely aware that more than 5,300 kamikaze aircraft were at that moment hidden from Allied eyes in caves, underground storage areas, and heavily camouflaged airfields across southern Japan. Though the vast majority of the machines, including the 50 or so at Atsugi, were trainers and obsolete fighters or light bombers rather than the current front-line types, their sheer numbers would pose a formidable threat to any approaching Allied occupation force. The Divine Wind might also prove lethal to enemy aircraft, given that ramming a B-29 could be just as effective a way to destroy it as shooting it down. If he could rally the pilots of all the kamikazes in southern Japan to his anti-surrender cause, Kozuno must have reasoned, he might well be able to scuttle the looming capitulation and force his cowardly government to fight on. With his four-plane combat air patrol aloft, Kozuno moved on to the vital task of informing the citizens of Tokyo that their government was attempting to betray and dishonor them. The thousands of anti-surrender leaflets that had been printed overnight, all calling for a general uprising against the defeatists surrounding the emperor, and urging thorough resistance against the oncoming American invaders, were loaded aboard several of the temporarily reassigned kamikaze training aircraft. These machines took off 90 minutes before the noon broadcast of the recorded Imperial Rescript, and their paper ordnance was therefore dropping over the capital, even as Hirohito's high, tremulous voice hit the airwaves from NHK's main studio. Kozuno himself listened to the broadcast, sitting cross-legged on his bed at Atsugi, attempting to deal with his worsening malarial symptoms by self-medicating with cup after delicate porcelain cup of warm sake, 
when Hirohito's words made it all too clear that Japan was really going to do the unthinkable. The veteran naval aviator launched the second part of his plan. He ordered his remaining frontline interceptors and several of the less decrepit kamikaze trainers aloft in search of Allied aircraft. The Japanese pilots didn't have to look far to find the hated enemy. Though the arrival in Washington of Japan's official acceptance of the surrender terms had prompted Far East Air Force's headquarters to halt all offensive operations, as of the early morning hours of August 15 local time. At 4.15 a.m., the carriers of U.S. Vice Admiral John S. McCain's Task Force 38 had launched 103 fighters and attack aircraft on a planned sweep of the Tokyo area. The American pilots were over their targets when they received the recall notice, but many had already been engaged by Japanese anti-aircraft guns and interceptors and were unable to simply reverse course and head back to their ships. In the ensuing dogfights, U.S. F-6F Hellcats and F-4U FG-1 Corsairs took on Army and Navy fighters, downing more than 20 of the Japanese aircraft over the Kanto Plain and others at sea. As might be expected, however, the Americans did not escape unscathed. By the time the attackers set off for the return to their carriers, 13 Navy and Marine Corps aircraft had been lost to fighters or ACAC over the Kanto Plain or just offshore. The single worst U.S. loss occurred just after the recall message was received. Some 20 Army Nakajima Ki-84 Hayate Frank single-engine interceptors jumped six Hellcats of Navy Fighter Squadron 88, VF-88, over Tokorozawa Airfield, 16 miles northwest of Tokyo. The Americans claimed nine Franks, but lost four Hellcats and their pilots. Although it is unclear from surviving records whether the 302nd Air Group's JTM or A6M interceptors were involved in the day's many running battles over the Kanto Plain, pilots of VF-88 reported downing three jacks within only a few miles of Atsugi. We do know, however, that several of the kamikaze trainer aircraft dispatched on the leaflet-dropping mission failed to return either because they were shot down by the marauding Americans, or because their pilots, still hoping to strike a blow against the enemy, flew off to attempt suicide attacks against the U.S. warships offshore. It is entirely possible that the duty shot down by Ensign Clarence A. Moore of USS Bella Woods VF-31 Squadron just before 2 p.m., the last air-to-air -air kill of the day, and the last by a Navy pilot in World War II was one of Kozano's night fighters, or an Atsugi-based kamikaze trainer. Whatever impact the August 15 battles may have had on the 300 seconds aircraft and pilots, Kozano's actions over the rest of that day indicate that he, at least, believed his organization had acquitted itself reasonably well, and that its aggressive anti-surrender attitude should be replicated by other Navy units. He had been sending cables to senior commanders throughout the day, urging them to repudiate the Emperor's surrender announcement and fight on, and was likely both heartened and humbled later that evening by the news that at least one August superior seemed to share his views. Just before 6 p.m., Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki, commander of the Kyushu-based 5th Air Fleet, and the man largely responsible for launching the waves of kamikazes that so hammered American naval forces at Ulithi and Okinawa, climbed into the rear seat of a Judy and led ten other aircraft on a last-ditch suicide mission against U.S. vessels loitering just over the darkening horizon. That the Admiral and his men apparently never found the enemy, no kamikaze attacks were recorded that evening, would probably not have bothered Kozano much. It would likely have been enough for the 300 seconds commander that Ugaki had personally led the mission, from which neither he nor any of the others returned. Kozano's belief that only his beloved navy had the courage and resolve to continue the fight seemed to be borne out by the fact that by the time night fell on August 15, 
the commanders of the majority of Army aviation units in the Kanto region had finally decided to obey the order issued the day before by Lieutenant General Masao Yoshizumi, the chief of the Military Affairs Bureau in the War Ministry. Knowing that some of his aviators would be sorely tempted to keep fighting despite the Emperor's decision to surrender, Yoshizumi had directed that the propellers and fuel tanks be removed from all Army aircraft to prevent their unauthorized use following the ceasefire. Although many Army pilots found it impossible to stand down while there were still enemy aircraft looking for a fight, witness the number of Army interceptors that took part in the battles earlier that day against the U.S. carrier planes, the apparent cessation of American attacks as a result of Hirohito's acceptance of the surrender terms, led most army squadrons to carry out Yoshizumi's command, resulting by midnight in the permanent grounding of nearly all of the army's remaining combat aircraft. The fact that the 302nd Air Group had not similarly responded to the ceasefire orders issued by the Navy Ministry did not go unnoticed in Tokyo, of course. Atsugi's communication center had been receiving a steady stream of urgent radio messages, cables, and telephone calls since dawn, all of which ordered Kozano and his men to stand down immediately and disable their aircraft, though slipping deeper into the grip of his intense malarial relapse. The father of Japanese night fighters refused to acknowledge any of the directives from higher headquarters, and a few hours after Hirohito's speech, he'd ordered that all incoming communications lines be shut down. He continued to send messages out, however, dispatching couriers to nearby military installations, bearing written pleas that they join the anti-surrender fight. In seeking allies for his continuing war against the Americans, Kozano relied exclusively on the Bushido-infused Japan-must-never-surrender argument, that so motivated him and other diehards. But, as noted earlier, there was another type of Japanese aviator present in the Kanto region, one who understood and accepted the Emperor's expressed reasons for the necessity for Japan's surrender, but who had made the rational and militarily supportable decision that the nation's airspace should remain inviolate until the surrender document had actually been signed. After all, these pilots reasoned, there was no way to determine whether Allied aircraft flying over the home islands after the ceasefire had gone into effect would themselves actually refrain from hostile action. Perhaps the Americans would elect to drop one of their horrible new bombs on Tokyo, despite the supposed cessation of hostilities, just to further punish Japan, and at one stroke eliminate the Emperor and all the other senior leaders whom the enemy held accountable for causing the Pacific War. Moreover, this rationalist argument went, Japan remained a sovereign nation, at least for the moment, and as such, she had the internationally recognized right to prevent overflights of her territory by military aircraft of a technically still belligerent nation or alliance, no matter the intent of the aerial intrusion. Unfortunately for the B-32 crewmen, who would soon find themselves over Tokyo, one of the largest groups of rationalist Japanese aviators was based at Opama Air Station. The men, members of the famed Yokosuka Kokutai, were also among the most experienced, and thus the most potentially lethal, pilots in the Japanese Navy. First organized in April 1916, the Yokosuka Air Group, referred to by its members as the Yokoku, was the oldest and throughout its history, arguably one of the most accomplished air groups in the Navy. Over the first two decades of its existence, the unit was primarily a research and development and advanced training organization, with its integral fighter squadron responsible for both the flight testing of newly introduced Navy aircraft and the formulation and fleet-wide dissemination of innovative aerial combat tactics. In keeping with its status and duties, the Yokoku tended to attract the best and the brightest from among the ranks of naval aviators, and among its alumni were such luminaries as Minoru Genda, 
the man who helped plan the December 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. Despite the Yokoku's fame, its home base, Opama Naval Air Station, was nowhere near as well-equipped or prestigious as the 300 seconds Atsugi. Built partially on land reclaimed from Tokyo Bay, east of the entrance to Kawazana Bay, a mile to the northwest of the vast naval shipyard and harbor complex at Yokosuka, the airfield dated to the late 1920s and was originally home to land planes, seaplanes, and lighter-than-aircraft. Opama was sighted among several low coastal hills across a narrow channel from the Azuma Peninsula and was known to Navy pilots as a challenging field. Though they had been improved somewhat over the years, the base's two intersecting runways remained shorter than average, and the landing approach from the west required pilots to avoid the hills while being buffeted by the near-constant winds that wafted between them. Despite, or perhaps because of, these challenges, Yokoku aviators were deeply attached to what was, in a military sense, their ancestral home. By February 1944, Japan's worsening strategic situation, coupled with the increasing attrition visited on the Navy by Allied forces, led to the Yokoku's being partially relieved of its training and development duties, so that half its fighter pilots could put their considerable skills to combat use. At that point, the organization consisted of 108 aircraft, 48 Zeke carrier fighters, 48 Kawanishi N1K1J Shiden George interceptors, and 12 Irving night fighters. About half that total complement was kept at Opama to assist in the Navy's planned air defense of the Kanto Plain, while the other half was dispatched to aid in the Japanese defense of the Marianas. Over the following months, the deployed Yokoku aviators did what they could to help stop the American advance, attacking enemy vessels and providing air defense cover for Japanese forces on Iwo Jima. Though the unit racked up an impressive 52 kills, the ferocity of the American air assault had by July resulted in the deaths of more than 20 of the Yokoku's top pilots and the loss of nearly two-thirds of its deployed aircraft. By the fall of 1944, the surviving unit members were sent back to Opama, where the air group, now relieved of its training duties, was dedicated full-time to the defense of the southern and eastern approaches to the Kanto Plain. The Yokoku's ability to contribute meaningfully to that vital mission was greatly enhanced by the fact that despite the battering it had taken over Iwo Jima, it still counted on its roster some of Japan's most experienced and capable naval aviators. Among them was the unit's leader, Lieutenant Commander Masanobu Ibusuki, a veteran of the attack on Pearl Harbor, flying from the carrier Akagi who was renowned throughout the Navy for having helped shoot down the first American warplane lost in aerial combat in World War II, a Boeing B-17C attempting to land at Honolulu's Hickam Field after a ferry flight from California. Though Ibusuki never downed the five enemy aircraft traditionally required to reach ace status, several of his pilots had attained that honorific many times over. Among the more colorful of Yokoku's aces was 32-year-old Lieutenant Junior Grade Matsuo Hagiri, widely known throughout the Navy as Mustachio Hagiri, because of the luxuriant and rare handlebar that graced his upper lip. A veteran of combat above China and the Solomon Islands, Hagiri had been assigned to Ibusuki's organization in September 1943 after being severely wounded in a dogfight over Papua New Guinea. After recovering, he'd become an advanced flight instructor at Opama, passing on the skills that had allowed him to down at least 13 enemy aircraft. Joining Hagiri in the original instructor role was another wounded ace, 25-year-old warrant officer Sadamu Komachi, who'd come to the Yokoku in the summer of 1944 with 18 victories as well as burn scars inflicted by U.S. Navy F-6F Hellcat pilot 
Ensign Wendell Twelves of VF-15 over Oroti Airfield on Guam. Komachi stood out among his fellow pilots, both because of his stature. At just over six feet tall, he was literally able to look down on most of his colleagues and because he was widely considered to be an excellent combat pilot. But the young warrant officer also had a reputation as a daredevil and hellion, who was willing to bend rules and cut corners, if doing so would help him further improve his already impressive technical skills, or, presumably, further increase his score. Although he shared Komachi's rank, and at twenty-four was close in age, warrant officer Ryoji Ohara, was by all accounts an altogether different type of fighter pilot. Methodical, patient, and a technician in the best sense of the term. Ohara had first seen combat over New Guinea in 1942, and since that time had downed some 16 enemy aircraft, and earned the nickname The Killer of Rabaul. His presence at Opama was a huge boon for the Yokoku, because of his obvious skill in the cockpit, and apparently because his calm and rational temperament had a moderating effect on his close friend, Komachi. Though each of these pilots, and several others in the Yokoku, helped burnish the unit's reputation as the Group of Aces, it was the near-legendary exploits of one man, Lieutenant Junior Grade Saburo Sakai, that largely provided the foundation for that sobriquet. Twenty-nine years old in August 1945, the diminutive Sakai had entered the Navy in 1933 as an enlisted man, initially serving on surface warships before taking the examination for pilot training. Though it took him three tries to pass the test, he excelled during flight school, showing a natural aptitude for the tactics and techniques of fighter combat. He first put his skills to the test in the late 1930s, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, and by December 1941 was already an ace. Sakai participated in the Japanese assault on Clark Field in the Philippines, and went on to see combat and earn promotion to officer status, flying the A6M Zeke over the Netherlands East Indies and the Central Pacific. He initially joined the Yokoku in June 1944, and was among those pilots sent to Iwo Jima, and returned to Opama with the survivors of that deployment. By that time, Sakai had downed at least 50 enemy aircraft, but he was initially relegated to flight instructor status, owing to the many injuries he'd sustained thus far in the war, most notably damage to his eyes, resulting from a 1942 encounter with the rear gunner of a U.S. Navy SBD Dauntless dive bomber. Nonetheless, he remained one of Yokoku's most formidable pilots. Though Opama had been heavily battered by enemy aircraft, the airfield was officially referred to by the Allies as Target 90-7-298 and had been attacked repeatedly beginning in the fall of 1944. The mere presence of men like Sakai, Hagiri, Komachi, and the rest ensured that the Yokoku remained a serious threat, ordered to largely avoid combat in order to conserve fuel and ammunition for the Ketsugo operation. The unit's pilots, like those in other air defense organizations throughout southern Japan, had been forced to listen in silence to increasingly shrill civilian complaints about the apparent ability of Allied aircraft to transgress the nation's airspace seemingly at will. Though most of Yokoku's aviators were apparently not of the die-hard, bushido-driven stripe, their frustration levels were high. They were among the finest fighter pilots in the Japanese military, and yet they were being told not to do what they did best. It therefore undoubtedly came as a huge relief to the aviators when within hours of the noon broadcast of Hirohito's rescript, Yokoku commander Ibusuki announced that despite the ceasefire, and until a formal surrender had been signed, he would do nothing to prevent his men from undertaking defensive actions over their own base. It was just the sort of decree Ibusuki's men had been waiting for. 
and when combined with the Bushido-enhanced fervor among the 302nd Air Group pilots at Atsugi, it would contribute directly to the chaos that would soon engulf Tony Marchion and the men of the 386th Bomb Squadron. President Harry S. Truman's order to cease offensive action against Japanese forces relayed to operational units worldwide late on August 14, Washington time, was followed within hours by a second presidential message announcing the appointment of General Douglas MacArthur to the post of Supreme Commander Allied Powers, a designation that would, in essence, make him the de facto ruler of Japan once the occupation began. Before MacArthur could assume that historically unprecedented role, of course, he had to ensure that the Japanese would actually stop fighting, lay down their arms, and prepare for a formal surrender. To do that, he would have to communicate directly with Tokyo. MacArthur first attempted that contact using the War Department communications facility in Manila. When there was no response, he tried a different tack, directing the Army Airways Communication System's Manila office to send the initial message over the frequencies used for uncoded weather information. The station, call sign WXXU, sent message Z500 in Morse code at 9.30 a.m. Manila time, addressing it to the Japanese Emperor, the Japanese Imperial Government, and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters. After informing the recipients of his appointment, MacArthur said he was empowered to arrange directly with the Japanese authorities for the cessation of hostilities at the earliest practicable date. The remainder of the message directed the Japanese to designate a single radio station in Tokyo that would handle all further communications, which would be undertaken only in English. And then, perhaps as a not-too-subtle way of informing Hirohito and his advisors of just who was now in charge, MacArthur closed with a command. Upon receipt of this message, acknowledge. That acknowledgement had not even been received when, less than thirty minutes after dispatching the first message, the communications clerks at WXXU were directed to send out another. Pursuant to the acceptance of the terms of the surrender of the Allied powers by the Emperor of Japan, the Japanese Imperial Government, and the Japanese Imperial Headquarters, the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers hereby directs the immediate cessation of hostilities by the Japanese forces. The Supreme Commander for the Allied Forces is to be notified at once of the effective date and hour of such cessation of hostilities, whereupon the Allied Forces will be directed to cease hostilities. The message went on to direct, among other things, that the Japanese send a competent representative and his accompanying delegation of senior military and political advisors by air to the American field on Ieshima, an island off Okinawa, for onward transport to Manila to discuss the details of Japan's formal surrender and its subsequent occupation by Allied forces. Though overshadowed somewhat by the other elements of the message, the phrase, whereupon the Allied forces will be directed to cease hostilities, was later to have far more importance than MacArthur and his staff may have intended, for it implied to its recipients in Tokyo that the Allies could, and presumably would, continue their air and sea attacks on the home islands until all Japanese forces had formally surrendered. Given that millions of army troops remained under arms in Japan proper and throughout Southeast Asia and China, and that Japanese units were still engaging advancing Soviet formations in Manchuria, Senior leaders in Tokyo could understandably have believed that the Allies might at any moment resume their aerial assault, despite the de facto ceasefire. No doubt partly out of a desire to avoid any further atomic bombings, the Japanese government, still led by Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki, was quick to respond to MacArthur's initial contact. Tokyo's reply to the 9.30 a.m. message received by WXXU in Manila barely two hours after its dispatch, 
provided the requested radio station information, and marked the first direct contact between the Allies and Japan. What that first response from Tokyo did not do, however, was furnish the timetable MacArthur had demanded for the cessation of hostilities by all Japanese forces. We know that senior Army and Navy leaders were burning up their remaining communications links, trying to notify far-flung commands of the surrender decision and secure their acknowledgement that they would cease all offensive action. But it wasn't until the evening of Thursday, August 16, that Tokyo was able to give an increasingly impatient MacArthur the information he wanted. In a message received in Manila just after 8 p.m., the Japanese stated that just hours earlier, Emperor Hirohito had issued an imperial order to all armed forces units, no matter their location, to cease hostilities immediately. In an oblique reference to the difficulties of both reaching remote units and overcoming some field commanders' resistance to the idea of surrender, the message stated that it would take from 48 hours in Japan proper to as much as 12 days elsewhere for the Emperor's order to produce full effect. It may have surprised MacArthur and some of his headquarters staffers to learn that not all elements of the Japanese armed forces were observing the ceasefire that had supposedly gone into effect the day before. But it wasn't news to certain American aviators. Earlier that Thursday, even as their newly appointed Supreme Commander was waiting to hear from Tokyo, several Okinawa-based airmen, including B-32 crewmen from the 386th Bomb Squadron, had personally learned that some enemy military units apparently hadn't yet decided to call it quits. Despite its suspension of offensive action against Japanese forces, the August 15 ceasefire order was not intended to halt all Allied air activity over the home islands. Indeed, three important requirements. To ascertain whether the enemy was actually beginning to abide by the terms of the ceasefire, to identify airfields and ports that could accommodate incoming occupation units, and the particularly urgent need to locate camps holding Allied prisoners so that food and medical supplies could be airdropped to them, guaranteed that Navy, carrier-based, and Army Air Force's land-based photographic reconnaissance aircraft would overfly Japan with increasing frequency. The latter services machines were dedicated photo-recon variants of the twin-engine P-38 Lightning fighter known as the F-5 and the B-24 heavy bomber F-7. Though the importance of the missions and the vast distances involved virtually guaranteed that the 386th Bomb Squadron's long-legged dominators would be called on to assist in the reconnaissance effort. That call came even before the Lady is Fresh and Hobo Queen 2 returned from their cancelled night mission on August 15. A warning order from Far East Air Force's headquarters directed that two B-32s be dispatched on a recon mission as soon as possible on August 16, with a specific requirement to photograph the Japanese naval air stations at Katori and Konoike, both northeast of Tokyo the former in Chiba Prefecture, and the latter in Ibaraki. Both fields were known to host kamikaze units, and it was imperative for Allied intelligence to know whether the remaining aircraft based at each installation still constituted a threat. Though the B-32 had an internal fixture for a vertically mounted aerial camera in its central cabin, just after the ball turret, it was not a dedicated photo reconnaissance platform and the 312th Bomb Group had no aerial photographers assigned to it. This issue had been dealt with just after the unit arrived on Okinawa, however, when the Yontan-based 20th Reconnaissance Squadron had been tapped to provide qualified personnel as needed. Whenever the B-32s undertook any mission that might broadly be categorized as reconnaissance, including the flights already conducted over the East China Sea and the Korea Strait, the Dominator's normal complement was augmented by an officer and one or two enlisted men from the 20th Recon. 
The officer would use the aircraft's bombsight to spot the area or object to be photographed, then trip the camera's shutter remotely. The enlisted aerial photographer and, if present, his assistant, who was also a qualified aerial gunner, rode in the central fuselage to be close to the camera in order to change its film magazine or troubleshoot any technical problems. The general outline of the B-32's first sojourn to the home islands was developed by staffers at Five Bomber Command Headquarters, also on Okinawa. When the plan was delivered to 312th Bomb Group Intelligence Officer Captain William P. Barnes and his deputy, First Lieutenant Rudolph Pugliese, just after midnight on August 15-16, they noted that despite the announced ceasefire, the planned route would allow the two dominators to avoid most known Japanese air defenses during the 2,050-mile round-trip flight. After takeoff from Yontan, the B-32s would head northeast for just under 1,000 miles, skirting the east coast of Chiba Prefecture to a point just off Cape Inubo. They would then turn almost directly west, complete their photo runs over the target, and reverse course to head back out to sea. Once clear of the Japanese coast, the Dominators would turn southwest and start the long haul back to Okinawa. Though there were known early warning radar sites at Shirahama on the southern tip of the Chiba Peninsula and at Choshi and Hiraiso on the coast just east of the target airfields, Barnes and Pugliese were reasonably sure they could be avoided or spoofed if necessary by the radar countermeasures sets and rope carried aboard the B-32s. The two intelligence officers fleshed out the bare-bones Five Bomber Command mission plan with file photos of the target airfields and maps of the areas surrounding them, all of which were pinned to the large bulletin board at the front of the 386th Bomb Squadron's briefing shack. The crewman assigned to the flight walked quietly into the building at 4 a.m., and over the next 45 minutes were given details of the mission by both Barnes and the group's operations officer. During the course of their remarks, each man said that despite the ceasefire, the flight crews should stay alert for enemy opposition and be ready for anything. The two dominators assigned to the day's mission were Hobo Queen 2 and Harriet's Chariot, 42-108543, the latter being one of four B-32s that had reached Okinawa from Clark Field on August 12. Both were fitted with auxiliary bomb bay fuel tanks for the long flight, and each carried two members of the 20th Recon Squadron in addition to its regular 12-man crew. With pre-flight checks and engine run-ups completed, the two aircraft lifted off from Yontan just after 5.30 a.m. and turned their noses to the northeast. The mission was initially uneventful, the Dominators flying in loose formation with Hobo Queen 2 in the lead and her pilot, Frank Cook, as mission commander. Then, at 9.35, still over the ocean at an altitude of 16,000 feet and some 155 miles due south of Tokyo, the exhaust collector assembly in the number 2 left inboard engine of Harriet's chariot failed. This allowed hot gases to flood the nacelle and ruptured fuel and oil lines, sparking an immediate fire that blew off one of the R-3350's exhaust ports. The bomber's pilot, 22-year-old B-24 combat veteran First Lieutenant Lyman Combs, immediately cut the fuel and oil flow, closed the throttle, feathered the propeller, opened the cowl flaps, and ordered his flight engineer to activate the power plant's fire extinguishers. The flames quickly died, but with only three good engines, there was no point in Harriet's chariot continuing the mission, given that the loss of a second R-3350 would force the Dominator to ditch in the sea. After radioing his intentions to Cook in Hobo Queen 2, Combs turned his aircraft around and headed back to an eventual safe landing at Yontan. Hardly had the damaged B-32 completed her turn toward home, when the ball turret gunner aboard Hobo Queen 2 sighted an unidentified aircraft 
several thousand feet below the bomber, on a perpendicular course. Though the machine, most probably a Japanese Navy flying boat, was headed toward the coast of Honshu and posed no obvious threat, the gunner's alert over the intercom undoubtedly quickened a few pulses. Then, barely forty minutes later, more excitement. As Hobo Queen Two came abreast of the southern tip of the Chiba Peninsula, the bomber was painted by a Japanese Type B search radar, most likely the Army-operated system at Shirahama. The B-32 flew on without incident, paralleling the coast about eighty miles offshore, but her radar countermeasures operator noted a large number of emissions throughout the Kanto region. Things got even more interesting as Hobo Queen Two began her photo run. Having turned northwest and crossed the Japanese coastline at 20,000 feet, just south of Kashima, the B-32 was again illuminated by a Type B radar, this one the system at Choshi. Then, without warning, a far more ominous signal filled the countermeasures operator's headphones, the steady hum that indicated a Japanese fire control radar had locked onto the Dominator. The system provided altitude, course, and speed data to crews manning Type 10 120mm anti-aircraft guns, weapons whose 33,000-foot vertical range made them more than capable of knocking down a high-flying American bomber. Before Cook and his crew had the chance to wonder if the war was back on again, however, the radar broke lock of its own accord, and the signal vanished. The Dominator's first photo target, the airfield at Kanoike, was almost completely obscured by a layer of stratus clouds between 4,000 and 6,000 feet, and the 20th Recon Squadron photographer did not capture any usable images. Things were better over Katori, however, which came into the K-18A camera's viewfinder barely three minutes later. The device automatically exposed a number of frames, one every three seconds, as the B-32 passed over the heavily bombed but apparently still operational aerodrome. Then her photo run completed. Hobo Queen Two banked sharply to port, maintaining her altitude, and initiating a tight 160-degree turn back toward the coast. The course was intended to allow the big bomber to slip between the coverage arcs of the Type II radars at Hiraiso, north of her track, and Choshi to the south. The tactic worked, and the Dominator made it back out to sea without being painted by either system. Once at a point about 40 miles offshore, Cook turned Hobo Queen Two to the southwest, and started back for Okinawa. That last leg of the mission was uneventful, except for the sighting of another aircraft at about noon. The machine was too far distant to be identified, and the B-32 landed safely at Yontan early that evening. The August 16 mission was judged to have been largely successful, despite the difficulties encountered by Harriet's chariot and the cloud cover that prevented effective photography of the airfield at Kanoike. The fact that Hobo Queen Two had not been fired on by anti-aircraft artillery, despite the brief lock-on by a gun-laying radar, or attacked by fighters, was taken by the aviators in the 386th and by those higher up the chain of command as a positive indication that Japanese forces were apparently willing to abide by the ceasefire. That was especially important given that even before Hobo Queen Two had returned from the initial B-32 reconnaissance flight over Japan, 5th Air Force Headquarters had scheduled a second and more ambitious mission. Unfortunately, it would not go anywhere near as well as the first. As outlined by the planners at 5 Bomber Command, the second and more ambitious recon mission would put four dominators over the greater Tokyo area to photograph seven airfields, both to ensure that none was still conducting offensive operations and to determine which of them might be in suitable condition to accept incoming Allied aircraft when the occupation began. Two of the installations, Imba and Matsudo, were long-established army bases. 
The airdrome at Haneda was Tokyo's pre-war civilian airport, now being used as a satellite army air defense field. The remaining four were naval air stations. Katori, which the B-32s had visited the day before, Kami Miyagawa, an auxiliary field 15 miles to the south near Choshi, Tomioka, a seaplane base on the west side of Tokyo Bay, about halfway between Yokohama and Opama Air Station, and Opama itself. The choice of fields to be photographed indicates that the mission planners must have been fairly confident that there would be no enemy resistance. Not only was the Kanto region dotted with hundreds of known anti-aircraft weapons ranging from 25mm to 120mm, since mid-1944 it had been protected by more aircraft than any other part of Japan. Indeed, Imba and Matsudo were both home to crack army interceptor units, the former to 20 Nakajima Ki-44 Shoki, allied codename Tojo, single-engine fighters of the 23rd Air Regiment, and the latter to 34 Kawasaki Ki-45 Toriyu Nick, twin-engine night fighters of the 53rd Air Regiment. And, of course, 5th Air Force intelligence officers were well aware that the Yokoku flew from Opama. The mission plan called for the four dominators to fly together from Yontan to the small island of Miyakijima, some 870 miles northeast of Okinawa, and roughly 85 miles due south of Yokosuka. The aircraft would then turn north toward the Kanto Plain, begin their climb to the photo altitude of 20,000 feet, and gradually assume a widely spaced echelon formation that would permit them to fly parallel courses roughly two miles apart as they mowed the lawn on their photo runs. Each B-32 was to photograph three of twelve planned flight lines, although this would require the individual aircraft to make two course reversals over the greater Tokyo area. It would also ensure overlapping coverage of the target airdromes, cloud cover permitting. At the end of the last photo pass, the dominators would hit the coast just north of Katori, tighten their formation, and turn back to the southwest to begin the 900-mile return flight to Okinawa. The four aircraft chosen for the mission were the hard-working Hobo Queen II, again with Cook as pilot, 578, flown by 312th Commander Salmon Wells, Harriet's chariot, her bad engine replaced overnight, with Tony Sforey at the controls, and 539, piloted by First Lieutenant Emery D. Frick, a former B-24 aviator with extensive combat experience. As on the previous day's mission, the Dominators would fly with Bombay fuel tanks and full loads of 50 caliber machine gun ammunition for their gun turrets. The latter provision was normal operating procedure. Fifth Air Force headquarters had decreed that despite the ceasefire, all combat aircraft would fly armed until Japanese officials had actually signed the surrender documents. However, during the pre-dawn briefing for the men who would be taking the B-32s to Tokyo, the possibility of enemy attack was rated as minimal, most probably because of the lack of opposition to the previous day's mission, and the news that on the evening of the 16th, Emperor Hirohito had issued a second rescript, this one ordering all members of Japan's armed forces to lay down their arms and stop fighting. Though this would have helped ease the apprehension some of the aviators certainly must have felt about the idea of flying back and forth over the Kanto Plain, not all were convinced the flight would be a milk run. Sfore, for example, believed that the Japanese would be far more likely to react violently to the B-32's appearance above their capital than they had bid to the overflight of the relatively unimportant airfield at Katori. Whatever the men assigned to the second recon mission might have felt about the possibility of enemy opposition, they did what military professionals do. They got on with the job. All four B-32s were in the air by 5.45 a.m., and the first leg of the flight went exactly as planned. There were no mechanical problems, and other than being painted by a Type-B radar upon arrival over Miyakijima, 
the Dominators had not encountered any sign of Japanese interest in them. At 10.15, Cook, in Hobo Queen II, radioed the other aircraft to disperse and begin their photo runs, then turned his own aircraft toward its first assigned airfield. Though the men aboard the B-32s didn't realize it yet, the radar station that had illuminated the American bombers had relayed the contact information to anti-aircraft batteries throughout the Kanto region. More important, as it turned out, the alert also went to the 302nd Air Group and to the Yokoku. At Atsugi, a young lieutenant named Muneaki Morimoto quickly secured the fever-stricken Kozono's permission to launch an interception, and within minutes, Morimoto was leading a flight of four Zeeks in a full-power climb toward the Americans' last known position. At Opama, the first inkling the Yokoku pilots had that something was amiss was the shrill scream of an air raid siren. As Saburo Sakai later remembered, he and the unit's other pilots were caught totally off guard. Although they'd voluntarily been standing alert, Despite the Emperor's August 15 rescript and his order to the armed forces the following day to lay down their arms, the Yokoku aviators had been told that the Americans had pledged not to fly bombers over Japan following the ceasefire, and they therefore were not really expecting to launch any interceptions. When the call came in that there were in fact what appeared to be B-29s flying up the Boso Peninsula, Sakai and his comrades were momentarily at a loss. The war was supposed to be over. Yet it appeared the Americans still wanted a fight. They turned to their commander, Masanobu Ibusuki, for guidance. After a quick call to higher headquarters, he ordered the engines of the alert aircraft to be started, then turned to his pilots and said, International law forbids us to attack the enemy after surrender but it is okay to get back at planes that attack us. Come on, men. Go get him. Already wearing their flight suits, ten or twelve pilots, including Sakai and Ryoji Ohara, ran to the fueled and armed Georges and Zeeks sitting in the alert revetments. Sakai leapt into one of the latter aircraft, pleased at the unexpected chance to fly his favorite mount into combat one more time. And minutes later, the fighters roared aloft, clawing for altitude, even as their gear and flaps retracted. Wells and the men aboard his Dominator were the first to realize that the Japanese intended to oppose the recon flight. Even before 578 had started her photo run, a Yokoku George, which the Americans misidentified as the very similar-looking Army Key 44 Tojo, zoomed past several hundred feet above the B-32, then rolled inverted and reversed course, coming back at the American aircraft from the two o'clock position, off the bomber's nose slightly to starboard, firing as it came. Wells immediately turned the Dominator directly toward the incoming fighter, and the nose turret gunner opened up with his twin fifties. The pilot of the George, possibly used to attacking B-29s, which had no nose turret, was apparently startled by the volume of return fire, and immediately broke off the attack. Wells and his crew were not out of the woods yet, however. As 578 began her first photo run, the aircraft's electronic countermeasures officer, 26-year-old 2nd Lieutenant David S. Samuelson, warned that a fire control radar had locked onto the B-32, he immediately began jamming the Japanese signal, but several rounds of 120mm anti-aircraft fire burst close enough to rock the aircraft as it finished its run and then turned for the coast. Wells and his crew were not the only ones being targeted by anti-aircraft guns. At about that same time, Hobo Queen II was finishing the second of her flight lines just north of Tokyo Bay. Though the B-32's countermeasures operator had not detected any Japanese radar emissions, the tail gunner suddenly called out that ACAC bursts seemed to be creeping up on the aircraft from behind. Understandably apprehensive, and likely more than a little unnerved, 
The gunner made his announcement rather more loudly than he probably intended. For Cook, whom the Dominator's radio operator, Staff Sergeant Robert Russell, later remembered as real calm, came on the intercom and said, Cut out that screaming back there. I'll get us out of this. Don't worry about it. Cook was as good as his word. Realizing that determined Japanese resistance would make the planned mission impossible to complete, he immediately turned the B-32 south toward Tokyo Bay and put it into a slight dive to pick up speed. Though Japanese fighters ahead of and above the Dominator were sighted by one of the gunners, they did not attack, and Hobo Queen II was able to escape further enemy attention. The same cannot be said for either Harriet's Chariot or 539, however. Svore and his crew had started their second flight line, just west of Chiba, when one of the gunners called out incoming enemy fighters. Harriet's chariot had not been fired on up to that point, but the sudden appearance of apparently hostile interceptors did not surprise the 386th commander. He later recalled that it simply validated his belief that the Japanese would be far more likely to intercept Allied aircraft appearing over Tokyo than they would be over other, less symbolic areas. Whatever their motivation, the enemy pilots seemed determined to inflict punishment on the B-32. Six aircraft attacked Harriet's chariot. They were later identified by the bomber's crew as five Army Tojos and one Kawasaki Ki-61 Hien, Tony, though the former were actually Navy Georges. The first pass was made by the Tony, which started its run some 3,000 feet above and directly behind the Dominator. The fighters swooped down and pulled up astern and slightly below, and opened fire at the same time as the B-32's rear upper gunner. The fighter took several hits, began trailing smoke, then rolled inverted and dived into the clouds below. The Georges then came at Harriet's chariot from different directions and altitudes, eventually concentrating their attacks on the bomber's aft end, after realizing that the tail turret was malfunctioning. Though the fighters kept up their attacks for about 15 minutes, the only damage they inflicted was a small hole in the B-32's wing, and Harriet's chariot was able to make it to the sea and find cover in a layer of heavy clouds. Given that Opama was the primary photo target assigned to Emery Frick and the men aboard 539, it is not surprising that they received far more attention from the Japanese than the morning's briefing at Yontan had led them to expect. As the Dominator began the initial pass over the Okosuka area at 20,000 feet, she was the target of some 50 bursts of radar-directed 120mm anti-aircraft fire, several of which were close enough to punch holes in the nacelle of the number 4 engine and the inboard trailing edge of the left wing. Then, even before 539 came off the photo pass, a group of fighters appeared. One of them was flown by Sakai, who was surprised to find that the quarry was not the B-29 he was expecting, but a completely different aircraft. As he was noting the Dominator's enormous vertical stabilizer, the other Yokoku pilots rolled in on her, initially from 12 o'clock high. Tracer rounds from the fighter's guns were clearly visible in the bright noontime sky as they arced in toward the bomber. So aggressive were the Japanese airmen that Frick's co-pilot, 2nd Lieutenant Joe E. Elliott, was certain they intended to ram the Dominator. That didn't happen, but over the next 20 minutes, the Japanese came at the B-32 from virtually every angle. The sky around 539 was so crowded, in fact, that Sakai had to abort his initial firing pass from 3 o'clock high when another fighter pulled in front of him. As soon as the attack started, Frick had begun a sweeping turn to the south, toward the entrance to Tokyo Bay. His gunners kept up a steady defensive fire throughout the maneuver, observing hits on at least two of the fighters, both of which they later claimed as probably destroyed. As he completed the turn, Frick put the B-32 into a slight dive 
and jammed all four throttles to their stops. Sakai, at this point awaiting his chance for another pass, saw the Dominator accelerate so quickly that he wondered whether the bomber was equipped with some sort of auxiliary rocket engine. He and his wingman, most probably Ryoji Ohara, kept up the chase nevertheless, as did one or two of the other fighters, lobbing rounds at the B-32 as it pulled away from them. One by one, the Japanese pilots gave up and turned back toward Opama, with Sakai and his partner hanging on until the Dominator reached Miyakijima. Then, fearing they might run into U.S. Navy carrier fighters, the two pilots broke off their pursuit and turned back toward Yokosuka. The departure of the last Japanese fighters was undoubtedly greeted by a sigh of relief from the men aboard 539. Though none of them had been injured in the aerial melee, their B-32 was somewhat the worse for wear. 20mm cannon rounds and 12.7mm machine gun bullets had holed both wings and the rudder trim tab. The damage was not serious enough to prevent the Dominator's return to Okinawa, however. And as Frick took up a course for Yontan, the men aboard 539 settled in for the long flight, and the first of many discussions about the day's events. Similar conversations were undoubtedly taking place aboard the other three B-32s, each of which was making its own way back to Okinawa. The B-32 crewmen were not the only people talking about what had happened over Tokyo, of course. Terse radio accounts of the Japanese attacks, radioed back to Yontan by Cook, Wells, and Sfore, had also sparked intense concern among senior officers at Five Bomber Command and FIF headquarters. Although the interception of the Dominators was the most serious breach of the ceasefire, it was not the only one that had taken place over Japan that day. A consolidated F-7 Liberator on a recon mission to Yokohama had also been fired on by anti-aircraft batteries, as had two F-5 Lightnings over Kyushu. The high level of command interest in what had happened to the B-32s was clearly evident when the aircraft finally landed at Yontan at about 5 p.m. The Dominators were immediately surrounded by dozens of senior officers, and reporters both civilian and military, all clamoring to know what had happened over Tokyo. As soon as the men stepped from their aircraft, they were whisked off to the standard post-flight debriefing, where for the next few hours they were grilled about their actions and those of the Japanese. The aviators were understandably proud that they'd been able to give better than they'd received. The Dominator's gunners claimed a total of four probable kills of Japanese fighters, for no losses or injuries on their own side. But they were also angry. In their minds, the Japanese had once again shown themselves to be treacherous and deceitful. Their apparent disregard for the ceasefire, just another example of Tokyo's perfidy. For the senior five bomber command and FIF officers, the issues presented by the attacks that day were potentially far larger, however. The fact that these events occurred just two days before Japanese envoys were scheduled to fly to Manila, as MacArthur had directed, was understandably troubling for the men who'd been tasked to plan and implement the aerial portions of the occupation. Was it all just a misunderstanding? After all, in his initial messages to the Japanese, MacArthur had indicated that no bombers would fly over Japan, but he'd said nothing of reconnaissance flights. Had the Japanese fired on the F-7 and B-32s because they were assumed to be bombers that might have some secret, hostile intent? Were the Japanese attacks simply the acts of diehards and renegades, they must have wondered? Or did they foreshadow something far more sinister on the part of Japan's leaders? After reviewing all the information presented by the returning Dominator crewmen and evaluating the most current intelligence reports, the men from Five Bomber Command and FIF apparently decided that the day's events were some sort of aberration, for they made what appears in hindsight to be an otherwise inexplicable decision. Despite what had happened to the four B-32s that day, 
they decided to dispatch four more dominators to the Japanese capital the following morning. It was a decision that would cost one young American his life. Chapter 5 A Desperate Fight The Japanese fighter attacks on the Dominators involved in the August 17 mission over the Kanto region confused and angered the American airmen involved in the engagement. More important, the interception of the B-32s caused senior leaders all the way up the chain of command to wonder whether the incident had been an anomaly or was the first sign of Japan's decision to repudiate its earlier agreement to accept the Allied surrender terms and continue the war. But there was another, more immediate concern. The appearance of the Japanese fighters had forced the Dominators to cut short their aerial photography mission, and news of the attack had also caused the cancellation or recall of other reconnaissance flights over the home islands. Far East Air Force's headquarters still needed to know which Japanese airfields would be usable for incoming occupation troops. And that meant that reconnaissance aircraft would have to be sent back over the Tokyo area, despite what had happened on August 17. In determining that additional recon flights were necessary, the five bomber command planners decided on a multi-mission approach. Aircraft from several units were tapped to participate, including both the 20th Recon and the 386th Bomb Squadron. The former would send four F-7s over the area south and west of Tokyo, while the latter would put a quartet of Dominators back over the northeastern part of the Kanto region. Though the decision to send B-32s back to Japan on August 18 may have been a nod to the Dominator's demonstrated abilities as a stable, long-range camera platform that could defend itself when necessary. It was more probably simple expedience. The big bombers were available, capable of performing the task, and not otherwise engaged. The mission plan called for four B-32s to photograph airdromes to the east of Greater Tokyo in Chiba Prefecture. These included several of the bases that had not been imaged on the 17th because of the fighter attacks, as well as the army fields at Shimoshizu and Kiyoroshi. The B-32s were to cover a roughly rectangular area of some 600 square miles, flying two miles apart and mowing the lawn at 20,000 feet. Planners estimated that it would take the four machines approximately an hour to complete their photo runs, if they were allowed to complete their task without interference. Whether the Japanese would oppose the B-32s and other reconnaissance aircraft was at that point an open question. As strange as it may seem, there had apparently been no attempt to communicate with the Japanese regarding the August 17 attack, either by FIF or by MacArthur's staff in Manila. It is always possible that someone of exalted rank in one of the headquarters determined that the fighter interception of the B-32s had been the last hurrah of a small band of renegade pilots who had since been brought to heel. But even the idea that no one attempted to verify that assumption before sending multiple crews back into what was quite possibly still the lion's den is staggering. Moreover, the number of Japanese interceptors involved in the initial incident, and the fact that the nature of the photo recon mission had required the individual B-32s to fly too far apart to offer each other mutually supportive defensive fire, logically argued that the August 18 missions by the Dominators and the 20th Recon aircraft should be escorted by friendly fighters. Iwo Jima-based P-51 Mustangs and P-47 Thunderbolts of 7 Fighter Command were more than capable of rendezvousing with the B-32s and F-7s off the Japanese coast and accompanying them during the photo runs. Yet no such escort was to be provided. It is certainly possible, of course, that the mission planners decided not to send fighters along on August 18 out of an excess of caution. They may have reasoned that the arrival over Japan of large, four-engine bomber-type aircraft escorted by fighters would be more likely to prompt an aggressive response than it would be to prevent one. 
After all, during the previous two years, the appearance over Tokyo of exactly the same sort of mixed bomber fighter formations had heralded imminent death and destruction. And the Japanese might well assume that in retaliation for the August 17 attacks on the B 32s, the Americans had decided to renew at least limited air assaults on the home islands. However, it is far more likely that the decision not to send escorting fighters was based on a simple operational reality. The August 15 theater wide ceasefire had resulted in a dramatic and fairly rapid scaling back of the elaborate air sea rescue network that had been put in place to assist airmen who, for whatever reason, were not able to make it back to their island bases after missions to Japan. By the last few months of hostilities, that network had grown to include American and Allied submarines and surface vessels stationed off the Japanese coast as plane guards, specifically to locate and retrieve downed pilots, as well as scores of Dumbo aircraft, B-17s, B-24s, and B-29s, equipped with airdroppable life rafts that orbited at set locations in order to respond quickly to a ditching or bailout. The rescue effort had been particularly valuable to the air crews of 7 Fighter Command, whose single-engine aircraft had been far less likely than larger machines to make it home safely if they encountered mechanical difficulties or had been significantly damaged by enemy action. The planner's decision not to dispatch fighter escorts as part of the August 18 recon missions may therefore have been forced on them. Given the rapid scale-back of offensive air operations following the ceasefire, it would have been nearly impossible to put adequate air-sea rescue coverage together in time to support the August 18 effort, particularly because many of the rescue units were preparing their aircraft to support the coming occupation airlift. Without that coverage to and from Japan, the little friends, as the Mustangs and Thunderbolts were called by those they escorted, would have been facing extraordinary and unacceptable risks, even if they never encountered Japanese fighters. There is another, though admittedly very improbable explanation, for why the reconnaissance aircraft tapped to overfly the Tokyo area on August 18, did so without a protective fighter escort. As the 386th Bomb Squadron's assistant intelligence officer, Rudy Pugliese, later postulated, the mission planners might intentionally have sent the B-32s and F-7s to the Kanto region on their own as a test of Japan's willingness to actually follow through with the surrender. While the overflights certainly had a legitimate and vital intelligence purpose, in that the photos the aircraft would bring back would be used in planning the arrival of Allied occupation forces, Pugliese believed the missions might also have been a rather cold-blooded fidelity test. According to this scenario, if the Japanese did not interfere in any way with the unescorted American aircraft, it would be a solid indication that the August 17 attacks had been the last desperate act of diehards, rather than an indication that Japan's announced resolve to surrender was ebbing away. Although this seems a highly unlikely possibility, not many senior officers would risk eight very expensive airplanes and their crews just to determine if the Japanese were still willing to shoot at them. Stranger things have certainly happened in wartime. Whatever the reason, the B-32s and F-7s that would be dispatched from Yontan to the Kanto region on August 18 would make the trip unescorted, with only their gunners to defend them, should the Japanese prove unfaithful. By the morning of August 18, the 386th Bomb Squadron officially owned seven B-32s, with two more still making the long trans-Pacific journey from the United States. Of those aircraft actually present at Yontan, three were grounded either by significant mechanical problems or because they were being used as a source of spare parts to keep the other aircraft flying. The four operational machines, Hobo Queen II, Harriet's Chariot, 544, and 578, therefore became the mission aircraft by default, 
despite the fact that each had a variety of what were considered to be minor mechanical defects. Several of these minor issues were to become the source of major problems in the hours to come. The one resource the 386th had in abundance was B-32 crewmen. The Dominator conversion courses the squadron had been running since before the move to Okinawa had produced more than enough qualified pilots, co-pilots, and flight engineers, and most of the other crew positions, navigator, radio, and countermeasures operators, and gunners, could be readily filled by men who in most cases had racked up many hours of B-24 time before transitioning to B-32s. Because the Army Air Forces still planned to convert the entire 312th bomb group from A-20s to Dominators, between the end of the combat test and the beginning of operations from Yontan, Tony Sforé and Salmon Wells had instituted a crew pool system intended to give as many men as possible some operational time in the B-32s. For most missions, Personnel were therefore drawn from daily rosters as needed, meaning that on any given flight, the pilot and co-pilot might never have flown together, and the gunners and other crew members might have only a passing acquaintance. There were exceptions to this policy, however, in that at least three combat-experienced B-24 crews transitioned intact into B-32s. The four crews tapped to fly the August 18 mission, gathered in the 386th makeshift briefing tent at 5.30 in the morning, sunrise still half an hour away. Clasping canteen cups full of steaming coffee, the men settled into rows of wooden folding chairs facing several bulletin boards, each of which illustrated a different aspect of the mission upon which they were about to embark. On one board, a length of string, anchored by pushpins, traced the flight path the aircraft would follow from Yontan to Tokyo and back, essentially the same track followed by the aircraft on the previous day's mission. The route kept the big bombers far offshore from the southeastern coasts of Kyushu and Shikoku, a precaution that had been in place for all Allied aircraft since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and which was intended to keep air crews safe from any potential radiation hazards. After takeoff, the Dominators would shape a direct course for the 880-mile leg to Miyakijima, the large island directly south of Tokyo Bay, and upon reaching it, would turn further to the north toward Choshi. Still some 20 miles offshore, they would then proceed up the east coast of the Boso Peninsula, to a point almost due east of Chiba, where they would turn inland to start their photo runs. Attached to a second bulletin board was a map encompassing the area from Okinawa to southern Honshu, upon which the 312th group's meteorologist had annotated the latest weather information. A third bulletin board bore a large-scale map of the Kanto region, marked with the various airfields to be photographed and the Japanese units thought to be based at each. The map also indicated the positions of known early warning and gun-laying radars, including the sites at Shirahama, Choshi, and Hiraiso, and their frequencies. This latter data would assist the countermeasures operators aboard the Dominators in jamming the radars if the need arose. The question of whether such measures would be necessary, and indeed if the Japanese could be expected to oppose the day's mission as they had the previous one, was obviously a topic of immense interest to the crewmen gathered in the briefing tent. They had, of course, all heard about the fighter interceptions the day before, and at least three men present for the briefing had been aboard the B-32s that were attacked. When the squadron intelligence officer, Bill Barnes, stepped forward to address the issue of possible enemy action, he could add little more to what most of those present already suspected. Nobody on the Allied side really knew with any certainty who was in charge in Tokyo, or whether the Japanese could be trusted to lay down their arms and abide by the ceasefire. The best advice he could give, he said, was for the B-32 crews to be ready for anything. No one in the tent that morning 
relish the idea of getting shot at by the Japanese. And it's fairly certain that Tony Marchione, in particular, was regretting his decision to volunteer for the mission. Though as an airman with three combat missions and countless training flights under his belt, he was no stranger to the idea of his own death or maiming. He undoubtedly had no wish for either of those possibilities to occur when the war was all but over. What had sounded like a milk run on August 16 was now likely to turn into something quite different. And it is entirely possible that 29-year-old Staff Sergeant Joe Lacherite, an aerial photographer and one of the 11 other 20th Recon Squadron members sitting next to Tony during the briefing, was feeling equally unsettled by his decision to get himself assigned to the flight. Le Charité had been grounded because of a bad chest cold when his regular F-7 crew had flown a photo recon mission over Japan, something he had always wanted to do. So when the Dominators were not attacked on August 16, he decided that perhaps the best way to see the Japanese capital was from a B-32. Le Charité had put his name on the volunteer list, but had not been needed for the August 17 mission. Now, however, his services were needed, and his opportunity to fly over Tokyo was soon to become an experience from which he would never fully recover. Joseph M. Le Charité was born in Sherbrooke, Quebec, in January 1916, and was brought to the United States by his parents soon after. One of seven children, he grew up in Holyoke, Massachusetts, where his father first worked in a textile mill and later opened his own building maintenance business. Life was not particularly easy for the family, and Joe left high school before graduating in order to help his father. But he also worked part-time as a spot news photographer for a local newspaper and even briefly ran his own small photo studio. He was fascinated by cameras and the ways in which photos could be enhanced in the darkroom, and those interests ultimately allowed him to do something most World War II draftees couldn't. He spent his military time working at something he loved. Inducted into the Army Air Forces in March 1944, Joe left his wife Ruth and their infant son in Holyoke and traveled to Shepherd Field, Texas, for basic training. It was during his time there that he made his photographic skills known, and when he completed BASIC in May, he was sent to Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. The base had been home to the Aerial Photography School since 1938, and by the time of Joe's arrival, the institution was training both officers and enlisted men. For the latter, the two main courses of instruction were initially in photo laboratory work and the repair and maintenance of cameras, with each subject lasting ten weeks. Early in 1944, the two courses were combined, with enlisted students first mastering laboratory techniques and then progressing to the camera technician training. Although these courses prepared students to develop the images captured by cameras mounted in aircraft and to service those cameras, combat operations in Europe and the Pacific eventually proved the need for more men qualified to actually operate the cameras in the air. As a result, in July 1944, the Photography School instituted a program to train aerial photographers and aerial photographer gunners. Men who had successfully completed the combined laboratory camera technician course and who were physically and psychologically suited for air crew duty were given two additional weeks of training in such things as photographic mission planning and camera operations while in flight. They also put their new skills to the test during actual aerial photography missions flown in Lowry's fleet of obsolescent Douglas B-18 Bolo twin-engine medium bombers. And finally, those individuals tapped to be photographer gunners underwent an abbreviated gunnery course at Lowry's Armament Technician School. Joe Le Charité was a member of the first class to complete the Laboratory Camera Technician Aerial Photographer Gunner Course, graduating in November 1944. Upon leaving Denver, 
Joe was posted to the Combat Crew Training Station Photo Reconnaissance at Will Rogers Field in Oklahoma City. It was, of course, the same organization at which Tony Marchione and the other members of Bob Essex's crew were making the transition from bombardment aviation to reconnaissance. Joe was assigned to a different crew, but he and Tony came to know each other, and although the two were not close friends, Joe later remembered that the young Italian-American gunner impressed him with his own knowledge of cameras and photography. On joining what at the time was still the 20th Combat Mapping Squadron, Joe Le Charité flew three combat missions in F-7s, all from Luzon. His first, on May 21, saw Joe serving as a waste gunner as he and his crew journeyed to the same Belletti Pass area that Bob Essex aircraft would visit just over a week later, though bad weather made photography impossible. Joe was the assigned photographer on both his second mission, a 14-hour round trip to Hainan Island off the Chinese coast, and on the third, an only slightly shorter journey to Formosa's northwest coast to photograph the Japanese Navy airfield at Taichu. None of these flights encountered any serious enemy opposition. Le Charité and his crew flew several training missions following the newly redesignated 20th Recon Squadron's move to Okinawa, but surviving records do not indicate that Joe participated in any further F-7 combat sorties with the squadron. This may have been because of the cold he'd developed just after arriving at Yontan, which by the first week in August had become severe enough that the flight surgeon grounded him. It was during this period of Joe's enforced idleness that his crew flew the mission to Japan, which in turn led the aerial photographer to volunteer for a B-32 flight. Joe, like Tony Marchione and probably every other American service member in the Pacific Theater, believed that the August 15 ceasefire was exactly what it purported to be, the end of armed conflict with Japan. And Joe, like Tony, was likely shocked to discover that the mission he'd believed would be something of a milk run might well turn into something far more threatening. Tony Marchione and Joe Le Charité were not the only men from their unit who would be participating in the August 18 mission, though as far as we can tell, they were the only two who had actually volunteered. In keeping with the 20th Recon Squadron's policy, each B-32 would carry a three-man photographic team, a photo officer who would be stationed in the Dominator's nose, and who would use the Norden bomb site to steer the aircraft over the correct photo path, the aerial photographer who would install, load, and maintain the K-22 camera in the B-32's rear cabin, and a gunner who would act as the photographer's assistant, but would not be responsible for manning a weapon. 28-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Kurt F. Rupke, the navigator on Tony's F-7 crew, and a man who had known the young Italian-American since combat crew training in Oklahoma, would lead a team consisting of himself, Joe, and Tony. The 2nd 20th Recon team would be led by 1st Lieutenant J.E. Stansberry, with Technical Sergeant G.L. Chartier as photographer, and Sergeant H.G. Thorsvig as the assistant. The names of the members of the other two teams have unfortunately not survived. The men from the 20th Recon were given their aircraft assignments at the end of the pre-flight briefing. Rupke's team would fly in 578, which for the day's mission would be piloted by 27-year-old First Lieutenant John R. Anderson, whereas Stansberry and his two men would be aboard Hobo Queen II, flown by 24-year-old First Lieutenant James L. Klein. The other two photo teams were assigned to Harriet's Chariot and 544. When the briefing ended, the men of the photo teams joined the B-32 crewmen in walking to the aircraft, parked on hard stands some 200 yards away. As Anderson and his crew began their pre-flight checks, Rupke boarded 578 through the small, stair-equipped hatch on the left side of the aircraft's fuselage, just forward of the nose wheel. Tony Marchione and Joe Le Charité, between them carrying the K-22 camera in its case 
and a barracks bag bearing each man's fleece-lined flight pants and jacket, personal oxygen masks, small tool kits, film canisters, and other items, stopped near the rear of the aircraft, marveling at the machine's sheer bulk. Neither man had ever been that close to a B-32, and compared to the B-24s and F-7s they were used to, the Dominator was a behemoth. After a moment, they climbed into the plane's rear compartment through a belly hatch just aft of the retracted ball turret and stowed their gear next to a fold-down settee attached to the port side of the fuselage. They were soon joined by Sergeant Jimmy F. Smart, the rear upper gunner, and Sergeant John T. Houston. The latter was normally the aircraft's ball turret gunner, but he announced to Tony and Joe that the unit's retraction mechanism was inoperative and the ball could not be lowered. So on this flight, Houston would man the tail turret. The news that the aircraft's belly would be defenseless should the Japanese prove hostile struck La Charité as an ill omen. Nor was the bulky ball turret the B-32's only mechanical difficulty. Sergeant Burton J. Keller announced over the intercom that his nose turret was partially inoperable. He could elevate and depress the two fifty caliber machine guns hydraulically, but they had to be traversed from side to side manually. Moreover, only one of the guns was actually capable of firing. And, as if weapon issues weren't enough, when Joe and Tony attempted to seat their K-22 aerial camera in its mount, which attached to the inside of the belly entrance hatch above a hole covered by a detachable metal disc, they discovered that several of the springs intended to hold the camera upright and steady were broken. Moreover, the electrical junction box attached to the camera mount, through which Rupke would remotely operate the camera from the nose compartment, didn't seem to be working. When Joe informed the photo officer of the issues over the intercom, Rupke told him it was too late to do anything about it, and to just do the best he could. Tony and Joe then pulled on their leather flying helmets, attached their oxygen masks, and connected the masks' long, ribbed rubber hoses to the regulator panels just above the settee. After ensuring that oxygen would flow on demand, the men disconnected the hoses and removed the masks, and then pulled their fleece-lined pants over the single-piece, tropical-weight, belted flight suits that were their normal working uniform. Sitting on the ground with various entry hatches open, the B-32 was fairly hot and humid. But within a half hour after takeoff, the aircraft's interior temperature would drop significantly, despite the heated air from ducks scattered throughout the fuselage. Then, having completed their pre-flight rituals, Tony and Joe seated themselves on the folded-down settee and attached their seatbelts, to be joined for takeoff by Smart and Houston. The four B-32s trundled from their hard stands just after 6.30, and the final aircraft lifted off from Yontan's runway 15 minutes later. The big bombers assumed a loose echelon formation as they set a course for Japan, their crews settling in for what they undoubtedly hoped would be a routine and trouble-free mission. Barely two hours later, that hope died, however, for within minutes of each other, both Harriet's Chariot and 544 developed serious engine oil leaks that forced them to abort the flight and return to Okinawa. Their departure was a serious blow, for it not only cut by half the defensive firepower that would be available should the Japanese prove hostile, it also meant that each of the remaining two aircraft would have to prolong its time over Japan to photograph additional targets. James Klein, pilot of Hobo Queen II, and now the de facto mission commander, had no choice but to lead his diminished force onward. Senior leaders in FIF and Five Bomber Command had decided that the images the recon flight would produce were potentially important enough to send the Dominators back over Japan, despite the possible risks. Like all good soldiers, Klein and his fellow aviators would do their best to follow the orders they'd been given. Though as they flew on, they were all undoubtedly wondering 
just what sort of reception awaited them. As the two dominators droned on toward their landfall at Miyakijima, some of the men best prepared to ruin the American aviator's day were dealing with their own apprehensions. The Navy pilots at Atsugi and Opama, who had participated in the previous day's attacks on the four B-32s, had done so either because they believed that the Bushido Code forbade Japan from ever surrendering to a foreign power under any circumstances, or because they felt that the nation's sovereignty, and thus its airspace, should remain inviolate until the surrender document had actually been signed. Moreover, as many of either persuasion would certainly have pointed out, the orders that had filtered down from IJN headquarters regarding the ceasefire had stated that units could defend themselves if attacked. No matter which of the two positions an individual pilot might have supported, however, the fact remained that the August 17 attack on the Dominators had been in direct disobedience of both Emperor Hirohito's clearly expressed wishes and the explicit orders of the Navy's most senior officer. While Saburo Sakai, Ryoji Ohara, and the others were not the only Japanese military personnel to have ignored the ceasefire, anti-aircraft units throughout the Kanto region had fired on American aircraft on August 15, 16, and 17, after all. And Vice Admiral Ugaki had himself attempted a final kamikaze attack. The 302nd Air Group and Yokoku pilots were undoubtedly aware that they had disobeyed orders in a most dramatic and flagrant way. They could not even legitimately claim to have acted in self-defense, because the Americans had not attacked any Japanese installations, and had only defended themselves against the intercepting fighters. Although the more glib among the naval aviators might have argued that it would have been pointless to attack a bomber after it had proven to be hostile by dropping its ordnance, the fact remained that the actions of the Japanese fighter pilots involved in the August 17 action against the Dominators technically constituted mutiny, no matter what its moral or ethical underpinnings might be. And in Japan's armed forces at that point in time, that most uniquely military of crimes was punishable by death. And yet, as far as most of the participants in the August 17 attack would have been able to tell, their actions either had gone largely unnoticed or had been purposely ignored. Messages from Tokyo continued to deluge the communication centers at both Atsugi and Opama, demanding the grounding of all aircraft and the unquestioning observance of the ceasefire. But no truckloads of heavily armed troops had yet appeared at either installation's gates to force compliance. Indeed, the 300 seconds air group's increasingly malaria-crazed captain, Yasuna Kozono, still held court in his barricaded command bunker as the sun rose on August 18. And the Yokoku's lieutenant commander, Masanobu Ibusuki, was still ordering that aircraft be fueled and armed and made ready for takeoff at any moment. The pilots at both Atsugi and Opama must have understood only too well that whatever their motivation, they would ultimately be held personally responsible for their continuing determination to engage American aircraft. And several, most notably Sakai, decided for their own reasons that the August 17 fight was their last and grounded themselves. Many others, however, awoke on August 18, determined to continue the battle if the opportunity presented itself. And in just hours, it would. Hobo Queen 2 and 578 passed over Miyakijima just after noon, and in what Rudy Pugliese's later mission report termed excellent flying weather, with unrestricted visibility. The Dominators were then at about 18,000 feet, with their crews on oxygen and wearing their full, fleece-lined, high-altitude gear. As the aircraft turned slightly to the north to parallel the coast of Chiba Prefecture, the gunners aboard each B-32 tested their weapons, at which point the men in 578 learned that they had yet another problem. 
when tail gunner John Houston depressed the triggers on the twin 50s in his tail turret. He found that for some reason he couldn't immediately diagnose. The guns were firing far more slowly than their usual cyclic rate of between 450-550 rounds per minute. When he announced this over the intercom, Burton Keller, in the partially disabled nose turret, suggested to pilot John Anderson that because the Dominator's two top turrets seemed to be the only ones working normally, he, Anderson, should take the aircraft to a lower altitude as quickly as possible if enemy fighters attacked. That way, the B-32's belly, defenseless because of the inoperable ball turret, would not be exposed. The nose and tail gunners would do what they could, Keller said, but it would be up to the two upper turret gunners, Jimmy Smart aft and Flight Engineer Sergeant Benjamin F. Clayworth forward, to provide most of the aircraft's defense. Whether it would actually be necessary to defend either Dominator against attacking fighters remained an open question as the two aircraft flew northeast, paralleling the east coast of the Boso Peninsula. But it had already become clear that the Japanese were aware of the B-32's presence. Soon after the aircraft had passed over Miyakijima, the countermeasures officer in Klein's Hobo Queen II, Second Lieutenant John R. Blackburn, had picked up the characteristic whoop-whoop-whoop sound of a Japanese early warning radar in search mode, most probably the army site at Shirahama. Almost as soon as Blackburn heard the emission, it changed to the steady hum that indicated the radar had detected the B-32, and the young officer immediately began jamming the signal. He was rewarded by the Japanese radar's immediate return to search mode, but the respite didn't last long. As the two Dominators turned east at 12.30 and crossed the coastline south of Choshi, they separated to begin their initial photo runs. Minutes later, Blackburn picked up the ominous sound of gun-laying radar. He again immediately jammed the signal and dropped rope, but also keyed his intercom and said to Klein, seated just ahead of him, Something's wrong here. They haven't stopped the war yet. By this time, John Anderson's 578 was two or three miles away, just beginning a photo run. The aircraft's countermeasures operator, Staff Sergeant Frederick C. Chevalier, had detected occasional gun-laying radar emissions, but none had lasted very long, and the young airman had not needed to jam them. A veteran of 15 missions in B-24s of the 90th Bomb Group Chevalier wasn't particularly concerned by the fact that his aircraft was being painted. Indeed, he was relaxed enough to notice the extraordinary steel-blue color of the clear, unclouded sky above the Kanto region, a sky in which his aircraft and the other Dominator seemed to be the only things moving. Though Chevalier didn't realize it at the moment, that beautiful and apparently empty sky was about to get dangerously crowded. At Opama, Sadamo Komachi and other pilots of the Yokoku were also gazing at the sky, though not in appreciation of its beauty. Shortly after John Blackburn in Hobo Queen II had begun jamming the Shirahama early warning radar, the communications center at the Navy base had apparently received telephonic warning that American aircraft were inbound toward the greater Tokyo region. This initial alert may actually have been caused by the appearance over the Yokohama area of the four F-7s of the 20th Recon Squadron. But the practical result was the same. The Japanese fighter pilots, several of whom had taken part in the previous day's attacks on the four B-32s, were watching the sky for any sign of what they still considered to be enemy airplanes. They would not be hard to spot, given that the grounding of virtually all Japanese military aircraft as a result of the ceasefire order, or because holdout pilots were attempting to conserve fuel, meant that the only machines flying about in Japanese airspace were almost certain to be allied. And at about one o'clock in the afternoon, the gathered Yokoku pilots spotted the telltale glint of sun reflecting off aluminum, so high above them, 
Komachi estimated its altitude at about 18,000 feet, that it could not be anything but an American bomber. The aircraft was clearly visible with the naked eye, and the apparent nonchalance with which it serenely cruised above war-battered Tokyo incensed Komachi. He later wrote that he could not take it anymore, and seething with frustration, he burst out, I've got to go get them. He ran to a nearby fighter, most probably a J-2M Jack, fired up the engine, and quickly taxied to Opama's main runway. Then, not waiting for any sort of clearance, he roared into the sky, followed by several of his comrades. Much the same scene was playing out at Atsugi, which had apparently also received the warning of incoming Allied aircraft. Several pilots of the 302nd Air Group, men presumably as outraged as Komachi by the reappearance of enemy bombers over Tokyo, hurried to their aircraft and also charged aloft. The Japanese pilots who took to the air on August 18, whether from Atsugi or Opama, had no intention of simply shepherding the American aircraft out of Japanese airspace. Their purpose was far more direct. They were fighter pilots, and they were on the hunt. The first B-32 crewman to realize that something was seriously amiss was most probably John Blackburn. As Hobo Queen II pulled off its final photo run, the countermeasures officer picked up the emissions of another gun-laying radar. But this time the steady hum in Blackburn's earphones indicated that the radar had already acquired them. As he began jamming the signal, Japanese 120mm anti-aircraft guns sighted between Chiba City and Choshi immediately opened fire on the Dominator. The tail gunner, Staff Sergeant J.R. Baker, called out that the bursts were at the same altitude and about 1,000 yards astern. Seconds later, another of the B-32's gunners shouted over the intercom that he could see Japanese fighters taking off from a field to the south of the bomber's track, and Klein banked the plane slightly to starboard so he could see them. The interceptors were clearly visible as they clawed for altitude, and Klein ordered his radio operator to contact Anderson and warn him that fighters were in the air. When there was no response from the other Dominator, Hobo Queen II's pilot turned the B-32 southeast and headed for the sea. The big bomber had barely made it to the coast, however, when about 20 miles south of Choshi, Sergeant Billy J. Osborne, the forward upper gunner, yelled, There's fighters coming in! The first Japanese aircraft, a Zeke, most probably from the 302nd, bored in at Hobo Queen II from one o'clock high, firing as it came. Osborne slewed his turret around and sent thumb-sized fifty caliber rounds streaming toward the incoming fighter. The gunner and the plane's co-pilot, First Lieutenant Glenn W. Bowie, both saw the bullets hitting the forward fuselage and cockpit area of the Zeke, which suddenly rolled inverted and headed down at a steep angle, its engine emitting puffs of oily black smoke. Though neither man could follow the enemy fighter's fall all the way to impact, Bowie later verified his gunner's claim of a definite kill. That presumed victory was only the start of Hobo Queen II's fight, however. Over the next twenty-five minutes, ten or more Japanese fighters came at the B-32 from ahead, behind, and above. Fortunately, as soon as the first attacker had appeared, Klein had put the Dominator into a fairly steep dive and opened the throttles to the stops knowing that few single-engine aircraft would be able to keep up. He was right, and the bomber's rapid acceleration, combined with the volume of defensive fire put out by her gunners, prevented the Japanese pilots from making more than one pass each, and ultimately kept them from inflicting any damage on Hobo Queen II, or any injuries to her crewmen. The only drawback to Klein's defensive tactic was the stress it put on the Dominator's airframe. The speed and steepness of the dive made the aircraft shake and buffet so much that at one point Blackburn leaned forward and shouted to Klein, I think we're going to come apart. The B-32 remained intact, however, 
and at about 1,000 feet above the sea, Klein leveled out and set a course for Okinawa. The Japanese fighters now miles behind and unable to catch up. When the glinting sun had first drawn Sadamu Komachi's eye toward the high-flying American bomber, it had clearly still been on a photo run, for it was flying from east to west from the direction of Kujukuri Beach on the Pacific coast side of Chiba Prefecture, toward Tokyo. By the time Komachi and his compatriots had gotten their fighters airborne, however, the aircraft, which Komachi believed was a B-29, had reversed course and was headed southeast toward the sea. Komachi was an extremely competent and highly experienced fighter pilot, and he'd been engaging multi-engine Allied aircraft since his time at Rabaul. One technique he'd used quite successfully was to fly far out in front of his intended target, while at the same time gaining altitude, then make a snap turn and come back in from twelve o'clock high with all guns blazing. This sort of attack, which was the same tactic German Luftwaffe fighter pilots had often employed against Allied bombers over Europe, had two main advantages. First, the attacking pilot could concentrate his fire on the enemy bomber's cockpit and the leading edges of its wings, thereby either killing the pilots or knocking out the engines. And second, because the attacker and his prey were flying toward each other, the high converging speeds made it difficult for the bomber's gunners to keep the fighter in their sights as it flashed past. While there was always the risk of a mid-air collision if the attacker misjudged his angle, or was himself injured by enemy fire, the tactic could be highly effective when used by a formidable fighter pilot such as Komachi. As the veteran Japanese aviator raced to get himself into position in front of and above the lone American bomber, however, he ran into an unexpected obstacle. His fellow Japanese pilots. In their eagerness to engage the B-32, Komachi's comrades, some of whom were coming off earlier attacks against Hobo Queen II, were launching attacks from 12 o'clock level, from both beams low, and from six o'clock high. The sky around the Dominator was thus filled with aircraft, making it highly likely that if Komachi employed his favorite strategy, he would run the very real risk of ramming one of the other Japanese interceptors. He pondered the situation for a moment as he flew above, parallel to, and slightly ahead of the American aircraft. And then, characteristically, threw caution to the wind and wrenched his aircraft into a wing-over to begin his attack. Although it is unclear why John Anderson did not respond to James Klein's initial warning about the Japanese fighters, it is most probably because the pilot of 578 was already aware of the enemy aircraft. At about the same time that the men aboard Hobo Queen II spotted the Japanese interceptors taking off, John Houston, Anderson's tail gunner, came on the intercom and said he saw fighters at six o'clock low, and they seemed to be gaining altitude quickly. One of the B-32's other gunners asked what they should do, and from the nose turret, Burton Keller responded, You do the same thing we've always been told to do. If any of them come in pointing their noses at us, you fire away. Just minutes later, the gunners aboard 578 had more than enough reasons to fire away. The first to do so was Tail Gunner Houston. The planes he'd seen earlier had reached the Dominator's altitude in what seemed just minutes, and three or four of the fighters rolled in on the bomber from his eleven o'clock, sweeping from his left to right. One of the Japanese aircraft came in higher than the others, its right wing slightly up and left wing slightly down, firing as it came. Houston could see the flashes of its guns, and he held his own fire until the fighter was so close he could hardly miss. When the attacker's image filled his optical gun sight, Houston pulled the triggers on his twin fifties, and despite their slow cyclic rate, they spewed out more than enough rounds to do the job. Houston saw his bullets chew into the fighter's engine, cockpit area, and forward fuselage, 
and at about 100 feet behind the Dominator, the attacker exploded, seeming to disintegrate completely before Houston's eyes. The young gunner barely had time to exclaim, I got him, over the intercom, before turning his guns on yet another incoming fighter. In the nose turret, Keller was finding it harder than it should have been to engage fighters coming in from 12 o'clock. Although his guns would hydraulically elevate and depress normally, he had to rotate the turret itself by turning an auxiliary hand crank. He therefore tried to determine the incoming fighter's track, then cranked the turret into an area he knew the attacker would have to pass through, and started firing the single operable 50 caliber machine gun just before the target filled his gun sight. He could not crank the turret fast enough to keep the fighter in the sight, however, and he later recalled that he was just trying to throw out rounds in the hope that his tracers would force attackers to back off. Fortunately, things were going better for the top turret gunners. In the aft position, Jimmy Smart had been snap-shooting at enemy aircraft that flashed over the B-32 as they carried out beam attacks, but then concentrated his fire on a particular fighter that rolled in from three o'clock high. The plane seemed to hang in mid-air for a moment, its rounds flashing over the top of the Dominator, and Smart poured bullets into the left side of its fuselage. Rolling inverted, the fighter passed below the B-32, and as it disappeared from Smart's view, Clayworth, in the forward turret, yelled over the intercom that he'd seen the attacker explode. It was at that moment that Sadamu Komachi rolled in on 578. The Japanese pilot screamed down almost vertically toward the B-32, opening fire with his 20mm cannon when the Dominator filled his gun sight. He could see his rounds pounding into the aircraft's wings, as though, he later said, they were being sucked in. And as he flashed past, he saw that one of the bomber's engines was trailing a wispy stream of gray smoke. What he didn't notice was that one of his rounds had shattered Jimmy Smart's turret, sending jagged plexiglass shards into the young gunner's forehead and temple. Smart immediately screamed, I'm hit! and dropped from the shattered turret, startling Joe Le Charité and Tony Marchione. The two 20th Recon men had been standing with their backs to one another, looking out the small observation windows on opposite sides of the aircraft. They turned their heads toward Smart, now huddling on the fuselage floor, barely ten feet in front of them and clutching his head. And then Joe turned back to look out the window on his side, because a movement had caught his eye. To his horror, what he saw was a Japanese fighter coming right at him. When John Houston sighted the Japanese fighters closing on 578's tail, Joe Le Charité and Tony Marchione had been starting to stow the K-22 camera and its associated gear. Because of the problems with the camera's mount and its electrical control box, Rupke, the photo officer, had not been able to operate the camera remotely from his position in the aircraft's nose. As the B-32 had passed over its assigned photo targets, Rupke had therefore simply used the intercom to tell Joe when to trip the camera's shutter. Tony had been helping to steady the mount and had assisted in changing the film magazine as needed. It wasn't the ideal way to shoot aerial photos, but it was better than nothing. And when the Dominator finished its final photo run, Joe mentioned to Tony that he thought they'd gotten some usable images. Despite the closed bulkhead door that separated Houston's tail turret from the compartment where Joe and Tony were working, the two men could clearly hear the banging of the guns when Houston engaged the incoming fighters. Moreover, Smart's top turret guns were all the more audible for being barely ten feet away. Neither man was particularly bothered by the sound of the big fifty calibers pumping out rounds, or the acrid smell of gunpowder. Both were, after all, qualified aerial gunners themselves, though the reality that they could not actively help defend the aircraft in the way that they had been trained to do would certainly have added to their anxiety and frustration. One way to contribute, however, was to help the men actually on the guns to locate targets they might not otherwise be able to see. 
Because 578's ball turret was unmanned, there was no way for the men in the operable turrets to know if an enemy fighter was coming in from beneath the aircraft. Tony and Joe were both hooked into the Dominator's intercom system, of course. And by peering out the observation windows on either side of the fuselage, they could spot those aircraft and call them out to the appropriate gunner. That was what the two men had been doing when the injured Jimmy Smart unexpectedly dropped from his damaged turret. The observation window Joe had been looking through was set into 578's aft fuselage, about 28 inches above floor level. It was some two feet forward of, and three feet below, the leading edge of the Dominator's starboard horizontal stabilizer. Roughly oval in shape, and about thirty inches across at its widest point, the window was made of plexiglass, and was intended as a way for crew members to scan the rear of the starboard wing, its two engines, and the main landing gear on that side. Directly below the window, right next to and just to the right of the belly entrance hatch, that also served as the aircraft's main camera position, was a smaller optical glass port, intended for use with an obliquely mounted aerial camera. Even as the image of the incoming Japanese fighter in the large observation window was registering in Joe's mind, 7.7 millimeter machine gun rounds from a second unseen fighter coming in from three o'clock low punched through the lower right corner of the small camera port, shattered the optical glass, and slammed into Joe. One bullet tore completely through his left leg, just above the kneecap, exiting out the back of his thigh, and four others lodged in his right leg between the ankle and knee. The impact spun the photographer around, and he fell to the floor of the aircraft, just forward of the small door leading back to the tail and Houston's turret, blood already streaming from his mangled legs. The fall had jerked Joe's intercom cord from the jack it had been plugged into, and Tony, who had been kneeling on the folded-down settee and looking out the portside observation window set into the fuselage just above it, was following the track of an incoming Japanese fighter, and was momentarily unaware that Joe had been hit. But Jimmy Smart, still lying beneath his turret and attempting to stop the bleeding from his head wounds, saw Joe sprawled on the floor and called out to Tony over the intercom. Luckily, Joe had fallen right next to the barracks bag carrying his and Tony's equipment, and he was able to yank the braided cotton closure cord from the top of the bag and hurriedly tie it around his left thigh as a tourniquet. He was struggling to wrap the now disconnected intercom cord around his right leg when Tony, having turned away from the observation window, carefully lifted Joe onto the settee and then, kneeling down, began tightening the second tourniquet himself. As he was doing this, Tony announced over the intercom that Joe had been wounded, and from the cockpit, Anderson said he would send Rupke back to help. Tony had just acknowledged the pilot's transmission when a 20 millimeter cannon round punched a ragged, double fist sized hole through the B 32's thin aluminum skin just above and slightly forward of the port side observation window. The projectile slammed into Tony almost squarely in the center of his chest, driving him backward. He hit the opposite side of the fuselage and crumpled to the floor, his legs splayed out toward the settee and his head resting near the shattered optical glass port. Joe, immobilized on the settee, and now also pierced by razor-sharp splinters of the Dominator's aluminum skin, could do nothing but gesture helplessly to Smart. Seconds later, Rupke, having made his way across the narrow Bombay catwalk that connected the forward and aft crew compartments, came through the bulkhead door forward of Smart's turret. Seeing that the upper gunner's injuries weren't life-threatening, the photo officer rushed past Joe to Tony, medical aid kit in hand, instinctively seeking to help the more badly injured long-time crewmate he considered one of his own. When Rupke knelt next to Tony, the young man was still alive and conscious, though he was surrounded by a spreading pool of blood, at least some of which was coming from a partial exit wound in his back. The twenty-millimeter round had struck him just below the sternum, 
shattering several of his ribs and shoving shredded bits of his fleece-lined flight jacket and the lighter clothing beneath it into the wound. Rupke looked down at Tony, and despite the obvious extent and severity of the young gunner's wounds, told him everything was going to be all right. Likely aware that things weren't going to be all right, Tony looked up at Rupke and managed to whisper, Stay with me. Yes, I'll stay with you, the photo officer replied, gently taking Tony in his arms. At that point, Houston came through the small door from the tail section, and he and Smart, himself still bleeding, did what they could to help Joe, applying compression bandages to his legs after attempting to get sulfur powder into his wounds, despite the frigid wind blowing into the aircraft's fuselage through the bullet and cannon shell holes. Minutes later, the B-32's navigator, 2nd Lieutenant Thomas Robinson, and radar officer, 2nd Lieutenant Donald H. Smith, arrived and covered Joe and Tony with blankets. They cut away part of the sleeve on one arm of the young gunner's flight jacket and started a line for blood plasma, then tried to stanch the bleeding from both the massive hole in his chest and the smaller exit wound in the middle of his back, just to one side of his spine. Despite everyone's best efforts, however, Tony Marchione died about thirty minutes after he was hit, and just six days past his twentieth birthday. Even as Rupke and the others were dealing with Joe and Tony's wounds, the men still in the forward part of the Dominator had their own hands full. In addition to wounding Jimmy Smart, Sadamu Komachi's attack had knocked out the B-32's number three engine, which immediately started trailing smoke and throwing oil over the right side of the aircraft's fuselage. Under normal circumstances, the pilot, John Anderson, would have feathered the propeller, that is, turned the blade's edge on into the airstream to prevent the prop from continuing to rotate and possibly further damaging the engine. But he didn't want to signal to the attacking Japanese that the engine was completely dead, so he triggered the power plant's internal fire extinguisher and let the propeller windmill. The tactic wasn't quite as successful as Anderson had hoped it would be, however, for the pilots of several of the fighters saw the smoke before it dissipated and quickly launched the concentrated attacks that resulted in the injuries to Joe and Tony. Realizing that more radical measures were required, Anderson and co-pilot 2nd Lieutenant Richard E. Thomas advanced the throttles on 578's three remaining engines and put the B-32 into a steep descent, like Klein in Hobo Queen II, hoping to outrun the enemy interceptors. As 578 dropped, rapidly picking up speed, the Japanese fighters fell further behind. They tossed rounds at the big bomber from increasingly longer range, hoping for a lucky hit, then gave up the chase one by one and turned back toward Atsugi and Opama. But Sadamu Komachi wasn't so easily deterred. After completing his near-vertical attack on the B-32, the Japanese ace had needed several minutes to pull his fighter out of its dive, reverse direction, and head back toward the rapidly disappearing American plane. His pull-out and course reversal had put Komachi off to the side of the Dominator's track rather than directly after the bomber, and by cutting the corner at maximum speed, he was able to gradually gain on his quarry. By the time Komachi came within firing range of 578, the Dominator was barely 1,000 feet above the water and well out to sea to the east of Oshima Island. Because there was not enough room to make another vertical attack and recover in time to avoid crashing into the water, Komachi decided to come in on a beam run. The maneuver was probably not his best decision, however, for in swinging his fighter wide in preparation for the attack, he lost position and airspeed relative to the B-32. Komachi thus ended up having to fire from beyond the ideal range, and only managed to put a few rounds into 578's rudder trim tab before the Dominator again accelerated away from him. Alone and vulnerable to any Allied fighters that might be in the vicinity, Komachi finally gave up and turned for home. 
Though John Anderson and the men aboard his B-32 were obviously relieved by the departure of their last dogged pursuer, they were by no means out of the woods yet. They were still facing another six hours in the air, at least, and the Dominator was down to three good engines. After radioing Yontan with news of the attack, the wounding of Smart and La Charité, and the death of Tony Marchione, Anderson warned his crew that they might have to bail out and directed everyone to put on their parachutes. But as the hours passed, it seemed more certain that the aircraft would make it all the way back to Okinawa, and everyone tried to relax as much as possible. Conversations sprang up over the intercom, with one of the prime topics of discussion being the reason why the Japanese pilots had seemed to concentrate their most determined attacks on the Dominator's waste section. The best answer, the crew members agreed, came from Burton Keller. The nose gunner expressed the opinion that the enemy attackers must have either mistaken the B-32 for a B-29, or at least assumed the Dominator had the same sort of unmanned gun turrets. The Super Fortress's gunners sat behind large plexiglass observation bubbles in the aircraft's waist, Keller reminded his listeners, and acquired and tracked targets with sights that remotely controlled the guns. Japanese pilots had learned that by concentrating their initial attacks on the B-29's waste bubbles, they could kill or disable the gunners, thereby rendering the superfortress defenseless. Other than the B-29, the only Allied bomber most Japanese pilots had encountered in any numbers in the previous three years, was the twin-tailed B-24. And when they saw the tall single tail on the B-32, they probably assumed it was a variant of the B-29. Robinson and Smith spent the return flight to Okinawa in the Dominator's aft compartment, caring for Joe Le Charité. The photographer's injuries were extremely serious. He'd lost a lot of blood, and the bones in both of his legs had been splintered by the Japanese bullets. And his pain was so intense that the two young officers had injected him with at least two morphine sorettes. Joe was in and out of consciousness for several hours, and at one point his respiration was so shallow it appeared he might not survive. After reverently wrapping Tony Marchione's body in blankets and helping to lay it carefully near the bulkhead door leading to the B-32's Bombay catwalk, Kurt Rupke had returned to the cramped nose compartment. Heartbroken by the death of a young man with whom he had trained and flown for months, someone he considered a good friend, despite the difference in their ranks, ages, and backgrounds. Rupke was also angry beyond words. From the moment he'd climbed aboard the Dominator that morning, the young photo officer had believed that the aircraft was totally unsuited for the mission it was tasked to undertake. The inoperable or mechanically impaired turrets and guns were bad enough, he believed. But sending an airplane on a photo recon mission, when its camera mount and vital associated systems were essentially out of commission, was almost criminally stupid. The airplane might have been fit for flight, Rupke seethed, but that was all it was fit for. Tony had been one of his boys, and his death had been completely avoidable and absolutely unnecessary. The crew of 578 sighted Yontan Airfield, almost exactly twelve hours after taking off on their ill-fated mission. Anderson wanted to avoid banking his damaged aircraft into the dead engine, so he flew a non-standard approach and ended up coming in a little higher and faster than usual. As the aircraft rolled out and turned slowly onto the taxiway, several field ambulances fell into line behind it. Anderson stopped the aircraft before reaching its assigned hard stand, and medics jumped from the ambulances and swarmed aboard through the Dominator's belly hatch. They helped Jimmy Smart out the same way, then carefully took Joe Le Charité and Tony Marchione's body out through the opened bomb bay. As they were doing so, the B-32 was surrounded by a huge crowd of people, a crowd that, as Keller later remembered, included reporters, G.I.s, and every colonel in the Fifth Air Force. 
The Dominator's tired, dispirited crewmen were hustled from their aircraft and into the same briefing tent they'd sat in what seemed like days earlier, but had in reality been just that morning. There they joined the men from Hobo Queen Two, which had landed earlier, and once settled with mugs of coffee and plates of sandwiches. The young airmen faced a barrage of questions, intended to answer one very important question. Was this attack just another aberration carried out by a few diehards? Or was it an indication that the war wasn't over? Chapter 6 Peace or War The crowd that thronged 578 upon its return to Yontan had begun gathering hours earlier in response to contact reports sent even as the attack on the two B-32s was still underway. When the first Japanese fighter rolled in on Hobo Queen II, James Klein had ordered his radio operator, Technical Sergeant Leslie Christensen, to send an in-the-clear, non-encrypted message to the 386th Bomb Squadron's communication center announcing the interception. Minutes later, as 578 came under fire, John Anderson had issued similar orders to his radioman, Sergeant Darrell Champlin. A second transmission regarding the wounding of Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité and the death of Tony Marchion followed. And by the time the two Dominators had shaken their pursuers and begun the long flight back to Okinawa, news of the attack was pulsing across the airwaves from Yontan to MacArthur's headquarters in Manila, and from Manila to Washington. Rudy Pugliese, the 386th Assistant Intelligence Officer, was among the first people at Yontan to learn just how much anxiety the news had stirred up among senior leaders. Barely minutes after Klein's message was relayed up the chain of command, Pugliese, who was manning the incoming phone lines while Bill Barnes was briefing Salmon Wells, Frank Cook, and Tony Sforey, took a call from Fief Commander George Kenny who asked if there was any additional information about the attack. While the young intelligence officer responded that there was nothing yet, Kenny said he wanted to know immediately when the aircraft landed, and more important, what the air crew debriefings revealed, and added that MacArthur was at his side. As Pugliese recounted later, when a three-star general says a five-star general is waiting, you hop. The urgent concern shown by both Kenny and MacArthur regarding the interception of the B-32s and the casualties those attacks caused was heightened by the news that the 20th Recon Squadron F-7Bs dispatched to Tokyo had also encountered unexpected Japanese resistance. The three aircraft, a fuel leak had forced the fourth machine to abort, had been tracked by early warning radars on the approach to their photo targets in and around Yokohama. As they started their runs, they were painted by gun-laying radars and were then subjected to heavy, continuous, and unusually accurate 120mm anti-aircraft fire. The Liberators took evasive action, but at least one suffered multiple hits. There were no casualties and no fighter interceptions, though it is possible that the F-7Bs had avoided the latter hazard because they arrived over their targets after the B-32s had drawn off those 302nd Air Group and Yokoku pilots still willing to take to the air. Kenny and MacArthur were not the only people anxious for information about the attack on the B-32s. Military and civilian reporters had descended on the 386th headquarters compound the previous day in response to the actions involving the four Dominators and they began returning as word started to circulate around Yontan that another attack had occurred, this time resulting in American casualties. Several of the newsmen sought out Rudy Pugliese, badgering him for details that he was honestly able to tell them he didn't yet have. They, like everyone else, the young officer said, would have to wait until the two B-32s had landed and their crews had been debriefed. Although it was almost certainly not the answer the reporters were looking for, they, like everyone else, had no choice but to settle in 
and wait for Hobo Queen 2 and 578 to return. Army Air Force's post-mission combat aircrew debriefings were conducted in much the same way in all World War II theaters, no matter what type of unit was involved. Also referred to as interrogations, the interviews were meant to provide both intelligence and operational information. The former would include such things as the number, type, and markings of enemy aircraft encountered, enemy losses, both confirmed and probable, the approximate location of friendly airmen forced to bail out, the damage inflicted on ground targets through bombing or strafing, new enemy installations sighted, the accuracy of pre-mission briefings, and so on. The operational data sought, while somewhat less dramatic, was equally important in that it dealt with the mechanical reliability of the friendly aircraft, ways in which the airplane systems or crew interactions could be improved, the accuracy of weather forecasts, and the like. The officers on an individual crew were normally interviewed separately from their enlisted men, though before being debriefed, every member of the crew, no matter his rank, was offered the same small shot of whiskey. This last amenity was usually welcomed, for even those missions that did not provoke a hostile response or result in friendly losses could leave crew members physically exhausted, yet so mentally keyed up that they were unable to relax. And of course, if the mission involved enemy action or the injury or death of other crewmen, the individual being debriefed might well be emotionally shattered. The crews of Hobo Queen 2 and 578 faced all the usual questions during the interrogations that followed their return to Yontan. But they were also asked to respond to some decidedly out-of-the-ordinary queries. Could they somehow have avoided the attack? Did they think the Japanese pilots had been receiving instructions from ground controllers? Could they identify the individual markings of the aircraft that had wounded Smart and Le Charité and killed Marchion? The men did what they could to answer the interrogators' questions, despite being understandably bitter and emotional about the attacks. The Japanese government, after all, had publicly accepted the Allied surrender terms and agreed to the ceasefire. And the mood in the debriefing was decidedly dark. That changed somewhat, however, when Selman Wells asked the gunners from both aircraft whether they truly believed they damaged or destroyed the Japanese fighters they'd claimed. John Houston sheepishly raised his hand and said, I'm pretty sure I really got one, sir. What do you mean you're pretty sure, son? The three-twelfths commander replied. Well, sir, Houston said slowly, I was shooting at him, and he blew up. There was a moment of stunned silence. Then laughter rippled through the crowded room and quickly swelled to a crescendo. Kenny, MacArthur, and other senior officers throughout the Pacific Theater were more concerned by the attack on Hobo Queen 2 and 578, and on the F-7Bs for that matter, than they had been about the previous day's incident involving the four Dominators. The August 17 event could be explained away as the rash action of several diehard pilots. But a second and far more serious attack, which at first glance appeared to involve coordinated action by multiple fighters, radar sites, and anti-aircraft units, and that resulted in the death of one American and the wounding of two others, could well be the beginning of an organized effort on the part of Japan's military to repudiate Emperor Hirohito's decision to surrender. The United States government was aware, through both diplomatic channels and neutral news sources, of the August 15 attempted coup in Tokyo, and Allied interception and decryption of encoded Japanese radio traffic indicated that there remained significant anti-surrender sentiment among senior army commanders. Yet though the events of August 17 and 18 might have been seen as the first stirrings of a renewed Japanese war effort. MacArthur decided to follow what at the time must have seemed to many of his senior staffers to be a fairly risky course. Despite his very real anxiety about the motives for the attacks, 
the Supreme Commander Allied Powers, effectively chose to do nothing, at least for the moment. While the daily intelligence summary distributed within his command mentioned both day's incidents, and though Allied units throughout the Pacific Theater were cautioned yet again to be prepared to defend themselves, no retaliatory offensive military action was ordered against Japan or the deployed Japanese forces in MacArthur's area of command. There was no resumption of airstrikes and no renewed bombardment of coastal targets in the home islands by Allied naval forces. One possible explanation for MacArthur's decision not to immediately retaliate for either attack might have been the results of the debriefings following each mission. The crews who flew on August 17 reported that the attacks against them were uneager and seemed somewhat haphazard in their execution. And though angered by the interception of their aircraft, and saddened by the death of Tony Marchion and the wounding of Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité, the crews of 578 and Hobo Queen II agreed that the Japanese attacks against them did not seem coordinated or organized. Moreover, several of the crewmen from both days' flights pointed out that as they left the Tokyo area, their B-32s had overflown several enemy airdromes where aircraft could be seen parked in alert revetments along the runways. Yet no fighters rose from those fields to challenge the Dominators. Taken together, these observations strongly suggested that the pilots who shot up the two B-32s on August 18 were, as on the day before, diehards acting on their own initiative, rather than as part of a larger, concerted, and ground-controlled effort. As soon as the debriefings ended, Rudy Pugliese picked up the phone. A line to Kenny's headquarters had been kept open for him, and reported this key finding directly to the fief commander. It is entirely conceivable that the information helped persuade MacArthur, who was presumably still at Kenny's side, that the day's events over Tokyo, despite constituting yet another breach of the ceasefire, did not warrant a resumption of Allied combat operations against Japan. But there is another, far more likely explanation for MacArthur's decision not to react militarily to the attacks against the B-32s on either day. In his initial August 15 exchange of radio messages with Tokyo, the Supreme Commander had directed that the Japanese send to Manila a competent representative empowered to receive in the name of the Emperor of Japan, the Imperial Japanese Government, and the Japanese Imperial Headquarters, certain requirements for carrying into effect the terms of the surrender. The representative will be accompanied by competent advisors representing the Japanese Army, the Japanese Navy, and Japanese Air Forces. The latter advisor will be one thoroughly familiar with airdrome facilities in the Tokyo area. MacArthur was equally direct in instructing the Japanese government on how the delegation was to make the journey. The party will travel in a Japanese airplane to an airdrome on the island of Iashima, from which point they will be transported to Manila, Philippine Islands, in a United States airplane. They will be returned to Japan in the same manner. The party will employ an unarmed airplane. Such airplane will be painted all white and will bear upon the side of its fuselage and the top and bottom of each wing green crosses, easily recognizable at 500 yards. Weather permitting, the airplane will depart from Sata Misaki Airdrome on the southern tip of Kyushu between the hours of 0800 and 1100 Tokyo time on the 17th day of August, 1945. And in a truly MacArthurian touch, he added that in all communications regarding the flight, Tokyo was to use the code designation Batan, a reference, of course, to the Philippine Peninsula on Luzon, where on April 9, 1942, American and Filipino forces under Major General Edward P. King, Jr. had surrendered to the invading Japanese. Over the two days following the initial transmission to the Japanese of MacArthur's directive, there were various alterations in the delegation's itinerary. 
and a second appropriately marked aircraft was added for the journey. The day finally agreed upon for the flight was August 19, with a Japanese delegation slated to land at Ieshima at about 1.30 p.m. None of the messages that went back and forth between Manila and Tokyo on the 17th mentioned the attack on the four B-32s over Tokyo. And it is likely that MacArthur was waiting to see if the Japanese canceled the delegation's trip following the August 18 interception of Hobo Queen 2 and 578. If that happened, he must have reasoned, it would be a strong indication that the attacks were part of a broader Japanese effort to repudiate the Emperor's surrender decision and continue the war. In that case he could certainly order the resumption of offensive action against the home islands. But if, on the other hand, the Japanese delegation carried through with the trip to Manila, it would be a clear sign that the August 17 and 18 attacks on the two dominators, and the death of Tony Marchione and the wounding of Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité on the latter mission, had been the work of a relatively few diehards. And if that were the case it would be up to the Japanese to deal with the hotheads. And any renewed Allied bombardment would likely only prolong the mutiny and further complicate the surrender negotiations and the planning for the occupation. Although it was certainly something of a gamble, MacArthur's decision to delay any retaliation for the two consecutive days of attacks on the 386th Dominators was validated on the morning of August 19. Just after 6 a.m., a 16-member delegation, led by Vice Chief of the General Staff, Lieutenant General Torashiro Kawabe, boarded a Showa Nakajima L2D twin-engine transport at Haneda Airport on the west side of Tokyo Bay. Fourteen minutes later, the aircraft, a Japanese version of the American C-47 transport, landed at the Navy airfield at Kisaruzu just across the bay in Chiba Prefecture. There, the Manila-bound delegates were split into two eight-man groups, with each then clambering aboard a Navy Mitsubishi twin-engine aircraft known to the Allies as the Betty. The two machines, a G6M1 L2 transport variant, Batan-1, and a demilitarized G4M1 bomber, Batan-2, were both painted white, and bore the green wing, tail, and fuselage crosses stipulated in MacArthur's directive. The planes lifted off from Kisaruzu at 7.07 a.m. and flew southwest, skirting the southern coasts of Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. Just after 11 o'clock, the Japanese aircraft passed Sata Misaki, the southernmost point on Kyushu, and were joined by their American escort, two B-25J Mitchells of the 345th Bomb Group and a gaggle of P-38 Lightnings of the 49th Fighter Group. The onward flight to Ieshima was uneventful, and the first Betty landed at 1240. After a short time on the ground, the 16 delegates boarded an Army Air Force's C-45E four-engine transport for the onward flight to Manila. MacArthur's gamble had paid off. The arrival of the Kawabe delegation in Manila was a certain indication that Japan would indeed surrender, and that the August 17 and 18 attacks on the B-32s had been the work of mutinous individuals rather than part of a larger conspiracy to renew hostilities. And while MacArthur couldn't have known it, the mere fact that the two Bettys bearing the 16-man delegation had made it to Ieshima without being shot down by their own side, was something of a victory as well. The pilots of the Atsugi-based 302nd Air Group, who had taken part in the August 17 and 18 attacks on the B-32s over the Kanto Plain, did so with the hearty encouragement of their commander, Yasuna Kozuno. Though increasingly debilitated by both malaria and near-constant infusions of sake, the father of Japanese night fighters, had lost none of his anti-surrender zeal. Indeed, not only did the veteran aviator spur his pilots to continue the fight against the Allies, he took steps intended to prevent Kawabe's delegation 
from ever making what he saw as the treasonous journey to Manila, dictated by MacArthur. It is unclear how Cozano learned of the proposed trip, but we do know that on August 16, he contacted Captain Hiroshi Kogure, the Yokoku's chief flight officer and a fellow anti-surrender zealot, and suggested that between them they could keep the Kawabe delegation from dishonoring Japan. They would accomplish that patriotic act, he said, through the simple expedient of jointly establishing an aerial picket line over the Kanto Plain. Fighters from Atsugi and Opama, flying alternating patrols over the region, would shoot down any aircraft that lifted off from a Tokyo-area airfield, bearing the all-white paint scheme and green crosses, mandated in the Allied diktat. Because the members of the delegation were, in Kozono's view, traitors to both the nation and the emperor, there would be no shame in killing them. Ironically, Kozono's scheme to prevent the Kawabe delegation from leaving Japanese airspace was discovered and ultimately thwarted by a man who until just days before had himself been conspiring with both the 302nd Air Group commander and the Yokoku's Kogure to prevent the nation's capitulation. Captain Mitsuo Fuchida was a living legend in the Imperial Japanese Navy, renowned as the aviator who had led the first wave of the attack on Pearl Harbor and then participated in many of the early key battles of the Pacific War. By August 1945, the 43-year-old Fuchida was the senior aviation officer in the headquarters of the Combined Fleet, the Navy's primary ocean-going component. Deeply patriotic, he was initially horrified when he learned of the Emperor's decision to accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. On August 12, an Army liaison officer with whom Fuchida worked, Lieutenant Colonel Yoshida, approached the naval aviator about joining a coup d'etat intended to prevent the nation's surrender. Fuchida immediately threw his support behind the plot, and after securing the backing of Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi, the Vice Chief of the Navy's General Staff and an ardent proponent of the kamikazes, the aviator reached out to his longtime friends Kozono and Kogure. Both officers readily joined the conspiracy, pledging that their respective units could be counted upon to continue the fight against the Allies and to offer whatever aerial support the coup plotters might require. Fuchida's enthusiasm for the coup d'etat died, however, within 24 hours of its birth. On August 13, as he was on his way to a meeting with Onishi, Fuchida was buttonholed in a corridor of the Naval General Staff Building by Emperor Hirohito's younger brother, Prince Takamatsu. A Navy captain himself, and a classmate of Fuchida's years earlier at Etajima, the Japanese Naval Academy, the Prince obviously knew of the planned coup and of Fuchida's role in helping to plan it. Gazing intently at the aviator, Takamatsu said he had just returned from a meeting with the Emperor and was convinced of Hirohito's sincerity in wanting to pursue the surrender as the best way to prevent further bombings like those that had engulfed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Fuchida had been part of the Navy team sent to Hiroshima immediately following its obliteration, and Takamatsu's statement apparently struck home. Fuchida later recalled that at that moment, he realized the only remaining thing in his life with any real meaning was his ability to help fulfill the Emperor's will. To do that, he would have to reverse course completely and help quash the revolt that he had helped put into motion. Over the following two days, Fuchida used his position and personal prestige to convince several fellow officers in key positions to withdraw their support for the coup, and his efforts may well have contributed significantly to the revolt's ultimate failure on the night of August 14-15. However, when on the 16th, Fuchida was put in charge of arranging the details of the Kawabe delegation's flight to Manila, he had to directly confront the two men whom he himself had brought into the conspiracy. 
Fujita called the Yokoku's chief flight officer to requisition the unit's Showa Nakajima L2D for the delegation's short hop across Tokyo Bay from Haneda to Kisarazu, and was stunned to learn that Kogure was still refusing to accept reality despite the failure of the coup. The men of the Yokoku would continue to engage any Allied aircraft that dared to violate Japanese airspace, Kogure said, and added that an aerial picket line intended to prevent the departure of Kawabe's delegation was even then being put in place in cooperation with Kozono's 302nd Air Group. Realizing that Kogure was likely just following Kozono's lead, Fuchida decided to go to Atsugi personally to convince his hot-headed friend that further resistance to the Emperor's wishes was dishonorable, and that continued attacks on Allied aircraft, despite the ceasefire, could well result in the dropping of a third atomic bomb. Well aware that words would probably not sway the 302nd Air Group commander, Fuchida climbed into his staff car just after noon on August 18, wearing his sword and carrying a loaded pistol. Though he hoped Kozuno would see reason and cease his resistance to the surrender, Fuchida was willing to kill his old friend if it became necessary. The inherent danger of the task ahead was brought home to Fuchida when his driver halted the staff car outside Atsugi's main gate. Sandbagged machine gun emplacements manned by helmeted sailors guarded either side of the entrance, which was also blocked by wooden barricades strung with barbed wire. As Fuchida stepped from the car and slowly approached the gate, his hands in plain sight, the petty officer in charge of the gate guards walked forward and, noting his visitor's rank, saluted smartly. Encouraged by this sign of military discipline, Fuchida smiled, identified himself, and announced that he'd come to meet with Kozuno. The petty officer replied that he knew who Fuchida was, and turned to signal his men to open the gate and remove the barriers. As he was climbing back into the staff car, the senior aviator asked that the petty officer not announce his arrival to Kozuno, whom Fuchida assumed would not be overly pleased to see him. Fortunately, the first man Fuchida encountered in the base headquarters building was Lieutenant Commander Toshio Hashizumi, an old acquaintance who also happened to be Kozuno's executive officer. Initially somewhat startled at Fuchida's sudden appearance, the younger man quickly regained his composure and asked how he might be of service. When Fuchida said that he'd come to speak with Kozuno and asked about the 302nd commander's state of mind, Hashizumi responded that Kozuno was ill, had been drinking heavily, and seemed headed for a mental breakdown. Fuchida immediately saw a way to resolve the crisis at Atsugi, without resorting to violence. He first secured Hashizumi's promise of support, then ordered the younger man to summon an ambulance. That done, the two officers waited until the ambulance arrived, and then walked to the door of Kozuno's quarters. Pausing for a moment to steal themselves, the men then burst into the room, seized Kozuno, and wrestled him to the floor before he could draw his sword. Though bellowing like an enraged bull, the 302nd commander could not free himself. And at Fuchida's command, the ambulance orderlies stormed in, quickly buckled the father of Japanese night fighters into a straitjacket, and then rushed him to the ambulance for the drive to the mental ward at Yokosuka Naval Hospital. In one stroke, Fuchida had eliminated possibly the greatest obstacle to Japan's surrender, without drawing a single drop of blood. After a quick call to announce Kozuno's departure to Kogure, Fuchida secured the latter's promise to stand the Yokoku pilots down, end the aerial picket line meant to stop the Kawabe delegation's departure from Manila, and disable all remaining flyable aircraft at Opama. That done, Fuchida then assumed temporary command of Atsugi, and ordered Hashizumi to call all of the base's personnel together 
in the vast open area behind the operations building. There, shortly before 2 p.m., Fuchida announced to the assembled men, some of whom had only just returned from the attacks on Hobo Queen 2 and 578, that they were to suspend all operations, give up their personal weapons, and begin removing the guns and propellers from all aircraft present on the sprawling installation. Fuchida remained on the base through the afternoon and into the evening to ensure that his orders were being followed, and after turning security for the airfield over to a loyal army unit, headed back to Tokyo. Though eighteen of Atsugi's younger and more volatile pilots ignored Fuchida's orders and flew their aircraft to army bases where they believed, incorrectly as it turned out, that they would find like-minded aviators willing to continue the fight. Atsugi itself was secure. Several miles to the south, the pilots of the Yokoku were also in the final hours of their war. By the time Sadamu Komachi had finally given up his pursuit of John Anderson's B-32, the Japanese pilot was some twenty miles off the east coast of the Boso Peninsula and near Oshima Island. Believing that he might at any moment be bounced by U.S. Navy carrier aircraft, Komachi had pushed his throttle to the stops in order to regain the relative safety of the Japanese mainland as quickly as he could. On the flight back to Opama, the veteran pilot had time to consider the ramifications of the fight in which he'd just participated. The conclusion of every previous engagement in his eventful career, whether he'd downed an enemy aircraft or simply managed to make it back to base uninjured and with his fighter undamaged, had been a cause for satisfaction. He'd always taken great pride in his skills, and in the fact that he'd put them to good use for his nation and his emperor. But something was different now. As he later expressed it, by taking part in the post-ceasefire interception, he'd defiantly and enthusiastically disobeyed the direct orders of his military leaders. And far worse, he'd become a traitor against his majesty. The sense of pride, accomplishment, and exultation that he'd always felt after engaging his nation's enemies had evaporated almost as soon as he turned away from the damaged American bomber, to be replaced by an ineffable sadness, and the growing realization that he'd allowed his hunter's instincts to dishonor him, his country, and his emperor. These thoughts were still with Komachi, as he negotiated the tricky crosswind approach to Opama. After landing, he taxied his fighter to its revetment, noting as he did so that he was apparently the last to return from the sortie against the American aircraft. He shut down his plane's engine and climbed from the cockpit, then walked slowly back to the base command post, enveloped in silence, and, as he later recalled, recognizing the crime he felt he had just committed. His dark mood was matched by those of the other aviators and ground personnel gathered in the briefing area, for they had just been personally informed by both the Yokoku's Kogure and the admiral in charge of the entire Yokosuka Naval District that their war was now definitively and irrevocably over. At that very moment, ground crewmen were beginning to empty the fuel tanks and remove the propellers of all the base's aircraft. Although no charges were to be filed against the pilots who had taken part of the interceptions that day and the day before, the Admiral said, any further acts of defiance against the Emperor's decision and the orders of the Navy's senior leaders would be considered mutiny and would be dealt with as harshly as naval regulations allowed. The following morning, even as the Japanese delegation was winging its way to Ieshima on the first leg of the flight to Manila, Komachi and his fellow Yokoku pilots got news none had ever expected to receive. Having been called together for another meeting with Kogure, the airmen were abruptly told that their naval careers were over as of that moment. They were directed to leave Opama immediately and return to their hometowns.
an instruction Komachi and many of the others believed was specifically intended to keep them from undertaking any further mayhem against Allied forces. The commander did not express it directly, but he also implied that the men might want to destroy any official records in their possession, in case the victors should decide to prosecute them for their wartime actions, or for their post-ceasefire interceptions of the American bombers. That chilling intimation was followed by what most of the aviators likely perceived as a final slap in the face. Although they would be able to travel home by train for free if they wore their uniforms, they would not receive any final pay or allowances. They would walk out Obama's front gate with only the money they already had in their pockets, which for most amounted to only a handful of increasingly worthless yen. It was an ignominious end to the careers of some of the finest and most combat-experienced aviators in the Imperial Japanese Navy and one that most probably felt dishonored them and their years of service and sacrifice. For Sadamu Komachi, virtually penniless and seemingly without a future at the age of just 25, the sad train ride to his parents' home in Ishikawa Prefecture on the northwestern coast of Honshu was made even worse by his growing fears that when the Allies occupied Japan, they would come looking for him. His exploits as a fighter pilot had been widely publicized, after all, and he assumed that the victors would want to make an example of him. Perhaps, he thought, they would even execute him for his role in the post-ceasefire attacks against the giant aircraft over Tokyo. Gazing out the window at the passing landscape, he ultimately decided that it would be best for him and for his family if he simply disappeared for a while. As the Navy pilots at Atsugi and Opama were dealing with the harsh and growing realities of defeat, the airmen of the 386th Bomb Squadron were helping to prepare for the most visible manifestation of the Allies' victory, the occupation of Japan. Planning for that momentous operation had begun, of course, long before Tokyo's acceptance of the capitulation terms set forth in the Potsdam Declaration. As early as May 1945, members of MacArthur's staff had begun formulating Operation Blacklist, a contingency plan that was to be put into effect should Japan suddenly collapse and surrender before the Allies could launch their planned two-phase invasion, Operations Olympic and Coronet. Blacklist's primary goals were almost identical to those of the intended armed invasion, and included the early introduction of occupying forces into major strategic areas, the control of critical ports, port facilities, and airfields, and the demobilization and disarmament of enemy troops. Moreover, Blacklist would use all the American forces available in the Pacific Theater at the time of its execution. Just in terms of ground troops, this would amount to some 22 divisions and two regimental combat teams, totaling more than 700,000 men. Japan proper was to be the first priority, followed by Korea, and then by Formosa and the Japanese-controlled parts of China. As Supreme Commander Allied Powers, MacArthur would have the final authority to designate the place and time of the actual surrender ceremony, as well as to set the date for the beginning of the occupation, Blacklist had been presented to and approved by the various Pacific Theater service commanders at a July 1945 conference on Guam. The details of Blacklist were communicated to the Japanese during the first night session of the August 1920 conference in Manila between Kawabe's delegation and MacArthur's team, headed by his chief of staff, Lieutenant General Richard K. Sutherland. The Japanese were told that a small Allied advance unit would land at Atsugi on August 23 and would be followed two days later by the lead elements of the larger formations tapped for occupation duty. Kawabe was horrified by the thought that the largest kamikaze training airfield in Japan was to be the first place Allied troops would set foot. 
but when he told the Americans that the air station had been in open revolt and was likely still a center of anti-surrender fervor, he was merely given extra time to get the situation under control. The arrival of the advance unit at Atsugi was therefore rescheduled for the 26th, with the large-scale landings to commence on the 28th. The B-32s of the 386th Bomb Squadron were tapped to play a small but important role in the arrival in Japan of the lead occupation units. The Dominator's mission, as laid out by 5 Bomber Command, was twofold. The Big Bomber's primary task would be to help provide reconnaissance coverage of the Atsugi, Yokosuka, Yokohama area, the region that would be the first to come under Allied control. Images taken by 20th Recon Squadron photographers aboard the Dominators would help senior leaders determine if the Japanese were following MacArthur's orders to disable their anti-aircraft weapons and prepare the various installations for handover to the incoming occupation forces. Once those units had begun landing in Japan, the B-32s would take on an additional mission. Each aircraft flying recon over the Tokyo area from August 26 on, would carry four 500-pound bombs. If the occupation troops encountered any armed opposition from Japanese forces, the Dominators would drop their ordnance on pre-assigned targets throughout the Kanto Plain. The first B-32 sortie in direct support of the occupation was flown on August 25, the day before the scheduled landing of the advance party at Atsugi. Four Dominators, 528, Hobo Queen II, Harriet's Chariot, and 544, were to photograph the Navy airfield and the area between it and the sprawling Yokohama-Yokosuka Harbor Complex. In addition to documenting Japanese compliance with MacArthur's directives, the aircraft were also to record the condition of the major road and rail networks linking the Atsugi region with Tokyo. 25 miles to the northeast. This latter tasking was meant to help planners determine the most direct and least obstructed route by which the lead American units could make the journey from the airfield to the capital. The August 25 mission started well enough, with all four Dominators airborne by 7 a.m. The gremlins that seemed to inhabit the 386th Big Bombers soon reared their heads, however, for just minutes after lifting off from Yontan. Harriet's chariot was forced to abort the flight, because its main landing gear would not retract. Barely a half hour later, the venerable Hobo Queen II also had to turn back, because of a severe oil leak in its number three engine, and a runaway turbo supercharger in number one. The other two B 32s plowed on, though as the flight unfolded, they encountered increasingly bad weather from Typhoon Ruth a Category 1 storm that had originated in the Philippines on August 22 and was moving swiftly northward. The pilot of 528 chose to abort the mission about two hours short of the target area. And though 544 continued the flight, her crew found that extremely heavy cloud cover over the entire Kanto Plain region made photography impossible. The Dominator turned back for Okinawa and managed to land just before Yontan itself was closed down by heavy rain, zero visibility, and winds gusting at more than 100 miles an hour. Typhoon Ruth's arrival over southern Japan had broader consequences for the scheduled beginning of the occupation, of course. The extremely high winds and complete lack of visibility would make it impossible for the cargo aircraft bearing the advance party to land at Atsugi and the mountainous seas pounding the entrance to Tokyo Bay would not only hamper navigation through the twisting and relatively narrow channel, they could well set loose many of the sea mines anchored in protective fields off Japan's southern coast, endangering the Allied ships that would carry occupation troops. From MacArthur's point of view, the only logical decision was to postpone both the landing of the advance party and the arrival of the main units. The former was therefore pushed back to August 28, and the latter to the 30th. The delay did little to improve the mechanical reliability of the 386th Dominators, however. 
The diminishing effects of the typhoon allowed Harriet's chariot, her gear issues supposedly resolved, and 578, to take off from Yontan early on August 27, in an effort to acquire the imagery that was not obtained two days earlier. But hardly had Harriet's chariot lifted into the air, when her crew realized that her main landing gear, which had operated perfectly on a post-repair test flight the previous day, would not retract again. As the B-32 reversed course to re-enter the Yontan landing pattern, the men aboard 578 discovered that they had gear problems of their own. Their aircraft's nose wheel was jammed in the down position, forcing the Dominator to return to base and resulting in the mission's cancellation. Though a cascading variety of mechanical problems increasingly dogged the 386th small fleet of B-32s, Operational necessity ensured that the squadron's maintenance personnel worked day and night to keep as many Dominators as possible fit for flight. The importance of the work done by the engine and airframe mechanics, electronic specialists, and other maintainers was underlined early on the evening of August 27, when a tasking order came down to the 386th from 5 Bomber Command. The two-part directive called for four Dominators to be in the air the next day in support of the arrival at Atsugi of the Occupation Forces Advance Team. The first part of the order directed that two B-32s orbit over Atsugi beginning at 9 a.m. on the 28th to act as radio relay platforms to ensure uninterrupted communications between the advance team and higher headquarters on Okinawa and in Manila. The two Dominators tapped for the Kamo work, Hobo Queen 2 and 544, would carry full combat loads of ammunition for their gun turrets, but only long-range auxiliary fuel tanks in their bomb bays. The second part of the order, tasked 528 and 578, to continue photographing key areas of the Kanto plane, again giving priority to roads, railway lines, and other transportation infrastructure. Unlike the two radio relay aircraft, however, the photo recon dominators would each be carrying four 500-pound bombs, in addition to their loaded guns, just in case. The arrival of the tasking order caused the usual flurry of activity in the 386th headquarters, as staff officers hurried to get all mission preparations underway in time for the required 5.45 a.m. takeoff of the two radio relay aircraft. But the directive also piqued the curiosity of Wisconsin-born Captain Woodrow H. Hauser. As the 386th longtime communications officer, it was the 26-year-old's responsibility to choose the radio operators who would fly aboard the two Dominators orbiting above Atsugi. He did so, but then made what was undeniably the worst decision of his life. Having never seen Japan from the air, nor flown in a B-32, the young officer apparently decided that he could kill both birds with one stone, simply by riding along on the radio relay mission in his official capacity. Hauser chose to add his name to the crew manifest for 544, because he was good friends with the man chosen to pilot the Dominator, First Lieutenant Leonard M. Sill. Friendship was also the presumed reason why Hauser then reached out to three friends and fellow 386 staff officers, whose jobs normally kept them on the ground. The first two, 24-year-old Squadron Intelligence Officer Bill Barnes, and 27-year-old gunnery officer, 1st Lieutenant Kenneth C. Maul, both readily agreed to go along on the flight. Hauser and Barnes then broached the idea to their tentmate, Rudy Pugliese, saying it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Tokyo from the air. They acknowledged that it would be a long flight, but pointed out there would be no danger from the Japanese. Pugliese was tempted to go along, but the fact that the man he'd replaced had been killed while flying on a supposedly safe mission helped to dissuade him, and he finally decided to stay at Yontan 
and take care of the store in Barnes's absence. The names of Hauser, Barnes, and Mall were added to 544's crew manifest for the radio relay flight, which meant that given the mission's non-combatant nature, two other men were scratched from the flight. One was the bombardier most often assigned to Sill's crew, and the other was Second Lieutenant John Blackburn, the young radar countermeasures officer who had flown aboard the B-32 piloted by James Klein during the ill-fated August 18 mission. They were not told of the change in plans until just a few hours before the scheduled takeoff time, however, and after stowing their flight gear, Blackburn and the bombardier decided they were too keyed up to go back to sleep right away, so they repaired to Blackburn's tent to play bridge. The night of August 27-28 went quickly for the Dominator crews assigned to the radio relay mission, and after a detailed pre-dawn briefing, the men walked to their waiting aircraft. When they arrived at the hard stand, they found Frank Cook waiting for them. The man who had headed the B-32 combat test program and then stayed on as part of the command triumvirate had come to see them off. He first chatted with the crew of Hobo Queen 2, whose co-pilot for the day's mission was 2nd Lieutenant Joe Elliott, the young man who had taken part in the August 17 flight as co-pilot of 539. Cook then walked over to talk with Leonard Sill, with whom he'd flown on several occasions and the staff officers who would be flying with him. After a few moments, the crew of 544 began boarding. Cook reached up through the B-32's nose entrance hatch and shook hands with Sill, then stepped back to watch the startup. Years later, the older officer still recalled that the initial engine run-up was normal, and as the Dominator began to taxi toward the main runway, Cook hopped into his jeep and drove to Yontan's control tower to observe the takeoff as he always did when his boys were launching on a mission. He was not the only one who turned out to watch the takeoff for what promised to be a historic flight. Hundreds of men had gathered along the edges of the runway, despite the early hour. Cook was standing on the narrow catwalk atop the tower by the time 544 reached the runway threshold with Hobo Queen 2 behind her on the taxiway. The lead B-32 stopped briefly, while Sill did a final run-up of each engine, then began to move. Despite a gross weight of more than 100,000 pounds, 8,000 of it fuel, the bomber picked up speed surprisingly quickly. As far as Cook could tell from his vantage point, the initial takeoff roll was entirely normal, but when the Dominator reached a point about two-thirds of the way down the runway, the full-throated roar of the four big right cyclone engines suddenly died. Everyone watching could tell that Sill had intentionally chopped the power in an attempt to abort his takeoff, but it didn't appear that he had applied the brakes. The huge aircraft continued down the runway, slowing but not stopping, then ran out of concrete and crashed to the bottom of an 80-foot-deep coral pit, just past the runway's southeast end. To the horror of the many onlookers, the fuel-laden aircraft immediately exploded in a huge fireball. The first personnel to reach the crash site could hear, mingled with the sharp detonations of exploding machine gun ammunition, the screams of those aboard burning alive. All thirteen men on the aircraft died within minutes. Hobo Queen 2 had moved from the taxi strip onto the runway when 544 began its takeoff roll, and the men aboard the second Dominator were making their last-minute checks when the massive explosion flared in the coral pit. Radio Operator Staff Sergeant Robert Russell, seated just behind co-pilot Elliot, later recalled that the detonation lit up the still dark sky, flooding the bomber's cockpit with light bright enough to make them wince. As the initial fireball subsided, a red beacon from the control tower signaled Hobo Queen 2's pilot to halt his takeoff, and minutes later Cook arrived in a jeep and ordered the plane's engines to be shut down. 
One after another, the bomber's crewmen emerged, their eyes irresistibly drawn to the flames leaping into the sky at the other end of the runway. Several military and civilian news photographers who were aboard to record the events at Atsugi understandably chose to quit the flight at that point, and Russell helped them unload their gear. As they walked away from the B-32, the young radioman called out, I wish I were going with you, but it looks like I'm going to Tokyo. The importance of the communications mission ensured that Russell was right, for Hobo Queen 2 didn't stay on the ground long. Barely 25 minutes after the disaster, Elliot and the other crew members were back aboard their B-32, rolling down the taxi strip toward the same end of the runway where the crash had occurred. The depth of the coral pit kept the men aboard Hobo Queen 2 from seeing the wreckage as their dominator turned onto the runway for a departure to the northwest. But the roiling flames were burning so intensely that Elliot and the others could actually feel the heat through their own aircraft's thin aluminum skin. As the B-32 started its takeoff roll, Russell said two quick prayers. The first offered for Staff Sergeant Max Holbin, a tent mate and one of the two radio operators aboard 544, and the second asking that he and his fellow crewmen might avoid the fate that had befallen his friend. The latter supplication seemed particularly apt just seconds after Russell uttered it, for as Hobo Queen II lifted off, two sharp backfires barked from one of the Dominator's engines, and a brief but brilliant flame illuminated the cockpit. Everyone on the flight deck inhaled sharply, Russell later recalled, but the engine quickly settled down as the B-32 gained altitude and turned north toward Tokyo. Just as the crash of 544 was not allowed to prevent Hobo Queen 2's takeoff on her important task, the morning's disaster did not derail the second part of the mission. The departure times of the two pairs of Dominators had been staggered, so the crews of the photo-recon aircraft, 528 and 578, were just getting out of their cots when the explosion and fire interrupted at the end of the runway. Though they were obviously shocked by the catastrophe and saddened by the death of friends, they still had a vital mission to accomplish. So after a hushed meal in the mess tent, the aviators gathered for the pre-flight briefing. Though the first topic of discussion was obviously the crash of 544 and the possible cause for it, engine failure on takeoff, flap malfunction, pilot error, no determination could be made until the roiling flames subsided. Rudy Pugliese, his voice occasionally breaking, led the briefing in Bill Barnes's stead, laying out the operational details of the day's flight. The two photo recon dominators would follow the by now familiar route from Okinawa to the Tokyo area, tracking northeast to Oshima Island, and then turning due north for their photo runs. They were to fly the usual parallel lines, mowing the lawn as they photographed a series of targets between Yokohama and the capital. Frank Cook stepped in to remind the crews that they might be called upon at any time to bomb their pre-assigned targets if there was any sign of armed Japanese resistance to the arrival of the advance occupation unit. And if that order came, they were to carry it out immediately. The senior officer also reminded the aviators that the skies above the Kanto plane would be particularly busy, with Navy carrier-based fighters flying top cover for the many lumbering transports that would be bringing in the initial landing force and the equipment and supplies its members would require. And finally, the navigators on each of the B-32 crews were given the coordinates of the Navy ships that would be providing air-sea rescue coverage along the routes to and from Japan. The photo recon dominators took off from Yontan just after 7 a.m., departing to the northwest so they would not have to fly through the thick column of greasy black smoke rising into the morning sky above the coral pit. After turning onto the heading for Oshima, the B-32s climbed gradually to 3,000 feet, 
and their crew settled in for what they fervently hoped would be an uneventful flight to the Japanese capital. Colonel Charles P. Tench was also probably hoping for a day free of conflict. A member of MacArthur's operation staff, the 40-year-old officer had been tapped by the Supreme Commander himself to lead the advance group that would land at Atsugi. Given the historic nature of its mission, and the very real possibility that it would receive a less-than-friendly welcome. Tench's group was surprisingly small. The force consisted of just 150 troops, only about 30 of whom were infantrymen. The remainder were the Army Airways Communication Systems radio operators, logistics personnel, air traffic controllers, navigation aids technicians, and other specialists required to prepare Atsugi for the impending arrival of MacArthur and the lead elements of the main occupation forces. Tench, his men, and the mounds of equipment they would need upon reaching Atsugi were loaded aboard 16 C-47 transports of the 317th Troop Carrier Group, which began taking off from Kadena and other airfields on Okinawa at about the same time as Leonard Sill's B-32 was rolling from the taxi strip onto the main runway at Yontan. The first indication the Japanese had of the advance force's impending arrival was the sudden appearance over Atsugi of Navy F-4U Corsair and F-6F Hellcat fighters, which had launched not long before from Third Fleet carriers approaching Sagami Bay. Although those on the ground probably could not see it, Hobo Queen Two had also arrived, and was flying in a lazy circle at 18,000 feet. At 8.20, Colonel John H. Lackey, Jr., the pilot of Tench's C-47, began his approach from the south, touching down eight minutes later on the airdrome's center runway. The lead plane was quickly followed by the other 15 transports, and by a few minutes after 9 a.m., Tench had officially taken control of the airfield, from Lieutenant General Seizo Arisue, Chief of Intelligence on the Imperial General Staff, and radioed MacArthur, with assistance from Hobo Queen too, that the Japanese were cooperating in every way. Over the following three hours, a further 30 C-46 Commando, C-47 Skytrain, and C-54 Skymaster transports had landed at Atsugi, carrying additional equipment army personnel, and members of Admiral William F. Halsey's staff. With a determination and enthusiasm that stunned Japanese onlookers, the Americans set about preparing the sprawling airdrome for the influx of occupation troops scheduled to arrive in less than 48 hours. As the men of Tench's advance element were beginning to unload their equipment at Atsugi, the photo recon dominators arrived over Honshu. The two B 32s initially took up a wide orbit above the Kanto plane, as their crews waited anxiously to see if they would actually have to drop the bombs nestled in each aircraft's belly. But it soon became apparent that there was not going to be any Japanese opposition to the first foreign occupiers. For the next several hours, the only excitement the crews of 528 and 578 encountered was the arrival off their wingtips of Navy Corsairs and Hellcats, their pilots politely asking variations of the same question, Who the hell are you? And what kind of airplane is that? Once Tench's Army Airways Communication System specialists were able to establish radio contact with Okinawa and Manila, Hobo Queen Two was released from her special tasking and turned for home leaving the other two Dominators to begin their assigned photo runs. At that point, however, the gremlins that now seemed to be permanent members of every B-32 crew got up to their old tricks. As 22-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Collins Orton turned 528 onto the beginning of its third photo run at about 2.15, 2nd Lieutenant John L. Boyd, the 20th Recon Squadron officer controlling the aircraft's K-22 camera from the bomber's nose compartment, announced that the device had failed. 
despite the best efforts of the embarked aerial photographer, Sergeant Horace Butler. The camera refused to come back to life. When apprised of the camera problem, the mission commander in 578 told Orton to pack it up and head for home. And minutes later, 528 was pointing her nose toward Okinawa. Facing a long flight back to Yontan, Orton and his co-pilot, Flying Officer John Clark, decided to conduct an experiment. The men had flown B-24s together before transitioning to the Dominator, and during long-distance Liberator missions from the Philippines to China, they had perfected the techniques of fuel conservation. By reducing the engine RPM and manifold pressure, they'd been able to keep their B-24 in the air for nearly 18 hours, its propellers turning so slowly that the crewmen could actually count the blades as they rotated. The aircraft would be flying so slowly that, as Orton recalled years later, if a man walked to the rear of the B-24 to use the relief tube, the small change in the center of gravity was enough to put the plane into a stall. To begin the experiment, Orton and Clark first had the flight engineer, Master Sergeant Paul E. Fairchild, transfer all of the fuel from the B-32's bomb bay tank into the main wing tanks, the only place from which the engines drew the high-octane aviation gasoline. It was something that they'd done all the time in their B-24, and they had no reason to think it would be a problem in the Dominator. Everything was fine for about two and a half hours, but then at about 5 p.m., the aircraft yawed slightly as the number two engine began losing power. As Orton later recalled, the power plant just pooped out. The cylinder head temperature went down, but the manifold pressure and RPMs stayed where they'd been set. Fairchild shut off the fuel flow to the engine, and Orton feathered the prop, which seemed to solve whatever the issue might have been. But at about 6.45, the cylinder head temperature on the number 4 engine also inexplicably dropped, and seconds later, the big cyclone simply died. The loss of one engine was a not uncommon irritation, but the failure of two was potentially disastrous. The Dominator could not maintain a safe cruising altitude on the two remaining cyclones, and the big bomber was still some 200 miles from Okinawa and descending through 4,500 feet. A hurried discussion among Orton, Clark, and Fairchild pinpointed water condensation in the bomb bay tank as the likely source of the problem, and all three men agreed that the B-32 was almost certain to lose its two remaining engines sooner rather than later. Orton asked primary navigator Captain Roy C. Cunningham for a steer, course, to Bird Dog, the nearest Navy plane guard ships, and was pleasantly surprised to learn that the destroyers USS John D. Henley, DD-553, and USS Aulick, DD-569, were patrolling Air Sea Rescue Station Baker, almost directly ahead of the ailing Dominator. After ordering his crew to begin jettisoning everything but their parachutes, Orton directed Radio Operator Staff Sergeant Wiley D. Pringle first to communicate the aircraft's position and difficulties to 5 Bomber Command, and then to contact the destroyers on the guard frequency. Henley and Aulick had steamed out of Okinawa's Buckner Bay on August 25 to take up station at Baker, but by the evening of the 28th had not yet been required to undertake any rescues. That appeared about to change, however, when at 6.15 p.m., the air search radar aboard Henley, the lead vessel, detected an airborne contact to the north of the ship's position. A half hour later, the destroyer's radio operator picked up Pringle's initial distress message, and just minutes after that, the B-32 was circling the two vessels. Commander Simon Ramey, Henley's captain, urged Orton to ditch the Dominator near the two Navy vessels. But the young pilot believed that his aircraft's long bomb bay and shoulder-mounted wings 
would cause it to disintegrate as soon as it hit the water. Orton therefore replied that he and his crew would bail out instead, and immediately ordered the men to begin preparations to abandon their doomed bomber. The bailout process did not go quite as Orton had hoped, however. As he later recalled, he expected that the crewmen would exit the aircraft quickly and efficiently, like paratroopers. Instead, he said, each one would get to the open bomb bay or the rear entrance hatch, lick his finger to test the wind, straighten out his parachute harness, and then finally go. My God, it seemed to take forever. It didn't take quite as long as that, though. The first man leapt from the B-32 at 7 p.m., and Orton, the last to leave, took to his chute just four minutes later and hit the water thirty seconds after pulling the ripcord. He had barely popped back to the surface when 528 crashed into the sea some four miles away, almost exactly eight miles due north of the small island of Kikajima, and just over 195 miles northeast of Yontan. Although all thirteen men aboard the Dominator made it out of the aircraft, those watching from the two destroyers counted only twelve parachutes. Over the next several hours, Henley picked up Orton and Cunningham, while Aulick retrieved all the others, except armorer gunner Sergeant Morris C. Morgan. Despite a search that continued well into the next day, the young aviator was never found, and he was ultimately listed as missing in action, body not recovered. Sadly, Morgan was not the only casualty. Though Gunner Staff Sergeant George A. Murphy made it out of the aircraft safely, his parachute did not fully deploy by the time he hit the water. Despite the best efforts of Aulick's medical officer, Lieutenant Junior Grade R. B. Lorry, Murphy died at 11 p.m. of traumatic shock complicated by massive internal injuries. His body was committed to the sea two days later, following a burial service conducted by the destroyer's captain, Lieutenant Commander W. R. Honeycutt, Jr. Henley and Aulick were required to remain on air-sea rescue duty after picking up Orton and his crew, and the aviators therefore did not make it back to Okinawa for several days. While they were enjoying the questionable delights of life aboard a relatively small warship in unusually large seas, events moved on without them. Even as 528's crewmen awoke to their first morning at sea, the investigation of the previous day's fatal crash at Yontan had already begun. Those attempting to determine the cause of the accident that killed all 13 men aboard 544 the worst single loss of life in the troubled history of the B-32, had little to go on, because the Dominator had been almost completely consumed by the fierce, fuel-fed fire that had engulfed it. Everyone who had witnessed 544's startup, taxi, and initial takeoff roll agreed that nothing seemed amiss, and that the sudden reduction in engine noise was the first indication of trouble. Although several witnesses later said they heard the screech of the aircraft's brakes, indicating that Leonard Sill and his co-pilot were doing all they could to stop the aircraft, Frank Cook recalled years later that he had walked the entire length of Yontan's runway and had seen no indication of the skid marks that would have accompanied the application of the aircraft's brakes at that weight and speed. The mystery deepened when an inspection of one of the few unburned sections of the aircraft, the rear inboard part of its right wing, indicated that the B-32's flaps had been correctly set for takeoff. In addition to attempting to find the cause of the crash, which was ultimately ascribed to unknown causes, investigators also had to try to positively identify the bodies of the dead. Squadron Commander Tony Sforey, was part of the team that undertook that grisly task, which was made all the harder by the fact that most of the remains had been charred beyond recognition. Only four sets were ultimately identified, 
one of which was that of intelligence officer Bill Barnes. Svore later recalled that he was able to make that particular identification, because Barnes, a close friend, always wore a unique ring that was easily recognized. A memorial service for those lost was held at Yontan on August 30. That same day, the main units of the Allied Occupation Force began arriving in Japan, the bulk of the U.S. 11th Airborne Division landing at Atsugi aboard hundreds of transport aircraft, while other Army, Marine, Navy, and British units went ashore at various points throughout Honshu and Kyushu. August 30 also saw MacArthur's arrival at Atsugi aboard his personal C-54 transport, Batan. The following day marked a suitably symbolic milestone in the history of the B-32. Just after 4.30 a.m., a single Dominator took off on a photo recon mission to Tokyo, but its nose gear failed to retract, and the aircraft returned to Yontan. The last operational mission, flown by Consolidated's trouble-plagued superbomber, therefore ended as so many earlier flights had, aborted due to mechanical difficulties. Nor did the B-32 have a chance to redeem itself. Within months, the Army Air Forces canceled all further development and procurement of the Dominator. Those still under construction were dismantled, and all flying aircraft were quickly scrapped. The venerable Hobo Queen II never even made it off Okinawa. Severely damaged by a nose gear collapse, she was eventually scrapped in place. A single B-32, intended for ultimate donation to a museum, was kept intact in Arizona for several years after the war. But it, too, was finally scrapped, and the only artifacts remaining of the ill-starred Consolidated Dominator are an instrument panel, a single gun turret, and various odd pieces in private collections. Collins Orton and his surviving crew members finally returned to Yontan on September 2, the same day that Japan formally surrendered during the ceremony aboard the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. When 2nd Lieutenant Elmer O. Jones, the bombardier on 528, walked back into his tent at Yontan, he regaled John Blackburn and several other friends with the story of the bailout, and ended by saying proudly, Look, I even saved the ripcord D-ring after I jumped. To which one of the men in the tent laughingly replied, You damn fool, you were so scared you couldn't let go of it. Chapter 7 Homecoming General of the Army Douglas MacArthur's decision not to reignite hostilities against Japan because of the August 17 and 18 attacks on the B-32s over Tokyo is undoubtedly one of the most important, if perhaps least known, choices he made during the first weeks of his tenure as Supreme Commander Allied Powers. We can never be certain what might have happened had Allied forces resumed even a limited bombing campaign against the home islands in retaliation for the interception of the Dominators. But we can make some educated assumptions based on the available facts. We know that in August 1945, the total number of Japanese military personnel remaining under arms both at home and across Asia and the Pacific was in the millions. Although many units were certainly ill-equipped, ill-trained, or decimated by disease or enemy action, others were highly experienced and remained both combat-ready and highly motivated. By war's end, the Japanese had amassed thousands of aircraft and as many small, fast boats for use in suicide attacks against Allied forces massing off the home islands and millions of Japanese civilians were fully prepared to join in the defense of their homeland in the event of an Allied invasion. Emperor Hirohito's decision to accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration and surrender Japan to the Allies was so unpopular that it had provoked a major armed forces rebellion in Tokyo 
and minor ones elsewhere throughout what was left of the Japanese Empire. That such mutinies did not succeed in reversing the Emperor's decision and lead to the installation of a fanatically anti-surrender cabinet is due in part to the Allies' suspension of offensive action after August 15. Senior military officers and government officials, who might otherwise have chosen to break with the Emperor and prolong the war, were almost certainly swayed by the observable fact that the Allies were no longer pounding Japan with incendiaries, or, for that matter, additional atomic bombs. Given these realities, and the very real possibility that senior Japanese government and military leaders had not been told of the August 17 and 18 interceptions over the Kanto Plain, any resumption of hostilities by the Allies in response to the attacks on the B-32s would likely have been seen in Tokyo as a completely unwarranted abrogation of the ceasefire. That, in turn, would certainly have strengthened the hand of the anti-surrender elements, fanning back to life the embers of rebellion that had been nearly extinguished following the unsuccessful August 14-15 coup. And had the Bushido-inflamed diehards in the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy managed to reassert their influence in Tokyo, there is no doubt they would have immediately sought to cancel the ceasefire orders their senior leaders had already transmitted throughout what was left of the Empire. And that, of course, would have inexorably led to a resumption of widespread hostilities between Japanese and Allied forces, which in turn could have had only two possible outcomes, either of them catastrophic. In the first scenario, the Allies would have resumed the atomic bombing of Japanese cities, as additional weapons became available and continued the use of nuclear weapons until whatever government was then in power ultimately chose to surrender. This would have resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Japanese. The certain obliteration of Tokyo and other key metropolitan areas, and persistent radiation that would have produced horrific environmental and health effects both in Japan and likely throughout Asia and the Pacific, for decades following the eventual end of the war. The second scenario, though perhaps less apocalyptic, would have been disastrous nonetheless. If the United States had been unable to produce the number of atomic weapons required to bomb Japan into submission, the Allies would have been forced to go ahead with downfall, the planned two-part invasion of the home islands. Operation Olympic would have kicked off in the fall of 1945 to subdue the southern part of Kyushu, followed in the spring of 1946 by Operation Coronet, the invasion of the Kanto Plain. Allied planners predicted that the Japanese defense would be both fanatical and prolonged, and based on the casualty rates for the invasion of Okinawa, predicted that the total number of Allied dead and wounded for both parts of downfall, could easily top 700,000. That number did not include the Japanese civilians and military personnel, who would also be killed or injured. In the end, of course, neither of these truly dreadful sequences of events played out. The Japanese surrendered. MacArthur effectively became the defeated nation's American Caesar and established the foundations for Japan's rebirth as a democratic society. And the men who took part in the last two Army Air Force's combat missions of World War II ultimately went home to live out the rest of their lives. All but one. The crowd of people that surrounded John Anderson's damaged Dominator upon its return to Yontan from the ill-fated August 18 mission included journalists from a number of civilian news organizations. Among them were Frank L. Cluckhone, a star foreign correspondent for the New York Times, who would later become the first American reporter to interview Emperor Hirohito, Sam Kinch of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and staff writers from the two then-dominant American news agencies, 
United Press, and Associated Press. The newsmen watched intently as medics gingerly removed Jimmy Smart, Joe Le Charité, and Tony Marchione's body from 578. All three airmen were strapped to stretchers and then loaded aboard waiting vehicles of the Army 556th Ambulance Company, Smart and Le Charité in one, and Marchion in another. When the ambulances roared off, the reporters descended on John Anderson and his remaining crewmen, bombarding them with questions about the attack. Before the bewildered aviators could respond, however, they were hustled off for an in-depth debriefing. Two hours later, the crewmen reappeared, and under the watchful eyes of Frank Cook and other senior officers, began answering the impatient reporter's questions. Though Anderson and the others withheld the details of Le Charité's wounding and Marchion's death, and, of course, operational information, such as the targets they had been assigned to photograph, they were fairly candid in their responses to less sensitive questions and talked at some length. They were quick to credit Tom Robinson, the navigator, for the first aid he provided to Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité, and were more than happy to give dramatic accounts of the aerial battle that emphasized their claims of enemy aircraft damaged and destroyed. The nature and timing of the incident, coming just days after the ceasefire had supposedly gone into effect, and less than 24 hours after the August 17 attack, which had also been reported in stateside newspapers, as well as the fact that an American airman had been killed and two others wounded, ensured that the story would be front-page news in the United States. And it didn't take long. The UP and AP wire stories began appearing in the morning editions of major newspapers on August 18, which was August 19 on Okinawa. Cluckhone's piece ran above the fold on the front page of the New York Times the next day. All of the stories about the August 18 attack that appeared in U.S. newspapers mentioned the names of Anderson and Robinson and repeated the claims of enemy aircraft shot down by Houston and Smart. But the identities of the casualties were not revealed. This was intentional, of course, because Army regulations forbade the release of the names of wounded or deceased personnel until after their next of kin had been notified. In the case of the two wounded airmen, the notification would not be made until after physicians had been able to fully evaluate each man's condition. That evaluation was made less than a mile southeast of Yontan's main runway, at the 381st Station Hospital. The facility's 500 beds were divided among more than 100 tents and small wooden buildings erected by the 801st Engineer Aviation Battalion in the weeks following the initial invasion of Okinawa. Upon arrival by ambulance from Yontan, Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité were hustled into the hospital's emergency triage area. Doctors quickly determined that Smart's head wounds were not as serious as they first appeared and would require only stitches, not surgery. Le Charité, on the other hand, had severe wounds to both legs, and would require months of hospitalization, followed by physical therapy. And despite their injuries, the two young men were, of course, the lucky ones. The ambulance carrying Jimmy Smart and Joe Le Charité had been driven straight to the low wooden building that served as the 381st's emergency room. The vehicle bearing Tony Marchione's body had gone a few hundred yards farther before pulling under a portico attached to a different structure. Though externally similar to the hospital's other buildings, the edifice did not house medical personnel dedicated to saving lives. It was part of a compound operated by the 3063rd Quartermaster Graves Registration Company, whose members were tasked with caring for the dead. Though Tony had died very soon after being hit, and hours before 578 landed at Yontan, the medic who had ridden with his body from the airfield had done a quick and thorough examination of his wounds. By the time the ambulance arrived at the 3063rd's compound, 
the soldier had already signed the form that officially pronounced the young airman dead. This finding was confirmed by the enlisted mortician on duty, who then added his signature to the form already signed by the medic, and thereby took formal possession of Tony's body. As its designation implies, the 3063rd's ultimate purpose was to oversee the interment of U.S. Army personnel who died on Okinawa, and it and a sister unit, the 3008th, had detachments all over the island. By June 1945, there were eight temporary cemeteries on Okinawa, the largest of which had been established in April by the garrison force formed to manage post-invasion administrative and logistical operations, Island Command Okinawa. Located on the island's west coast, seven miles southwest of Yontan, it was the designated resting place for Army Air Force's personnel, and it was there that Tony Marchione was destined to be interred. But several things had to happen before that burial could take place, the first of which was the positive identification of Tony's body. This may seem in hindsight to be an unnecessary step, given that Kurt Rupke had identified him to the medics before the ambulance left Yontan, and his death had been officially confirmed, but it was required by regulation. The 3063rd mortician first checked the name, army serial number, blood type, and religion stamped on the two dog tags hanging next to the crucifix on a light silver chain around the body's neck, verifying that they were indeed Tony's. The technician then fingerprinted the body, and a forensic dentist checked the teeth to ensure that they matched those on the dental records in Tony's personnel file, a copy of which had been obtained from the 20th Recon Squadron. Once the body was considered positively identified, the mortician and his assistant went through the pockets of the flight suit, removing Tony's wallet and other items, then took off the necklace bearing his crucifix and dog tags. The men next cut away and discarded Tony's torn and bloodied clothing, recorded the nature and exact location of his wounds, and washed the body before wrapping it in the shelter half in which it would be buried. The technicians then placed the corpse on a gurney and moved it into an adjoining building, that served as the 3063rd's morgue. Despite the fact that fighting had officially ended on Okinawa some two months earlier, Tony's was not the only body in the storage area. In war zones, military personnel die from a range of causes other than hostile action. At that time, the Graves Registration Unit was processing the corpses of men killed in automobile and aircraft accidents by the various tropical diseases endemic to the Ryukyu Islands, and in older personnel, by such peacetime causes as heart attack and stroke. Owing to limited refrigerated space for the storage of bodies, the 3063rd performed interments as soon as possible. The commanders of the 20th Recon Squadron and 386 Bomb Group were therefore notified early on the morning of August 19 that Tony's burial would take place that afternoon at 3 p.m. A hastily convened Roman Catholic funeral mass, conducted in the main chapel at Yontan before the burial, drew some 30 of Tony's friends, as well as senior officers from the 20th Recon Squadron and its parent organization, the 6th Photographic Group, the 386th Bomb Squadron and 312th Bomb Group, and 5 Bomber Command. Following the service, Tony was laid to rest in the Island Command Cemetery, Plot 2, Row 1, Grave 4, between Technician 5th Grade Roland Griffin and First Sergeant Francis T. McLaughlin. The burial was not the end of the process, of course. On the day following the interment, the 20th Recon Squadron's commander appointed Bob Essig to be the summary courts officer for Tony's case a position that made the pilot responsible for inventorying the young gunner's property and effects. Over the following six days, Essig turned in all government-issued items and gathered personal materials for eventual shipment to Tony's family. The latter category included uniform shirts and pants, some civilian clothing, 
and shoes, toiletries, souvenirs from Tony's time in the Philippines, and a watch and several rings. Not surprisingly, the young gunner's footlocker also held eighty-five letters and postcards he'd received from family and friends, as well as seventy-five black-and-white photos, some of relatives, others of his crewmates and the aircraft in which he'd flown. When Essig finished the inventory on August 26, he placed all the personal items in a single large cardboard box and turned it over to the 3063rd for onward shipment to the Army Effects Bureau in Kansas City, Missouri, the central clearinghouse for the personal property of deceased World War II soldiers. The Graves Registration Company's acceptance of Tony's personal effects triggered what was arguably the saddest aspect of the official process that followed the young man's death, the notification of his family. The Memorial Affairs Division of the Office of the Quartermaster General and the Casualty Affairs Branch in the War Department's Adjutant General's Office, both in Washington, received the 3063rd's notification of Tony's killed-in-action status on August 28. The following morning, a special delivery telegram was dispatched to Ralph Marchione at the King Street home address. Its opening words, the stuff of every parent's nightmares. We deeply regret to inform you. President Harry S. Truman's August 14 announcement that Japan had accepted the Allied surrender terms had sparked joyous celebrations across America. In Pottstown, the news was greeted with a spontaneous parade through the center of town, and crowds of people cheering and waving flags gathered in front of City Hall. In the Marchione household, the special radio bulletin was met with joy and tears of relief, and Ralph, Emilia, and the two girls went out to join the neighbors, who were already dancing in the street. Over the following days, the family waited expectantly for a letter from Tony that would announce the date of his homecoming. But nothing came. Though news agency reports of the August 17 and 18 attacks on the Dominators over Tokyo had run in the Potsdam Mercury and other local papers, they didn't arouse any concern for the Marchions, because they knew Tony was a crewman on an F-7, not a B-32 and because the unidentified crewman killed on the 18th was referred to as a photographer and not as an aerial gunner. The fact that no one in the family had received a letter from him since the one to Jerry dated August 17 also did not disturb them, because they assumed that Tony and all the other members of his unit were extremely busy making preparations to take part in the imminent occupation of Japan. Just after noon, on Wednesday the 29th, 18-year-old Terry Marchione got up from her desk in the front office of the Potsdam Manufacturing Company on South Hanover Street near the Schuylkill River and walked into the ladies' room for a cigarette break. She had not even lit up when one of her female co-workers came in and told her that their supervisor wanted to see her right away. When Terry walked into the man's office, he said she had to go home immediately, but would not tell her why. She gathered up her things and hurried off on foot for King Street, several blocks to the north. Across town, at the Sunnybrook Community Swimming Pool, 13-year-old Jerry Marchione was spending time with several neighborhood friends when the mother of one of the girls arrived and said, You have to go home. Your mom wants you. The woman gave no reason but quickly bundled the teens into her car and drove them toward King Street. Jerry thought it odd that the woman let her off a block from the house, yet kept the other girls in the car. But she forgot about it as soon as she saw the crowd of people gathered in front of her home. Jerry started running, and as she got closer, she heard a heart-wrenching keening that she knew immediately was the sound of her mother screaming. Dashing up the few steps of the house's front stoop, she burst into the living room, where she found her father and Terry, both sobbing and tightly hugging a nearly hysterical Emilia. Her mother had been working in the kitchen, 
preparing lunch for Ralph, when the ring of the bell had drawn her to the front door. She opened it to find a young telegram delivery boy standing there, his eyes downcast and a small envelope held tightly in his outstretched hand. Having already been the bearer of horrible news on more than one occasion, as soon as the boy had handed Amelia the telegram, he turned, leapt onto his bicycle, and quickly pedaled away. Bewildered by the youth's abrupt departure, but already beginning to realize that her entire world was about to change, Amelia tore open the envelope, read the dreadful words it contained, and screamed. The sound brought Ralph running from the kitchen. He, too, read the lines that told him his only son was gone forever, and sobbed uncontrollably as he enfolded his wife in his arms. The sound of their grieving brought neighbors to the still-open door, and within minutes the news had traveled the length of King Street. At Ralph's urging, a friend called Terry's boss. The neighbor woman went to pick up Jerry, and another man ran the few blocks to the nearby St. Aloysius Parish Church to summon a priest. For all its tragic import, the War Department telegram was brief to the point of terseness. It said that Tony had been killed in action on August 18, but provided no details as to where or how and did not say that his body had already been interred on Okinawa. The final line expressed the deep sympathy of the official sender, Major General Edward F. Witzel, the acting adjutant general of the Army, and said that an explanatory letter was en route. That letter arrived by special delivery on Friday, August 31, and added a few additional details. Tony had died in the performance of his duties, it read, and before his own death, had provided first aid that helped save the life of a seriously wounded fellow crew member. The letter added that Tony's personal effects would be returned after processing, and closed by saying that the Memorial Affairs Branch of the Office of the Quartermaster General would be contacting the Marchions in due course. Again, the official signature block bore Witzel's name. It was in an early September letter from Memorial Affairs that Ralph and Amelia learned their son had been buried on Okinawa. Like many relatives of service members killed on distant fronts in World War II, they were shocked and extremely dismayed by the revelation that their loved one had been interred far from home. Their despair was somewhat relieved when they were told that Tony's burial in the Island Command Cemetery was considered temporary, and that his remains would ultimately be transferred to an appropriate location. No mention was made of where or when that might be, however. In the weeks following the Marchion's receipt of the official notification of Tony's death, letters from his friends filled in some of the details that the Army was unable or unwilling to provide. A letter to Terry, written on September 6 by Frank Pallone, was especially informative, if not entirely accurate. Dear Terry, I thought I'll take the liberty of writing you and telling the way in which your brother died. Being a real close friend and a member of his crew, I know that Tony would have done the same for me. The last day he flew, on August 18th, he flew with a B-32 crew from another outfit on a mission over Tokyo. Over the target... Fourteen Jap fighters came in on their ship. The first fighter that attacked machine-gunned one of the other gunners and hit him in the legs. Tony came to his aid with two tourniquets and stopped the bleeding in the gunner's both legs. As Tony was leaning over the wounded fellow, trying to comfort him, another fighter attacked and hit Tony. He was killed instantly, and he suffered no pain. The fellow who Tony treated was saved by his aid and wishes to thank you for Tony. Tony was really a swell fellow, the best I have ever met and lived with in my Army career. Tony was a clean-cut kid, and they can't come any better. He was well-liked by all the fellows that he associated with. We had a military funeral and a mass at the Catholic chapel for him, 
with all his close friends and mostly all the squadron turned out. As close friends, the crew and I offer our sincerest condolences. Sincerely, Frank. On September 17, the family received a letter addressed to Ralph and signed by a somewhat more august personage, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson. My dear Mr. Marchion, you will shortly receive the Purple Heart Medal, which has been posthumously awarded by the direction of the President to your son, Sergeant Anthony J. Marchion, Air Corps. It is sent as a tangible expression of the country's gratitude for his gallantry and devotion. It is sent to you as well, with my deepest personal sympathy for your bereavement. The loss of a loved one is beyond man's repairing, and the medal is of slight value. Not so, however, the message it carries. We have all been comrades in arms in the battle for our country, and those who have gone are not and will never be forgotten by those of us who remain. I hope you will accept this medal in evidence of such remembrance. A few days after the arrival of Stimson's letter, another tribute reached the Marchions, this one a memorial certificate bearing the seal and signature of President Truman. In grateful memory of Sergeant Anthony J. Marchion, who died in the service of his country in the Southwest Pacific area, August 18, 1945. He stands in the unbroken line of patriots who have dared to die, that freedom might live and grow and increase its blessings. Freedom lives, and through it he lives, in a way that humbles the undertakings of most men. On October 3, a summary court-martial convened at the Kansas City Quartermaster Depot confirmed that Ralph Marchione was indeed entitled to receive his son's personal effects, though the single box containing those items did not arrive at the house on King Street until mid-February 1946. At about that same time, the Marchione family received a small, ornate box containing an air medal that had been posthumously awarded to Tony by Far East Air Forces. The accompanying citation noted that the courage and devotion to duty the young airman had displayed during the August 18 flight reflected great credit on the United States Army Air Force. The package containing the Air Medal would not be the last communication between the government and the Marchions. For several months following the initial notification of Tony's death, Ralph and Amelia received occasional letters from various agencies within the War Department regarding such administrative decisions as the final amount to be paid out under their son's GI life insurance policy, the date the box containing his personal effects would be delivered, and so on. But then, in the fall of 1946, they received a letter from the Memorial Division of the Office of the Quartermaster General that contained some truly momentous news. If they so desired, the body of their only son could come home. The vast majority of the several hundred overseas cemeteries established for America's World War II dead during the course of the conflict were always intended to be temporary. As had been done following World War I, the U.S. government planned to consolidate the remains in a few large memorial cemeteries that would be constructed overseas and maintained in perpetuity by the federal civilian-staffed American Battle Monuments Commission. The contingency plans developed for the final disposition of the war dead recognized that not all of the remains could be accommodated in the memorial cemeteries, however. So the next of kin of those temporarily buried overseas were to be given three options. The remains could be interred in the overseas memorial cemetery, established in the war theater in which their loved one died, or they could be returned to the United States for interment in either a national or private cemetery. On January 26, 1948, Ralph Marchione received a letter bearing his son's name at the top and the signature of Major General William B. Larkin, the quartermaster general below. 
The letter announced that the people of the United States, through the Congress, have authorized the disinterment and final burial of the heroic dead of World War II. The Quartermaster General of the Army has been entrusted with this sacred responsibility to the honored dead. The records of the War Department indicate that you may be the nearest relative of the above-named deceased, who gave his life in the service of his country. The letter went on to explain the options available to the family, but cautioned that if they chose to have Tony's remains returned for private burial, they should undertake no funeral arrangements or other personal arrangements until they received further notification about the status of their request. Not surprisingly, Ralph and Emilia opted to have their son brought home for burial in the cemetery belonging to St. Aloysius Church, and they returned the form bearing their choice within days of receiving it. Their rapid response was not matched by the government, however, and it wasn't until June 10 that they received a letter from a Major Richard Coombs of the Memorial Division, acknowledging receipt and acceptance of their request for disposition of remains. On that form, Ralph had designated Fleshman's Funeral Home in Pottstown as the receiving facility, and had then asked that Tony's remains be transported to the house on King Street for a viewing. Coombs replied with what was obviously a boilerplate response. When the remains of your son are returned, the casket may not be opened while all custodial rights and responsibility for the decedent rests with the Department of the Army. However, upon delivery of the remains to the next of kin or the authorized representative of the next of kin, the government relinquishes all rights and responsibilities. Therefore, if the next of kin so desires, the casket may be opened, providing such action does not violate federal or state public health law. Coombs's assumption that the Marchion's use of the term viewing meant they intended to open Tony's casket is understandable. Many family members of servicemen killed overseas were unaware of the realities of mortuary operations in the theaters of war, and assumed that their loved ones had been prepared in the same way they would have been in a civilian funeral home. The reality was quite different, of course. American military personnel who died abroad during World War II, whether they were killed in action or succumbed to illness or injury, were only very rarely embalmed. The time and materials that would have been required to prepare thousands of bodies would have been prohibitive, and the need to inter corpses quickly in order to prevent outbreaks of disease meant that the only preparation most bodies received before burial was a rudimentary cleaning. Moreover, very few corpses were buried in caskets. Again, the logistics involved in getting caskets to the far-flung battlefields would have interfered with the shipment of ammunition, fuel, and other vital war supplies. Most of the deceased were, like Tony, therefore interred wrapped in canvas shelter halves, that did little to protect the remains. And in the Pacific, high temperatures and humidity, coupled with often very acidic soils, promoted rapid decomposition. In keeping with Ralph and Amelia's wish that Tony come home, the Memorial Division issued a disinterment directive to the Island Command Cemetery as the first step in the repatriation process. Quartermaster Corps policy decreed that all of the deceased in a particular temporary cemetery be disinterred within the same relatively short time period, which of course meant that several hundred to several thousand sets of remains then had to be dealt with. In Tony's case, this meant that though his incomplete, badly decomposed skeletal remains were disinterred on July 7, 1948, they were not processed in this case an administrative term, and placed in a hermetically sealed casket until November 5. The casket was enclosed in the standard compact shipping case and loaded aboard a C-54 transport with many other identically protected sets of remains and flown to the U.S. Army Mausoleum on Saipan. On July 25, 1949, Tony's casket joined 4,500 others 
in the holds of the U.S. Army transport Dalton Victory, which sailed the following day for Honolulu, where an additional 1,300 caskets were put aboard. California's Oakland Army Base, just across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco, was one of 15 designated distribution centers for repatriated remains. Dalton Victory arrived at the huge port complex and logistics hub at 8.45 on the morning of February 16, the 14th funeral ship to offload its sad cargo at the installation since the beginning of the Pacific Repatriation Program in September 1947. A memorial service honoring the ship's passengers deceased was held at Dock 3 with Major General James A. Lester, commander of the San Francisco Port of Embarkation, as the principal speaker, and with military personnel and relatives and friends of the deceased in attendance. The solemn event closed with military chaplains offering prayers and benedictions, and a bugler sounding taps. Six days after the memorial service, Tony's casket began the next leg of its journey to Pottstown. Before dawn on Tuesday, February 22, Master Sergeant Edward V. Trittenbach, the senior non-commissioned officer designated as the escort for Tony's remains and those of eleven other individuals, supervised the loading of the shipping cases aboard a U.S. Army Transportation Corps funeral train made up of fifteen mortuary cars. These were converted six-axle, heavyweight Pullman passenger carriages, with the seats removed and a wide baggage door installed on one side, locking metal racks on the walls to securely hold the caskets in their shipping cases, and with all but two of the windows blanked out. Each car carried between fifty and sixty-six caskets, and the remains aboard each car were grouped by the state or region that was their ultimate destination. In the case of the train bearing Tony's casket, the last six cars bore the remains of personnel from the Midwest and would be dropped in Kansas City, whereas the leading nine cars holding remains bound for East Coast cities would travel all the way to the New York port of embarkation. The funeral train's cross-country odyssey ended at the Brooklyn Army Base, Distribution Center No. 1, on March 2. There the caskets were removed from the mortuary cars, and transported to a temporary mausoleum adjacent to the base's vast eight-story tall enclosed loading and transfer structure, Building B. Over the following weeks, the individual caskets were sorted according to their final destinations, draped with American flags, then taken by hearse or military ambulance to local civilian railway stations, and put aboard trains bound for the deceased's hometown. In Tony's case, the final leg of the long journey home from Okinawa began before dawn on Friday, March 18. Under the supervision of Staff Sergeant Luke E. O'Shaughnessy, an aerial gunner and combat veteran who would be the official individual escort from that point on, the casket bearing the young airman's remains was loaded into a military ambulance and driven from the Brooklyn Army Terminal Mausoleum to one of the Army piers on the east bank of the Hudson River. The vehicle drove aboard an Army-operated ferry for the two-and-a-half-mile passage across the river to the Navy Pier Complex at Bayonne, New Jersey, from where the ambulance departed for the short drive to Jersey City. The flag-draped casket was loaded aboard a baggage car of the Jersey Central Lines train number 601, which rolled into Pottstown's small central station at 11.38 a.m. The Marchions had been notified by telegram the day before of the time the train bearing Tony's remains would arrive, but had chosen not to meet it. They instead relied on two of Tony's friends and former crewmates, Frank Pallone and Rudy Nudo, to handle things at the station. The two men, both now civilians, had been contacted by the U.S. Air Force's Memorial Affairs Branch several weeks earlier and asked if they would attend Tony's remains once they reached Pottstown. Both had readily agreed and had arrived the day before 
to a warm, highly emotional welcome from Ralph, Emilia, and the girls. Pallone and Nudo introduced themselves to O'Shaughnessy on the station platform, and the three men shared a taxi as they followed the hearse bearing Tony's casket to the Fleshman Funeral Home at 258 Beach Street. There, the firm's director took official custody of the remains. The young escort departed, and Tony's two comrades settled down to wait as a mortician and his assistant moved the casket into a preparation room to perform the examination required by both state law and the military release form the funeral director had just signed. The Marchions planned to hold a visitation and rosary service in their home the night before their son's funeral mass, with Tony's casket resting on a flower-bedecked bier in the small living room. Although the June 1948 letter from the Quartermaster Corps Memorial Division's Major Coombs had stated that the casket could be opened once the Army had relinquished control, the initial examination at Fleshman's put any such possibility completely out of the question. The mortician determined that the state of the remains, incomplete, disarticulated, and badly decomposed, made it impossible under Pennsylvania's public health laws. Fleshman's funeral director passed the decision to Pallone and Nudo, who related to Ralph and Emilia. In keeping with the Marchion's wishes, Tony's casket was transported from Fleshman's to the family home on King Street on the afternoon of Sunday, March 20. Throughout the day and into the evening, relatives, neighbors, friends, parishioners, and members of the larger Pottstown community came to pay their respects. Framed pictures of Tony at various stages in his too short life stood atop end tables and on window sills, and a vase of early spring flowers graced the small dining room table. Over the hours, many fond stories were told, tears were shed, and quiet laughter at some remembered childhood antic of the young man who had gone to war occasionally lightened the atmosphere of loss that pervaded the small row house. At 7.30, the Reverend William M. Begley began the rosary service, after which the home slowly emptied, except for the family and Pallone and Nudo, who spent the night in Tony's old room. The grief-tinged celebration of Tony Marchion's life continued the next morning at 9.15, when a hearse returned to the King Street house and loaded the casket for the short drive to St. Aloysius the place where Tony had made his first communion, attended catechism, and may have hoped to be married one day. The Requiem Mass began at ten, with the Reverend John F. Campbell as celebrant, the Reverends George Hiller and David Leahy as concelebrants, and Pallone and Nudo among the pallbearers. The service was well attended, and many of those present added their cars to the procession that followed the hearse bearing the flag-draped casket, to the older of St. Aloysius Church's two cemeteries. There, Anthony James Marchion, the young man who bears the sad distinction of being the last American killed in combat in World War II, was laid to rest with full military honors in the St. Paul section, Plot 68, Grave 3. As a bugler played taps, Father Hiller intoned the traditional final petition. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Authors Afterward One of the cardinal rules in both journalism and the writing of history is that one should never become emotionally involved with the people one is writing about. As reporters or historians, we are supposed to remain detached and objective weighing evidence and facts, and following them wherever they may lead us, regardless of our own beliefs, preconceptions, or prejudices. In more than three decades as both a reporter and historian, I have done my utmost to adhere scrupulously to that rule, and have for the most part succeeded, but not in the case of Anthony Marchione. I obviously did not know the young airman personally, 
He died seven years before I was born. But when I first heard about him, in the course of writing a long-ago small book about an odd and not very successful U.S. Army Air Forces bomber called the B-32 Dominator, I was immediately intrigued by his story. Here was a young man who, like millions of his contemporaries, was swept up in the national effort to defeat Japan and Nazi Germany. Like those many millions of others, he was taught a deadly skill and then dispatched to faraway lands to employ that skill in the service of his country. And like hundreds of thousands of other young Americans who'd put on the uniform, he'd been killed in the performance of his duty, far from home and family. And yet Tony Marchione was different from all the others who had died in that global conflict, because he holds the sad distinction of being the last American killed in combat before the September 2, 1945 surrender of Japan officially ended World War II. It was not merely Tony's enduring place as a footnote in the history of Americans' participation in World War II that captured my interest, however. Despite the many differences in our lives and backgrounds, I felt a close kinship with the young man from Pottstown. We both came from close-knit families, grew up in small towns, and entered the military at roughly the same age. And while serving our nation, Tony in World War II, and I during the Vietnam period, we both suffered great misfortune. Though I survived mine, an armored vehicle accident that left me hospitalized for the better part of a year and disabled for life, I identified only too well with what Tony must have been feeling in those first few seconds after he was hit. The surprise, the blinding pain, the frenzied efforts of buddies trying their best to stop the bleeding, and, worst of all, the sudden realization that this might actually be it, the unexpected end of a too short life. As I moved through my career, and the very interesting, joyous, painful, thrilling, and often calamitous events that have constituted my personal life. The idea of writing about Tony and the events surrounding his death never left me. Indeed, I wrote several short articles over the decades that touched on the events of August 18, 1945, in various ways, though always in the context of the B-32 and not focusing on Tony. I was able to locate and interview many of the people who took part in the final air combats over Tokyo at a time when their memories were still relatively clear and their willingness to provide documents and photographs was limitless. Sadly, all but a very few are gone now. But owing to the busyness of life, I did not attempt to tell Tony's story in detail until the fall of 2008. The resultant article published in Smithsonian's Air and Space, only brushed the surface of what I knew to be a much broader and deeper story. I resolved to tell that tale as thoroughly and completely as possible, and this book is the result. By the time I made that resolution, I had already amassed several file cabinets full of pertinent information, official records, personal narratives, photographs, interview transcriptions, and, of course, reams of data on the aircraft with which Tony's life was briefly but inextricably linked, the B-32. But I knew I needed more. So I and my very able and dogged researchers, Thomas Colbert and Tetsuya Yamada, combed archives all over the United States and in Japan for any and all documents that might further illuminate the many aspects of this story. Although I could not personally examine a B-32, they were all scrapped soon after the war. I did go flying in the Collings Foundation's beautifully restored B-24 Liberator, the type of bomber Tony first crewed on, and the basis of the F-7 in which he flew combat missions from the Philippines. That experience combined with several previous flights in various B-17 flying fortresses, 
gave me insights about the conditions under which Tony and thousands of young airmen like him had to live and work. One especially insightful moment during the B-24 flight occurred as I stood at the left waist gunner's position, gazing out at the passing landscape with my hands resting on the twin grips of a 50 caliber machine gun. It suddenly struck me that I had a picture of Tony doing exactly the same thing. And for a moment, I felt as though I had connected with him in some inexplicable way, despite the years and the distance. In the end, of course, both the reporter and the historian, if they are serious about their craft, must put an end to the research and get the story on paper in the most honest, accurate, and complete way possible. I have attempted so to do, and I hope that Tony Marchione would approve of the end result. Stephen Harding The End This is Jack Garrett. We hope you have enjoyed this production of Last to Die, A Defeated Empire, A Forgotten Mission, and The Last American Killed in World War II by Stephen Harding. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed.